Book Six, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Christensen. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book Six The World Below. Part Two. Not far from thence the mournful fields appear, so called from lovers that inhabit there. The souls whom that unhappy flame invades, in secret solitude and myrtle shades, make endless moans and, pining with desire, lament too late their unextinguished fire. Here Procris, Eryphile, here he found, bearing her breast, yet bleeding with the wound made by her son. He saw Pasiphae there, with Phaedra's ghost, a foul, incestuous pair. Their Laodamia with Evadne moves, unhappy both, both loyal in their loves. Caeneus, a woman once, and once a man, but ending in the sex she first began. Not far from those, Phoenician Dido stood, fresh from her wound, her bosom bathed in blood, whom when the Trojan hero hardly knew, obscure in shades and with a doubtful view, Doubtful is he who sees through dusky night, or thinks he sees the moon's uncertain light. With tears he first approached the sullen shade, and as his love inspired him, thus he said, Unhappy queen, then is the common breath of rumor true in your reported death, and I, alas, the cause? By heaven I vow, and all the powers that rule the realms below, unwilling I forsook your friendly state, Commanded by the gods, and forced by fate, Those gods, that fate, whose unresisted might, Have sent me to these regions void of light, Through the vast empire of eternal night. Nor dared I to presume that, pressed with grief, My flight should urge you to this dire relief. Stay, stay your steps, and listen to my vows. Tis the last interview that fate allows. In vain he thus attempts her mind to move, With tears and prayers and late repenting love. Disdainfully she looked, then turning round, but fixed her eyes unmoved upon the ground, and what he says and swears regards no more than the deaf rocks when the loud billows roar, but whirled away to shun his hateful sight, hid in the forest and the shades of night, then sought Sichaeus through the shady grove, who answered all her cares and equalled all her love. Some pious tears the pitying hero paid, and followed with his eyes the flitting shade, then took the forward way, by fate ordained, and with his guide the farther fields attained, where severed from the rest the warrior souls remained. Tydeus he met, with Miliagor's race, the pride of armies and the soldier's grace, and pale Adrastus with his ghastly face. Of Trojan chiefs he viewed a numerous train, all much lamented, all in battle slain, Glaucus and Medon, high above the rest, and Tenor's sons, and Ceres' sacred priest, and proud Adeus, Priam's charioteer, who shakes his empty reins and aims his airy spear. The gladsome ghosts encircling troops attend, and with unwearied eyes behold their friend, delight to hover near and long to know what business brought him to the realms below. But Argive chiefs and Agamemnon's train when his refulgent arms flashed through the shady plain, fled from his well-known face with wonted fear, as when his thundering sword and pointed spear drove headlong to their ships and gleaned the routed rear. They raised a feeble cry with trembling notes, but the weak voice deceived their gasping throats. Here Priam's son Diophobus he found, whose face and limbs were one continued wound. Dishonest, with lopped armed the youth appears, spoiled of his nose and shortened of his ears he scarcely knew him striving to disown his blotted form and blushing to be known and therefore first began o teucer's race who durst thy faultless figure thus deface what heart could wish what hand inflict this dire disgrace twas famed that in our last and fatal night your single prowess long sustained the fight till tired not forced a glorious fate you chose and fell upon a heap of slaughtered foes. But in remembrance of so brave a deed, a tomb and funeral honours I decreed, thrice called your manes on the Trojan plains, the place your armour and your name retains. Your body, too, I sought, 
and had I found design for burial in your native ground. The ghost replied, Your piety has paid all needful rites to rest my wandering shade, but cruel fate and my more cruel wife to Grecian swords betrayed my sleeping life. These are the monuments of Helen's love, the shame I bear below, the marks I bore above. You know in what deluding joys we passed, the night that was by heaven decreed our last. For when the fatal horse, descending down, pregnant with arms, o'erwhelmed the unhappy town, she feigned nocturnal orgies, left my bed, and mixed with Trojan dames the dances led, then waving high her torch the signal made, which roused the Grecians from their ambuscade. With watching overworn, with cares oppressed, unhappy I had lain me down to rest, and heavy sleep my weary limbs possessed. Meantime my worthy wife, our arms mislaid, and from beneath my head my sword conveyed. The door unlatched, and with repeated calls, invites her former lord within my walls. Thus in her crime her confidence she placed, and with new treason would redeem the past. What need I more? Into the room they ran, and meanly murdered a defenceless man. Ulysses, basely born, first led the way, Avenging powers with justice if I pray that fortune be their own another day, but answer you, and in your turn relate what brought you living to the Stygian state, driven by the winds and errors of the sea, or did you heaven's superior doom obey? Or tell what other chance conducts your way to view with mortal eyes our dark retreats, tumults and torments of the infernal seats. While thus in talk the flying hours they pass, the sun had finished more than half his race, and they, perhaps in words and tears, have spent the little time of stay which heaven had lent. But thus the sibyl chides their long delay. Night rushes down and headlong drives the day. Tis here in different paths the way divides. The right to Pluto's golden palace guides. The left to that unhappy region tends, which to the depth of Tartarus descends, the seat of night profound and punished fiends. Then thus Deiphobus, O sacred maid, Forbear to chide, and be your will obeyed. Lo, to the secret shadows I retire, To pay my penance till my years expire. Proceed, auspicious prince, with glory crowned, And born to better fates than I have found. He said, and while he said, his steps he turned, To secret shadows, and in silence mourned. The hero, looking on the left, espied A lofty tower, and strong on every side, With treble walls, which Phlegathon surrounds, whose fiery flood the burning empire bounds, and pressed betwixt the rocks the bellowing noise resounds. Wide is the fronting gate, and raised on high, with adamantine columns threats the sky. Vain is the force of man, and heavens as vain, to crush the pillars which the pile sustain. Sublime on these a tower of steel is reared, and dire Tisiphone there keeps the ward, girt in her sanguine gown by night and day, observant of the souls that pass the downward way. From thence are heard the groans of ghosts, the pains of sounding lashes and of dragging chains. The Trojan stood, astonished at their cries, and asked his guide from whence those yells arise, and what the crimes, and what the tortures were, and loud laments that rent the liquid air. She thus replied, The chaste and holy race are all forbidden this polluted place, but Hecate, when she gave to rule the woods, then led me trembling through these dire abodes, and taught the tortures of the avenging gods. These are the realms of unrelenting fate, and awful Rhodomanthus rules the state. He hears and judges each committed crime, inquires into the matter, place, and time. The conscious wretch must all his acts reveal, loath to confess, unable to conceal. From the first moment of his vital breath, to his last hour of unrepenting death. Straight o'er the guilty ghost the fury shakes, the sounding whip and brandishes her snakes, and the pale sinner with her sisters takes. Then of itself unfolds the eternal door, with dreadful sounds the brazen hinges roar. You see before the gate what stalking ghost commands the guard, what sentries keep the post. More formidable hydra stands within, whose jaws with iron teeth severely grin. The gaping gulf low to the centre lies, and twice as deep as earth is distant from the skies. The rivals of the gods, the titan race, here singed with lightning roll within the unfathomed space. 
here lie the alien twins i saw them both enormous bodies of gigantic growth who dared in fight the thunderer to defy affect his heaven and force him from the sky Salmonius suffering cruel pains i found for emulating jove the rattling sound of mimic thunder and the glittering blaze of pointed lightnings and their forky rays through elis and the grecian towns he flew the audacious wretch four fiery courses drew he waved a torch aloft and madly vain sought godlike worship from a servile train ambitious fool with horny hooves to pass or hollow arches of resounding brass to rival thunder in its rapid course and imitate inimitable force but he the king of heaven obscure on high bared his red arm and launching from the sky his writhen bolt not shaking empty smoke down to the deep abyss the flaming felon struck there Titius was to see who took his birth from heaven his nursing from the foodful earth here his gigantic limbs with large embrace enfold nine acres of infernal space a ravenous vulture in his opened side her crooked beak and cruel talons tried still for the growing liver digged his breast the growing liver still supplied the feast still are his entrails fruitful to their pains the immortal hunger lasts the immortal food remains ixion and perithus i could name and more thessalian chiefs of mighty fame high o'er their heads a mouldering rock is placed that promises a fall and shakes at every blast they lie below on golden beds displayed and genial feasts with regal pomp are made the queen of furies by their sides is set and snatches from their mouths the untasted meat which if they touch her hissing snake she rears tossing her torch and thundering in their ears then they who brothers better claim disowned expel their parents and usurp the throne defraud their clients and to lucre sold sit brooding on unprofitable gold who dare not give and even refuse to lend to their poor kindred or a wanting friend vast is the throng of these nor less the train of lustful youths for foul adultery slain hosts of deserters who their honour sold and basely broke their faith for bribes of gold all these within the dungeon's depth remain despairing pardon and expecting pain ask not what pains nor further seek to know their process or the forms of law below some roll the weighty stone some laid along and bound with burning wires on spokes of wheels are hung unhappy theseus doomed for ever there is fixed by fate on his eternal chair and wretched phlegius warns the world with cries could warning make the world more just or wise learn righteousness and dread the avenging deities to tyrants others have their country sold imposing foreign lords for foreign gold some have old laws repealed new statutes made not as the people pleased but as they paid with incest some their daughters beds profaned all dared the worst of ills and what they dared attained had i a hundred mouths a hundred tongues and throats of brass inspired with iron lungs i could not half those horrid crimes repeat nor half the punishments those crimes have met but let us taste our voyage to pursue the walls of pluto's palace are in view the gate and iron arch above it stands on anvils labored by the cyclops hands before our farther way the fates allow here must we fix on high the golden bough she said and through the gloomy shades they passed and choose the middle path arrived at last the prince with living water sprinkled o'er his limbs and body then approached the door possessed the porch and on the front above he fixed the fatal bow required by pluto's love these holy rites performed they took their way where long extended plains of pleasure lay the verdant fields with those of heaven may vie with ether vested and a purple sky the blissful seats of happy souls below stars of their own and their own sons they know their airy limbs in sports they exercise and on the green contend the wrestler's prize some in heroic verse divinely sing others in artful measures led the ring the thracian bard surrounded by the rest there stands conspicuous in his flowing vest his flying fingers and harmonious quill strike seven distinguished notes and seven at once they fill here found they teucer's old heroic race 
born better times and happier years to grace Aceracus and Ilus here enjoy perpetual fame with him who founded troy the chief beheld their chariots from afar their shining arms and coursers trained to war their lances fixed in earth their steeds around free from their harness graze the flowery ground the love of horses which they had alive and care of chariots after death survive some cheerful souls were feasting on the plain some did the song and some the choir maintain beneath a laurel shade where mighty po mounts up to woods above and hides his head below here patriots live who for their country's good in fighting fields were prodigal of blood priests of unblemished lives here make abode and poets worthy their inspiring god and searching wits of more mechanic parts who graced their age with new invented arts those who to worth their bounty did extend and those who knew that bounty to commend the heads of these with holy fillets bound and all their temples were with garlands crowned to these the sibyl thus her speech addressed and first to him surrounded by the rest towering his height and ample was his breast say happy souls divine musaeus say where lives anchises and where lies our way to find the hero for whose only sake we sought the dark abodes and crossed the bitter lake to this the sacred poet thus replied in no fixed place the happy souls reside in groves we live and lie on mossy beds by crystal streams that murmur through the meads but pass yon easy hill and thence descend the path conducts you to your journey's end this said he led them up the mountain's brow and shows them all the shining fields below they wind the hill and through the blissful meadows go but old anchises in a flowery vale reviewed his mustered race and took the tale those happy spirits which ordained by fate for future beings and new bodies wait with studious thought observed the lustrous throng in nature's order as they passed along their names their fates their conduct and their care in peaceful senates and successful war he when aeneas on the plain appears meets him with open arms and falling tears welcome he said the gods undoubted race o long expected to my dear embrace once more tis given me to behold your face once more tis given me to behold your face the love and pious duty which you pay have passed the perils of so hard a way tis true computing times i now believe the happy day approached nor are my hopes deceived what length of lands what oceans have you passed what storms sustained and on what shores been cast how have i feared your fate but feared it most when love assailed you on the libyan coast to this the filial duty thus replies your sacred ghost before my sleeping eyes appeared and often urged this painful enterprise after long tossing on the tyrene sea my navy rides at anchor in the bay but reach your hand o parent shade the dear embraces of your longing son he said and falling tears his face bedew then thrice around his neck his arms he threw and thrice the flitting shadow slipped away like winds or empty dreams that fly the day now in a secret vale the trojan sees a separate grove through which a gentle breeze plays with a passing breath and whispers through the trees and just before the confines of the wood the gliding lethe leads her silent flood about the boughs an airy nation flew thick as the humming bees that hunt the golden dew in summer's heat on tops of lilies feed and creep within their bells to suck the balmy seed the winged army roams the fields around the rivers and the rocks remurmur to the sound aeneas wondering stood then asked the cause which to the stream the crowding people draws then thus the sire the souls that throng the flood are those to whom by fate are other bodies owed in lethe's lake they long oblivion taste of future life secure forgetful of the past long has my soul desired this time and place to set before your sight your glorious race that this presaging joy may fire your mind to seek the shores by destiny designed o father can it be that souls sublime return to visit our terrestrial clime and that the generous mind released by death can covet lazy limbs and mortal breath 
and Kaisis then in order thus began to clear those wonders to his godlike son. Know first that heaven and earth's compacted frame, and flowing waters and the starry flame, and both the radiant lights, one common soul, inspires and feeds and animates the whole. This active mind, infused through all the space, unites and mingles with the mighty mass. Hence men and beasts the breath of life obtain, and birds of air, and monsters of the main. The ethereal vigor is in all the same, and every soul is filled with equal flame, as much as earthy limbs and gross allay of mortal members subject to decay, blunt not the beams of heaven and edge of day. From this coarse mixture of terrestrial parts, desire and fear by turns possess their hearts, and grief and joy, nor can the groveling mind, in the dark dungeon of the limbs confined, assert the native skies, or own its heavenly kind. Nor death itself can wholly wash their stains, but long contracted filth even in the soul remains. The relics of inveterate vice they wear, and spots of sin obscene in every face appear. For this are varied penances enjoined, and some are hung to bleach upon the wind, some plunged in waters, others purged in fires, till all the dregs are drained, and all the rust expires. All have their manes, and those manes bear, the few so cleansed to these abodes repair, and breathe in ample fields the soft Elysian air. Then are they happy, when by length of time the scurf is worn away of each committed crime, no speck is left of their habitual stains, but the pure ether of the soul remains. But when a thousand rolling years are past, so long their punishments and penance last, whole droves of minds are, by the driving god, compelled to drink the deep Lithian flood, in large forgetful draughts to steep the cares of their past labors and their irksome years, that unremembering of its former pain, the soul may suffer mortal flesh again. Thus having said, the father spirit leads the priestess and his son through swarms of shades, and takes a rising ground from thence to see the long procession of his progeny. Survey, pursued the sire, this airy throng, as offered to thy view they pass along. These are the Italian names which fate will join with ours and graph upon the Trojan line. Observe the youth who first appears in sight, and holds the nearest station to the light, already seems to snuff the vital air, and leans just forward on a shining spear. Silvius is he, thy last begotten race, but first in order sent to fill thy place. An Alban name, but mixed with Dardan blood, born in the covert of a shady wood. Him, fair Lavinia, thy surviving wife, shall breed in groves to lead a solitary life. In Alba shall he fix his royal seat, and born a king a race of kings beget. Then Procus, honor of the Trojan name, Capus and Numitor of endless fame. A second Silvius after these appears, Silvius Aeneas, for thy name he bears, for arms and justice equally renowned, who late restored in Alba shall be crowned. How great they look, how vigorously they wield their weighty lances and sustain the shield. But they, who crowned with oaken wreaths appear, shall Gabian walls and strong Fidena rear. Nomentum, Bola, with Pomitia found, and raise Collation's towers on rocky ground. All these shall then be towns of mighty fame, though now they lie obscure and lands without a name. See Romulus the Great, born to restore the crown that once his injured grandsire wore. This prince, a priestess of your blood, shall bear, and like his sire in arms he shall appear. Two rising crests his royal head adorn, born from a god, himself to god had born. His sire already signs him for the skies, and marks the seat amidst the deities. Auspicious chief, thy race in times to come shall spread the conquests of imperial Rome. Rome, whose ascending towers shall heaven invade, involving earth and ocean in her shade, high as the mother of the gods in place, and proud, like her, of an immortal race. Then when in pomp she makes the Phrygian round, with golden turrets on her temples crowned, a hundred gods her sweeping train supply, her offspring all, and all command the sky. Now fix your sight, and stand intent to see your Roman race and Julian progeny. 
the mighty caesar waits his vital hour impatient for the world and grasps his promised power but next behold the youth of form divine caesar himself exalted in his line augustus promised oft and long foretold sent to the realm that saturn ruled of old born to restore a better age of gold Africa and india shall his powers obey he shall extend his propagated sway beyond the solar year without the starry way where atlas turns the rolling heavens around and his broad shoulders with their lights are crowned at his foreseen approach already quake the caspian kingdoms and maeotian lake their seers behold the tempest from afar and threatening oracles denounce the war nile hears him knocking at his sevenfold gates and seeks his hidden spring and fears his nephew's fates nor hercules more lands or labors knew not though the brazen-footed hind he slew freed erymanthus from the foaming boar and dipped his arrows in laernian gore nor bacchus turning from his indian war by tigers drawn triumphant in his car from nice's top descending on the plains with curling vines around his purple reins and doubt we yet through dangers to pursue the paths of honour and a crown in view but what's the man who from afar appears his head with olive crowned his hand a censer bears his hoary beard and holy vestments bring his lost idea back i know the roman king he shall to peaceful rome new laws ordain called from his mean abode a sceptre to sustain him tullus next in dignity succeeds an active prince and prone to martial deeds he shall his troops for fighting fields prepare disused to toils and triumphs of the war by dint of sword his crown he shall increase and scour his armour from the rust of peace whom ancus follows with a fawning air but vain within and proudly popular next view the tarquin kings the venging sword of brutus justly drawn and rome restored he first renews the rods and acts severe and gives the consuls royal robes to wear his sons who seek the tyrant to sustain and long for arbitrary lords again with ignominy scourged in open sight he dooms to death deserved asserting public right unhappy man to break the pious laws of nature pleading in his children's cause howe'er the doubtful fact is understood tis love of honour and his country's good the consul not the father sheds the blood behold tarquatus the same track pursue and next the two devoted decii view the drusian line camillus loaded home with standards well redeemed and foreign foes o'ercome the pair you see in equal armour shine now friends below in close embraces join but when they leave the shady realms of night and clothed in bodies breathe your upper light with mortal hate each other shall pursue what wars what wounds what slaughter shall ensue from alpine heights the father first descends his daughter's husband in the plain attends his daughter's husband arms his eastern friends embrace again my sons be foes no more nor stain your country with her children's gore and thou the first lay down thy lawless claim thou of my blood who bearest the julian name another comes who shall in triumph ride and to the capital his chariot guide from conquered corinth rich with grecian spoils and yet another famed for warlike toils on argos shall impose the roman laws and on the greeks revenge the trojan cause shall drag in chains their achillean race shall vindicate his ancestor's disgrace and pallas for her violated place great cato there for gravity renowned and conquering cossus goes with laurels crowned who can omit the gracchi who declare the scipio's worth those thunderbolts of war the double bane of carthage who can see without esteem for virtuous poverty severe fabricius or can cease to admire the ploughman consul in his coarse attire tired as i am my praise the fabii claim and thou great hero greatest of thy name ordained in war to save the sinking state and by delays to put a stop to fate let others better mould the running mass of metals and inform the breathing brass and soften into flesh a marble face plead better at the bar describe the skies and when the stars descend and when they rise 
but rome tis thine alone with awful sway to rule mankind and make the world obey disposing peace and war by thine own majestic way to tame the proud the fettered slave to free these are imperial arts and worthy thee he paused and while with wondering eyes they viewed the passing spirits thus his speech renewed see great marcellus how untired in toils he moves with manly grace how rich with regal spoils he when his country threatened with alarms requires his courage and his conquering arms shall more than once the punic bands affright shall kill the gaulish king in single fight then to the capital and triumph move and the third spoil shall grace Feretrian jove aeneas here beheld of form divine a godlike youth in glittering armor shine with great marcellus keeping equal pace but gloomy were his eyes dejected was his face he saw and wondering asked his airy guide what and of whence was he who pressed the hero's side his son or one of his illustrious name how like the former and almost the same observe the crowds that compass him around all gaze and all admire and raise a shouting sound but hovering mists around his brows are spread and night with sable shades involves his head seek not to know the ghost replied with tears the sorrows of thy sons in future years this youth the blissful vision of a day shall just be shown on earth and snatched away the gods too high had raised the roman state were but their gifts as permanent as great what groans of men shall feel the martian field how fierce a blaze his flaming pile shall yield what funeral pomp shall flowing tiber see when rising from his bed he views the sad solemnity no youth shall equal hopes of glory give no youth afford so great a cause to grieve the trojan honor and the roman boast admired when living and adored when lost mirror of ancient faith in early youth undaunted worth inviolable truth no foe unpunished in the fighting field shall dare thee foot to foot with sword and shield much less in arms oppose thy matchless force when thy sharp spurs shall urge thy foaming horse ah couldst thou break through fate's severe decree a new marcellus shall arise in thee full canisters of fragrant lilies bring mixed with the purple roses of the spring let me with funeral flowers his body strow this gift which parents to their children's owe this unavailing gift at least i may bestow thus having said he led the hero round the confines of the blessed elysian ground which when anchises to his son had shown and fired his mind to mount the promised throne he tells the future wars ordained by fate the strength and customs of the latian state the prince and people and for arms his care with rules to push his fortune or to bear two gates the silent house of sleep adorn of polished ivory this that of transparent horn true visions through transparent horn arise through polished ivory pass deluding lies of various things discoursing as he passed anchises hither bends his steps at last then through the gate of ivory he dismissed his valiant offspring and divining guest straight to the ships aeneas's way embarked his men and skimmed along the sea still coasting till he gained kajita's bay at length on oozy ground his galleys moor their heads are turned to sea their sterns to shore end of book six Recording by Joshua Christensen Book 7, Part 1 of the Aeneid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Brown The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book 7 Juno Served by a Fury, Part 1 And thou, O matron of immortal fame, here dying, 
to the shore hast left thy name, Cajeta still the place is call'd from thee, The nurse of great Aeneas' infancy. Here rest thy bones in rich Hesperia's plains; Thy name, 'tis all a ghost can have, remains. Now, when the prince her fun'ral rites had paid, He plow'd the Tyrrhene seas with sails display'd. From land a gentle breeze arose by night, Serenely shone the stars, the moon was bright, And the sea trembled with her silver light. Now near the shelves of Circe's shores they run, Circe the rich, the daughter of the sun. A dangerous coast, the goddess wastes her days In joyous songs, the rocks resound her lays. In spinning o'er the loom she spends the night, And cedar brands supply her father's light. From hence were heard, rebellowing to the main, The roars of lions that refuse the chain, The grunts of bristled boars, the groans of bears, And herds of howling wolves that stun the sailors' ears. These from their caverns, at the close of night, Fill the sad isle with horror and affright. Darkling they mourned their fate, whom Circe's power, That watched the moon in planetary hour, With words and wicked herbs from humankind Had altered, and in brutal shapes confined. Which monsters, lest the Trojans' pious host should bear, Or touch upon the enchanted coast, Propitious Neptune steered their course by night With rising gales that sped their happy flight. Supplied with these, they skim the sounding shore, And hear the swelling surges vainly roar. Now, when the rosy morn began to rise, And waved her saffron streamer through the skies, When Thetis blushed in purple not her own, And from her face the breathing winds were blown, A sudden silence sate upon the sea, And sweeping oars with struggling urged their way, the Trojan, from the main, beheld a wood, Which, thick with shades, and a brown horror stood. Betwixt the trees the Tiber took his course, With whirlpools dimpled, and with downward force That drove the sand along, he took his way, And rolled his yellow billows to the sea. About him, and above, and round the wood, The birds that haunt the borders of his flood, that bathed within or basked upon his side, To tuneful songs their narrow throats applied. The captain gives command, the joyful train Glide through the gloomy shade and leave the main. Now, Erato, thy poet's mind inspire, And fill his soul with thy celestial fire. Relate what Latium was, her ancient kings. Declare the past and state of things, when first the Trojan fleet Ausonia sought, and how the rivals loved, and how they fought. These are my theme, and how the war began, and how concluded by the godlike man. For I shall sing of battles, blood, and rage, which princes and their people did engage and haughty souls that, moved with mutual hate, in fighting fields pursued and found their fate, that roused the Tyrene realm with loud alarms, and peaceful Italy involved in arms. A larger scene of action is displayed, and, rising hence, a greater work is weighed. Latinus, old and mild, had long possessed the Latin scepter, and his people blessed. His father Faunus, a Laurentian dame, his mother, fair Marica, was her name. But Faunus came from Picus. Picus drew his birth from Saturn, if records be true. Thus King Latinus, in the third degree, had Saturn author of his family. 
But this old peaceful prince, as Heav'n decreed, Was blest with no male issue to succeed. His sons in blooming youth were snatch'd by fate, one only daughter heir'd the royal state. Fired with her love, and with ambition led, The neighb'ring princes court her nuptial bed. Among the crowd, but far above the rest, Young Turnus to the beauteous maid address'd. Turnus, for high descent and graceful mien, Was first, and favor'd by the Latian queen. With him she strove to join Lavinia's hand, But dire portents the purposed match withstand. Deep in the palace, of long growth, There stood a laurel's trunk, a venerable wood, Where rites divine were paid, Whose holy hair was kept and cut with superstitious care. This plant Latinus, when his town he walled, Then found and from the tree Laurentum call. And last, in honor of his new abode, He vowed the laurel to the laurel's god. It happened once, a boding prodigy, A swarm of bees that cut the liquid sky, Unknown from whence they took their airy flight, Upon the topmost branch in clouds alight. There with their clasping feet together clung, and a long cluster from the laurel hung. An ancient augur, prophesied from hence, Behold on Latian shores a foreign prince, From the same parts of heaven his navy stands, To the same parts on earth his army lands. The town he conquers, and the tower commands. Yet more. When fair Lavinia fed the fire before the gods, And stood beside her sire, Strange to relate, the flames, Involved in smoke of incense from the sacred altar broke, Caught her disheveled hair and rich attire, Her crown and jewels crackled in the fire, From thence the fuming trail began to spread, And lambent glories danced about her head. This new portent the seer with wonder views, then, pausing, thus his prophecy renews. The nymph, who scatters flaming fires around, Shall shine with honor, shall herself be crowned. But, caused by her irrevocable fate, War shall the country waste, and change the state. Latinus, frighted with this dire ostent, For counsel to his father Faunus went and sought the shades renowned for prophecy which near albunea's sulphurous fountain lie to these the latian and the sabine land fly when distressed and thence relief demand the priest on skins of offerings takes his ease and nightly visions in his slumber sees a swarm of thin aerial shapes appears and fluttering round his temples, deafs his ears. These he consults, and the future fates to know, From powers above and from the fiends below. Here, for the god's advice, Latinus flies, Offering a hundred sheep for sacrifice. Their woolly fleeces, as the rites required, He laid beneath him, and to rest retired. No sooner were his eyes in slumber bound, when from above a more than mortal sound invades his ears, and thus the vision spoke. Seek not my seed in Latian bands to yoke our fair Lavinia, nor the gods provoke. A foreign sun upon thy shore descends, whose martial fame from pole to pole extends. His race in arms and arts of peace renowned, Not Latium shall contain, nor Europe bound. Tis theirs, whate'er the sun surveys around. These answers, in the silent night received, The king himself divulged, the land believed. The fame through all the neighboring nations flew, When now the Trojan navy was in view.
Beneath a shady tree the hero spread His table on the turf; with cakes of bread, And with his chiefs on forest fruits he fed. They sate, and, not without the god's command, Their homely fare dispatch'd, the hungry band Invade their trenchers next, and soon devour, To mend the scanty meal, their cakes of flour. Ascanius thus observ'd, and smiling said: "See, we devour the plates on which we fed." The speech had omen, that the Trojan race Should find repose, and this the time and place. Aeneas took the word, and thus replies, Confessing fate with wonder in his eyes: "All hail, O earth! all hail, my household gods! Behold the destin'd place of your abodes! For thus Anchises prophesied of old, And this our fatal place of rest foretold. When, on a foreign shore instead of meat, By famine forc'd, your trenchers shall you eat. Then ease your weary Trojans will attend, And the long labors of your voyage end. Remember on that happy coast to build, And with a trench enclose the fruitful field. This was that famine, this the fatal place Which ends the wandering of our exiled race. Then on tomorrow's dawn your care employ To search the land, and where the cities lie, And what the men, but give this day to joy. Now pour to Jove, and after Jove is blest, Call great Anchises to the genial feast, Crown high the goblets with a cheerful draught, Enjoy the present hour, adjourn the future thought. Thus having said, the hero bound his brows, With leafy branches then performed his vows, Adoring first the genius of the place, Then earth, the mother of the heavenly race. The nymphs and native godheads yet unknown In night, and all the stars that gild her sable throne. The ancient Sibel, and Idaean Jove, And last his sire below, and mother queen above. Then heaven's high monarch thundered thrice aloud, And thrice he shook aloft a golden cloud. Soon through the joyful camp a rumor flew, The time was come their city to renew. Then every brow with cheerful green is crowned, The feasts are doubled, and the bowls go round. When next the rosy morn disclosed the day, The scouts to several parts divide their way, To learn the natives' names, their towns explore, The coasts and trendings of the crooked shore. Here Tiber flows, and here Numicus stands. Here warlike Latins hold the happy lands. The pious chief, who sought by peaceful ways To found his empire, and his town to raise, a hundred youths from all his train selects, and to the Latian court their course directs. The spacious palace where their prince resides, and all their heads with wreaths of olive hides, they go commissioned to require peace, and carry presents to procure access. Thus, while they speed their pace, the prince designs his new elected seat, and draws the lines. The Trojans round the place a rampire cast, and palisades about the trenches placed. Meantime the train, proceeding on their way, from the far the town and lofty towers survey. At length approach the walls. Without the gate they see the boys and Latian youth debate, the martial prizes on the dusty plain. Some drive the cars, and some the coursers rein. Some bend the stubborn bow for victory, And some with darts their active sinews try. A posting messenger, dispatched from hence, Of this fair troop advised their aged prince, That foreign men of mighty stature came, Uncouth their habit, and unknown their name. The king ordains their entrance, And ascends his regal seat, Surrounded by his friends. A palace built by Picus, vast and proud, 
supported by a hundred pillars stood, And round encompass'd with a rising wood. The pile o'erlook'd the town, and drew the sight, Surpris'd at once with reverence and delight. There kings receiv'd the marks of sov'reign pow'r, In state the monarchs march'd, the lictors bore Their awful axes, and the rods before. Here the tribunal stood, the house of prayer, And here the sacred senators repair. All at large tables, in long order set, A ram their offering, and a ram their meat. Above the portal, carved in cedar wood, Placed in their ranks, their godlike grandsires stood. Old Saturn, with his crooked scythe on high, And Idolus, that led the colony, And ancient Janus, with his double face, And bunch of keys, the porter of the place. There good Sabinus, planter of the vines, On a short pruning hook his head reclines, And studiously surveys his generous wines. Then warlike kings, who for their country fought, And honorable wounds from battle brought. Around the posts hung helmets, darts, and spears, And captive chariots, axes, shields, and bars, And broken beaks of ships, the trophies of their wars. Above the rest, as chief of all the band, Was Picus placed, a buckler in his hand, his other waved a long divining wand. Girt in his gaben gown the hero sate, Yet could not with his art avoid his fate. For Circe long had loved the youth in vain, Till love refused, converted to disdain. Then mixing powerful herbs with magic art, She changed his form, who could not change his heart. Constrained him in a bird, and made him fly With party-colored plumes, a chattering pie. In this high temple, on a chair of state, The seat of audience, old Latinus sate, And gave admission to the Trojan train, And thus with pleasing accents he began, Tell me, ye Trojans, for that name you own, Nor is your course upon our coasts, unknown. Say what you seek, and whither were you bound? Were you by stress of weather cast aground? Such dangers as on seas are often seen, and oft befall to miserable men. Or come, your shipping in our ports to lay, spent and disabled in so long a way. Say what you want, the Latians you shall find, not forced to goodness, but by will inclined. For since the time of Saturn's holy reign, His hospitable customs we retain. I call to mind, but time the tale has worn, The Arunki told, that Dardanus, Though born on Latian plains, yet sought the Phrygian shore, And Samothracia, Samos called before. From Tuscan Coritum he claimed his birth, but after, when exempt from mortal earth, From thence ascended to his kindred skies, A god, and as a god augments their sacrifice. He said, Ilionius made this reply, O king of Faunus' royal family, Nor wintry winds to Latium forced our way, Nor did the stars our wandering course betray. Willing we sought your shores, and hither bound, the port so long desired, at length we found. From our sweet homes and ancient realms expelled, great is the greatest that the sun beheld. The god began our line, who rules above. And as our race, our king descends from Jove. And hither are we come, by his command, to crave admission in your happy land. How dire a tempest from Mycenae poured Our plains, our temples, and our town devoured! What was the waste of war? What fierce alarms shook Asia's crown with European arms? 
ev'n such have heard, if such there be, Whose earth is bounded by the frozen sea; And such as, born beneath the burning sky And sultry sun, betwixt the tropics lie: From that dire deluge, thro' the wat'ry waste, Such length of years, such various perils past, At last escap'd, to Latium we repair, To beg what you without your want may spare, The common water, and the common air; Sheds, which ourselves will build, and mean abodes, Fit to receive and serve our banish'd gods. Nor our admission shall your realm disgrace, Nor length of time our gratitude efface. Besides, what endless honour you shall gain, To save and shelter Troy's unhappy train, Now by my sovereign and his fate I swear, Renown'd for faith in peace, for force in war. Oft our alliance other lands desir'd, And what we seek of you, of us requir'd. Despite not then, that in our hands we bear these holy boughs, sue with words of prayer. Fate and the gods, by their supreme command, have doomed our ships to seek the Latian land. To these abodes our fleet Apollo sends. Here Dardanus was born, and hither tends, where Tuscan Tiber rolls with rapid force, and where Numicus opes his holy source. Besides, our prince presents, with his request, some small remains of what his sire possessed, this golden charger snatched from burning Troy, and Chyses did in sacrifice employ. This royal robe and this tiara wore old Priam, and this golden scepter bore in full assemblies and in solemn games. These purple vests were weaved by Dardan dames. Thus while he spoke, Latinus rolled around his eyes and fixed a while upon the ground. Intent he seemed, and anxious in his breast, not by the scepter moved or kingly vest, but pondering future things of wondrous weight, succession, empire, and his daughter's fate. On these he mused within his thoughtful mind, and then revolved what Faunus had divined. This was the foreign prince, by fate decreed, to share his scepter and Lavinia's bed. This was the race that sure portents foreshew to sway the world in land and sea subdue. At length he raised his cheerful head and spoke. The powers, said he, the powers we both invoke to you and yours and mine propitious be and firm our purpose with their augury have what you ask, your presence I receive, land, where and when you please, with ample leave. Partake and use my kingdom as your own, all shall be yours while I command the crown. And if my wished alliance please your king, tell him he should not send the peace, but bring. Then let him not a friend's embraces fear. The peace is made when I behold him here. Besides this answer, tell my royal guest, I add to his commands my own request. One only daughter heirs my crown and state, Whom not our oracles, nor heaven, nor fate, Nor frequent prodigies permit to join With any native of the Ausonian line. A foreign son-in-law shall come from far, Such is our doom, a chief renowned in war, whose race shall bear aloft the Latian name, and through the conquered world diffuse our fame. Himself to be the man the fates require, I firmly judge, and what I judge, desire. He said, and then on each bestowed a steed. Three hundred horses, in high stables fed, stood ready, shining all, and smoothly dressed. Of these he chose the fairest and the best to mount the Trojan troop. At his command the steeds caparisoned with purple stand, with golden trappings glorious to behold, 
and champ betwixt their teeth the foaming gold then to his absent guest the king decreed a pair of coursers born of heavenly breed who from their nostrils breathed ethereal fire whom circe stole from her celestial sire by substituting mares produced on earth whose wombs conceived a more than mortal birth these draw the chariot which latinus sends and the rich present to the prince commends sublime on stately steeds the trojans born to their expecting lord with peace return but jealous juno from pachinus height as she from argus took her airy flight beheld with envious eyes this hateful sight she saw the trojan and his joyful train descend upon the shore desert the main design a town and with unhoped success the ambassadors return with promised peace then pierced with pain she shook her haughty head sighed from her inward soul and thus she said o oh, hated offspring of my phrygian foes o oh, fates of troy which juno's fates oppose could they not fall unpitied on the plain but slain revive and take and scape again when execrable troy in ashes lay through fires and swords and seas they forced their way then vanquished juno must in vain contend her rage disarmed her empire at an end breathless and tired is all my fury spent or does my glutted spleen at length relent as if twere little from their town to chase i through the seas pursued their exiled race engaged the heavens opposed the stormy main but billows roared and tempests raged in vain what have my scyllas and my surtees done when these they overpass and those they shun on tiber's shores they land secure of fate triumphant o'er the storms and juno's hate mars could in mutual blood the centaurs bathe and jove himself gave way to cynthia's wrath who sent the tusky boar to calydon what great offence had either people done but i consort of the thunderer have waged a long and unsuccessful war with various arts and arms in vain have toiled and by a mortal man at length am foiled if native power prevail not shall i doubt to seek for needful succor from without if jove and heaven my just desires deny hell shall the power of heaven and jove supply grant that the fates have firmed by their decree the trojan race to reign in italy at least i can defer the nuptial day and with protracted wars the peace delay with blood the dear alliance shall be bought and both the people near destruction brought so shall the son-in-law and father join with ruin war and waste of either line o oh, fatal maid thy marriage is endowed with phrygian latian and rutulian blood bellona leads thee to thy lover's hand another queen brings forth another brand to burn with foreign fires another land a second paris differing but in name shall fire his country with a second flame thus having said she sinks beneath the ground with furious haste and shoots the stygian sound to rouse alecto from the infernal seat of her dire sisters and their dark retreat this fury fit for her intent she chose one who delights in wars and human woes even pluto hates his own misshapen race her sister furies fly her hideous face so frightful are the forms the monster takes so fierce the hissings of her speckled snakes her juno finds and thus inflames her spite o oh, virgin daughter of eternal night give me this once thy labor to sustain my right and execute my just disdain let not the trojans with a feigned pretense of proffered peace delude the latian prince 
Expel from Italy that odious name, And let not Juno suffer in her fame. 'Tis thine to ruin realms, or turn a state, Betwixt the dearest friends to raise debate, And kindle kindred blood to mutual hate. Thy hand o'er towns the fun'ral torch displays, And forms a thousand ills ten thousand ways. Now shake out thy fruitful breast The seeds of envy, discord, and of cruel deeds. Confound the peace establish'd, and prepare Their souls to hatred, and their hands to war. Smear'd as she was with black Gorgonian blood, The fury sprang above the Stygian flood, And on her wicker wings sublime through night, She to the Latian palace took her flight, there sought the queen's apartment, stood before the peaceful threshold, and besieged the door. Restless Amata lay, her swelling breast fired with disdain for Turnus dispossessed, and the new nuptials of the Trojan guest. From her black bloody locks the fury shakes her darling plague, the favorite of her snakes. With her full force she threw the poisonous dart and fixed it deep within Amata's heart, that thus envenomed she might kindle rage and sacrifice to strife her house-husband's age. Unseen, unfelt, the fiery serpent skims betwixt her linen and her naked limbs, his baleful breath inspiring as he glides, now like a chain around her neck he rides, Now like a fillet to her head repairs, And with his circling volumes folds her hairs. At first the silent venom slid with ease, And seized her cooler senses by degrees. Then, ere the infected mass was fired too far, In plaintive accents she began the war. And thus bespoke her husband. Shall, she said, a wandering prince enjoy Lavinia's bed? If nature plead not in a parent's heart, Pity my tears, and pity her desert. I know, my dearest lord, the time will come. You in vain reverse your cruel doom. The faithless pirate soon will set to sea And bear the royal virgin far away. A guest like him, a Trojan guest before, In shoe of friendship, sought the Spartan shore, In ravished Helen, from her husband bore. Think on a king's inviolable word, And think on Turnus, her once plighted lord. To this false foreigner you give your throne, And wrong a friend, a kinsman, and a son. Resume your ancient care, and if the god your sire and you resolve on foreign blood, know all are foreign, in a larger sense, not born your subjects, or derived from hence. Then, if the line of Turnus you retrace, he springs from Inachus of Argive race. But when she saw her reasons idly spent, and could not move him from his fixed intent, she flew to rage, for now the snake possessed her vital parts, and poisoned all her breast. She raves, she runs with a distracted pace, and fills with horrid howls the public place. And as young striplings whip the top for sport, on the smooth pavement of an empty court, the wooden engine flies and whirls about, admired with clamors of the beardless rout, they lash aloud, each other they provoke, And lend their little souls at every stroke. Thus fares the queen, and thus her fury blows Amidst the crowd, and kindles as she goes. Nor yet content, she strains her malice more, And adds new ills to those contrived before. She flies the town, and mixing with a throng Of madding matrons, bears the bride along, Wandering through the woods and wilds and devious ways, And with these arts the Trojan match delays. She feigned the rites of Bacchus, cried aloud, 
and to the buxom god the virgin vowed e voi o bacchus thus began the song and e voi answered all the female throng o virgin worthy thee alone she cried o worthy thee alone the crew replied for thee she feeds her hair she leads thy dance and with thy winding ivy wreathes her lance like fury sees the rest the progress known all seek the mountains and forsake the town all clad in skins of beasts the javelin bear give to the wanton winds their flowing hair and shrieks and shoutings rend the suffering air the queen herself inspired with rage divine shook high up of her head a flaming pine then rolled her haggard eyes around the throng and sung on in turnus name the nuptial song e o ye latian dames if any here hold your unhappy queen amata dear if there be here she said who dare maintain my right nor think the name of mother vain unbind your fillets loose your flowing hair in orgies and nocturnal rites prepare End of Book 7, Part 1, recording by Alan Brown, Houston, Texas. Book 7, Part 2 of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Brown. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book 7. Juno Served by a Fury. Part 2. Amata's breast the Fury thus invades, and fires with rage amid the sylvan shades. Then, when she found her venom spread so far, the royal house embroiled in civil war. Raised on her dusky wings, she cleaves the skies, and seeks the palace where young Turnus lies. His town, as fame reports, was built of old by Danae, pregnant with almighty gold, who fled her father's rage, and, with a train of following Argives, through the stormy main, driven by the southern blasts, was fated here to reign. T'was Ardua once, now Ardea's name it bears, once a fair city, now consumed with years. Here in his lofty palace Turnus lay, betwixt the confines of the night and day, secure in sleep. The fury laid aside her looks and limbs, and with new methods tried the foulness of the infernal form to hide. Propped on a staff, she takes a trembling mien. Her face is furrowed, and her front obscene. Deep-dented wrinkles on her cheek she draws. Sunk are her eyes, and toothless are her jaws. Her hoary hair with holy fillets bound. Her temples with an olive wreath are crowned. Old Calibi, who kept the sacred fane of Juno, now she seemed, and thus began, appearing in a dream to rouse the careless man. Shall Turnus then such endless toil sustain in fighting fields, and conquer towns in vain? Win for a Trojan head to wear the prize, usurp thy crown, enjoy thy victories? The bride and scepter which thy blood has bought the king transfers, and foreign heirs are sought. Go now, deluded man, and seek again new toils, new dangers, on the dusty plain. Repel the Tuscan foes, their city seize, protect the Latians in luxurious ease. This dream all-powerful Juno sins. I bear her mighty mandates, and her words you hear. Haste, arm your Ardeans, issue to the plain.
with fate to friend assault the trojan train their thoughtless chiefs their painted ships that lie in tiber's mouth with fire and sword destroy the latian king unless he shall submit own his old promise and his new forget let him in arms the power of turnus prove and learn to fear whom he disdains to love for such is heaven's command the youthful prince with scorn replied and made this bold defense you tell me mother what i knew before the Phrygian fleet is landed on the shore. I neither fear nor will provoke the war. My fate is Juno's most peculiar care. But time has made you dote, and vainly tell of arms, imagined in your lonely cell. Go, be the temple and the gods your care. Permit to men the thought of peace and war. These haughty words Alecto's rage provoke, and frighted Turnus trembled as she spoke. Her eyes grow stiffened, and with sulphur burn. Her hideous looks and hellish form return. Her curling snakes with hissings fill the place, And open all the furies of her face. Then, darting fire from her malignant eyes, She cast him backward as he strove to rise, And, lingering, sought to frame some new replies. High on her head she rears two twisted snakes, Her chains she rattles, and her whip she shakes, And, churning bloody foam, thus loudly speaks, Behold whom time has made to dote and tell Of arms imagined in her lonely cell, Behold the fate's infernal minister, War, death, destruction, in my hand I bear. Thus having said, her smoldering torch impressed with her full force, she plunged into his breast. Aghast, he waked, and starting from his bed, cold sweat and clammy drops, his limbs o'erspread. Arms, arms, he cries, my sword and shield prepare. He breathes defiance, blood and mortal war. So, when with crackling flames, a cauldron fries, the bubbling waters from the bottom rise. Above the brims they force their fiery way. Black vapors climb aloft and cloud the day. The peace polluted thus, a chosen band he first commissions to the Latian land in threatening embassy. Then raised the rest to meet in arms the intruding Trojan guest. To force the foes from the Lavinian shore, and Italy's endangered peace restore. Himself alone an equal match he boasts, to fight the Phrygian and Ausonian hosts. The gods invoked, the Rutuli prepare their arms, and warn each other to the war. His beauty these, and those his blooming age, the rest his house and his own fame engage. While Turnus urges thus his enterprise, the Stygian fury to the Trojans flies, new frauds invents, and takes a steepy stand, which overlooks the vale with wide command, where fair Ascanius and his youthful train with horns and hounds a hunting match ordain, and pitch their toils around the shady plain. The fury fires the pack, they snuff, they vent, and feed their hungry nostrils with the scent. Twas of a well-grown stag whose antlers rise high o'er his front, his beams invade the skies. From this light cause the infernal maid prepares the country churls to mischief, hate, and wars. The stately beast the two Tyridae bred, snatched from his dams, and the tame youngling fed. Their father Tyreus did his fodder bring, Tyreus, chief ranger to the Latian king. Their sister Silvia cherished with her care the little wanton, and did wreaths prepare to hang his budding horns, with ribbons tied his tender neck, and combed his silken hide, and bathed his body. Patient of command in time he grew, and, 
growing used to hand, he waited at his master's board for food, then sought his salvage kindred in the wood, where grazing all the day, at night he came to his known lodgings and his country dame. This household beast that used the woodland grounds was viewed at first by the young hero's hounds, as down the stream he swam to seek retreat in the cool waters and to quench his heat. Ascanius, young and eager of his game, soon bent his bow, uncertain in his aim, but the dire fiend the fatal arrow guides, which pierced his bowels through his panting sides. The bleeding creature issues from the floods, possessed with fear, and seeks his known abodes, his old familiar hearth and household gods. He falls, he fills the house with heavy groans, implores their pity, and his pain bemoans. Young Sylvia beats her breast and cries aloud for succor from the clownish neighborhood. The churls assemble, for the fiend who lay in the close woody covert urged their way. One with a brand yet burning from the flame, armed with a knotty club, another came. Whate'er they catch or find, without their care, their fury makes an instrument of war. Tyreus, the foster father of the beast, then clinched a hatchet in his horny fist, but held his hand from the descending stroke, and left his wedge within the cloven oak, to whet their courage and their rage provoke. And now the goddess exercised in ill, who watched an hour to work her impious will, ascends the roof, and to her crooked horn, such as was then by Latian shepherds born, adds all her breath. The rocks and woods around, and mountains tremble at the infernal sound. The sacred lake of Trivia from afar, the veline fountains, and the sulfurious gnar, shake at the baleful blast the signal the war. Young mothers wildly stare, with fear possessed, and strain their helpless infants to their breast. The clowns, a boisterous, rude, ungoverned crew, with furious haste to the loud summons flew. The powers of Troy, then issuing on the plain with fresh recruits, their youthful chief sustain. Not theirs a raw and unexperienced train, but a firm body of embattled men. At first, while fortune favored neither side, the fight with clubs and burning brands was tried. But now, both parties reinforced, the fields are bright with flaming swords and brazen shields. A shining harvest either host displays, and shoots against the sun with equal rays. Thus, when a black-browed gust begins to rise, white foam at first, on the curled ocean fries. Then roars the main, the billows mount the skies, till, by the fury of the storm full blown, the muddy bottom o'er the clouds is thrown. First Almon falls, old Tyreus' eldest care, pierced with an arrow from the distant war. Fixed in his throat the flying weapon stood and stopped his breath and drank his vital blood, huge heaps of slain around the body rise. Among the rest, the rich Galesus lies, a good old man, while peace he preached in vain, amidst the madness of the unruly train. Five herds, five bleating flocks his pastures filled, his lands a hundred yoke of oxen tilled. Thus, while in equal scales their fortune stood, the fury bathed them in each other's blood. Then, having fixed the fight, exulting flies, and bears fulfilled her promise to the skies. To Juno thus she speaks, Behold, it is done. The blood already drawn, the war begun. The discord is complete, nor can they cease the dire debate nor you command the peace. Now, since the Latian and the Trojan brood have tasted vengeance and the sweets of blood, 
speak, and my power shall add this office more. The neighboring nations of the Ausonian shore shall hear the dreadful rumor from afar of armed invasion, and embrace the war. Then Juno thus. The grateful work is done, the seeds of discord sowed, the war begun. Frauds, fears, and fury have possessed the state, and fixed the causes of a lasting hate. A bloody hymen shall the alliance join, betwixt the Trojan and Ausonian line. But thou with speed to night and hell repair, for not the gods nor angry Jove will bear thy lawless wandering walks in upper air. Leave what remains to me, Saturnia said, the sullen fiend her sounding wings displayed, unwilling left the light and sought the nether shade. In midst of Italy, well known to fame, there lies a lake, Amsanctus is the name, below the lofty mounts. On either side thick forests the forbidden entrance hide, Full in the center of the sacred wood, an arm arises of the Stygian flood, which, breaking from beneath with bellowing sound, whirls the black waves and rattling stones around. Here Pluto pants for breath from out his cell, and opens wide the grinning jaws of hell. To this infernal lake the fury flies, here hides her hated head and frees the laboring skies. Saturnian Juno now, with double care, attends the fatal process of the war. The clowns, returned, from battle bear the slain, implore the gods, and to their king complain. The corpse of Almon and the rest are shown. Shrieks, clamors, murmurs fill the frighted town. Ambitious Turnus in the press appears, and aggravating crimes augments their fears proclaims his private injuries aloud a solemn promise made and disavowed a foreign son is sought and a mixed mongrel brood then they whose mothers frantic with their fear in woods and wiles the flags of bacchus bear and lead his dances with disheveled hair increase the clamor and the war demand. Such was Amata's interest in the land. Against the public sanctions of the peace, against all omens of their ill success, with fates averse, the rout in arms resort to force their monarch and insult the court. But, like a rock unmoved, a rock that braves the raging tempest and the rising waves, Propped on himself he stands. His solid sides wash off the seaweeds and the sounding tides. So stood the pious prince, unmoved, and long sustained the madness of the noisy throng. But when he found that Juno's power prevailed, and all the methods of cool counsel failed, he calls the gods to witness their offense disclaims the war, asserts his innocence. Hurried by fate, he cries, and borne before a furious wind, we have the faithful shore. Oh, more than mad men, you yourselves shall bear the guilt of blood in sacrilegious war. Thou, Turnus, shalt atone it by thy fate, and pray to heaven for peace, but pray too late. For me, my stormy voyage, at an end, I to the port of death securely tend. The funeral pomp, which to your kings you pay, Is all I want, and all you take away. He said no more, but, in his walls confined, Shut out the woes which he too well divined, Nor with the rising storm would vainly strive, But left the helm, and let the vessel drive. A solemn custom was observed of old, which Latium held, and now the Romans hold. Their standard, when in fighting fields they rear against, 
the fierce Hyrcanians, or declare the Scythian, Indian, or Arabian war, or from the boasting Parthians would regain their eagles, lost in Carhai's bloody plain, two gates of steel, the name of Mars they bear, and still are worshipped with religious fear, before his temple stand, the dire abode, and the feared issues of the furious god are fenced with brazen bolts. Without the gates the wary guardian Janus doubly waits. Then, when the sacred senate votes the wars, the Roman consul their decree declares, and in his robes the sounding gates unbars. The youth in military shouts arise, and the loud trumpets break the yielding skies. These rites, of old by sovereign princes used, were the king's office, but the king refused, deaf to their cries. Nor would the gates unbar of sacred peace, or loose the imprisoned war, but hid his head, and, safe from loud alarms, abhorred the wicked ministry of arms. Then heaven's imperious queen shot down from high. At her approach the brazen hinges fly. The gates are forced, and every falling bar. And, like a tempest, issues out the war. The peaceful cities of Thousonian shore, Lulled in their ease, and undisturbed before, Are all on fire, and some with studious care Their restive steeds in sandy plains prepare some their soft limbs in painful marches try and war is all their wish and arms the general cry part scour the rusty shields with seam and part new grind the blunted axe and point the dart with joy they view the waving ensigns fly and hear the trumpet's clangor pierce the sky five cities forge their arms the Atenian powers, Antemni, Tiber with her lofty towers, Ardea the proud, the Crustumerian town. All these of old were places of renown. Some hammer helmets for the fighting field, some twine young sallows to support the shield, the crosslets some, and some the quishes mold, with silver plated and with ductile gold. The rustic honors of the scythe and share give place to swords and plumes, the pride of war. Old falchions are new-tempered in the fires, the sounding trumpet every soul inspires. The word is given, with eager speed they lace the shining headpiece and the shield embrace. The neighing steeds are to the chariot tied, the trusty weapon sits on every side. And now the mighty labor is begun, Ye muses, open all your helicon. Sing you the chiefs that swayed the Ausonian land, Their arms and armies under their command. What warriors in our ancient clime were bred, What soldiers followed, and what heroes led. For well you know, and can record alone, What fame to future times conveys but darkly down. Mesentius first appeared upon the plain. Scorn sate upon his brows, and sour disdain, defying earth and heaven. Etruria lost, he brings to Turnus' aid his baffled host. The charming Lausus, full of youthful fire, rode in the rank and next his sullen sire. To Turnus only second, in the grace of manly mien and features of the face. A skilful horseman, and a huntsman bred, With fates averse a thousand men he led, His sire unworthy of so brave a son, Himself well worthy of a happier throne. Next Aventinus drives his chariot round The Latian plains, with palms and laurels crowned. Proud of his steeds, he smokes along the field, His father's hydra fills his ample shield, a hundred serpents hiss about the brims. The son of Hercules he justly seems, By his broad shoulders and gigantic limbs, Of heavenly part, and part of earthly blood. 
a mortal woman mixing with a god for strong alcides after he had slain the triple gerion drove from conquered spain his captive herds and thence in triumph led on tuscan tiber's flowery banks they fed then on mount aventine the son of jove the priestess rhea found and forced to love for arms his men long piles and javelins bore and poles with pointed steel their foes in battle gore like hercules himself his son appears in salvage pomp a lion's head he wears about his shoulders hangs the shaggy skin the teeth and gaping jaws severely grin thus like the god his father homely dressed he strides into the hall a horrid guest then two twin brothers from the fair tiber came which from their brother tibers took the name fierce chorus and catillus void of fear armed argive horse they led and in the front appear like cloud-born centaurs from the mountain's height with rapid course descending to the fight they rush along the rattling woods give way the branches bend before their sweepy sway nor was Prynestes founder wanting there whom fame reports the son of mulciber found in the fire and fostered in the plains a shepherd and a king at once he reigns and leads to turnus's aid his country swains his own Prynesty sends a chosen band with those who plow saturnia's gabine land besides the succor which cold aenian yields the rocks of hernicus and the dewy fields anania fat and father amasini a numerous rout but all of naked men nor arms they wear nor swords and bucklers wield nor drive the chariot through the dusty field but whirl from leathern slings huge balls of lead and spoils of yellow wolves adorn their head their left foot naked when they march to fight but in a bull's raw hide they sheathe the right Masapus next great neptune was his sire secure of steel and fated from the fire in pomp appears and with his ardor warms a heartless train unexercised in arms the just Faliscans he to battle brings and those who live where lake chimenea springs and where feronia's grove and temple stands who till fescinian are flavinian lands all these in order march and marching sing the warlike actions of their sea-born king like a long team of snowy swans on high which clap their wings and cleave the liquid sky when homeward from their watery pastures borne they sing and asia's lakes their notes return not one who heard their music from afar would think these troops an army trained to war but flocks of fowl that when the tempests roar with their hoarse gabbling seek the silent shore then clausus came who led a numerous band of troops embodied from the sabine land and in himself alone an army brought Twas he the noble Claudian race begot, the Claudian race, ordained in times to come to share the greatness of imperial Rome. He led the Curies forth of old renown, Mutuscans from their olive-bearing town, and all the Eritrean powers, besides a band that followed from Velinum's dewy land, and Amaternian troops of mighty fame, and mountaineers that from Severus came and from the craggy cliffs of tetrica and those where yellow tiber takes his way and where hymella's wanton waters play casperia sends her arms and with those that lie by faberis and fruitful foruli the warlike aids of horta next appear and the cold nursians come to close the rear mixed with the natives born of latine blood whom alia washes with her fatal flood not thicker billows beat the Libyan main when pale Orion sets in wintry rain, nor thicker harvests on rich Hermus rise, nor Lycian fields when Phoebus burns the skies, than stand these troops 
Their bucklers ring around, their trampling turns the turf, and shakes the solid ground. High in his chariot then Halesus came, a foe by birth to Troy's unhappy name, from Agamemnon born. To Turnus aid a thousand men the youthful hero led, who till the massic soil for wine renowned, and fierce Aruncans from their hilly ground, and those who live by Sidonesian shores, and where with shoaly fords Vulturnus roars. Cales and Oscar's old inhabitants, and rough Saticulans, inured to wants, light demi-lances from afar they throw, fastened with leathern thongs to gall the foe. Short, crooked swords in closer fight they wear, and on their warding arm light bucklers bear. Nor, Oibalus, shalt thou be left unsung, from nymph Semethus and old Telon sprung, who then in Teleboan Capri reigned, but that short isle the ambitious youth disdained, and o'er Campania stretched his ample sway, where swelling Sarnus seeks the Tyrene sea, or Batulum, and where Abella sees from her high towers the harvest of her trees. And these, as was the Teuton use of old, wield brazen swords and brazen bucklers hold, sling weighty stones when from afar they fight. Their casks are cork, a covering thick and light. Next these in rank the warlike Ufanes went, and led the mountain troops that Nursia sent. The rude Equicoli his rule obeyed, hunting their sport, and plundering was their trade. In arms they plowed, to battle still prepared. Their soil was barren, and their hearts were hard. Umbro the priest, the proud Morubians led, by King Archippus sent to Turnus' aid, and peaceful olives crowned his hoary head. His wand and holy words, the viper's rage, envenomed wounds of serpents could assuage. He, when he pleased with powerful juice to steep their temples, shut their eyes in pleasing sleep. But vain were Marcian herbs and magic art to cure the wound given by the Dardan dart. Yet his untimely fate, Vangetian woods, in sighs remurmured to the Fusine floods. The son of famed Hippolytus was there, famed as his sire and as his mother fair, whom in Egerian groves Arisha bore, and nursed his youth along the marshy shore, where great Diana's peaceful altars flame in fruitful fields, and Virbius was his name. Hippolytus, as old records have said, was by his stepdam sought to share her bed, but when no female arts his mind could move, she turned to furious hate, her impious love. Torn by wild horses on the sandy shore, another's crimes the unhappy hunter bore, glutting his father's eyes with guiltless gore. But chaste Diana, who his death deplored, with Esculapian herbs his life restored. Then Jove, who saw from high with just disdain, the dead inspired with vital breath again, struck to the center with his flaming dart, the unhappy founder of the godlike art. But Trivia kept in secret shade alone her care, Hippolytus, to fate unknown, and called him Virbius in the Egerian grove, where then he lived obscure but safe from Jove. For this from Trivia's temple and her wood are coursers driven, who shed their master's blood, affrighted by the monsters of the flood, his son, the second Virbius, yet retained his father's art and warrior steeds he reigned. Amid the troops, and like the leading god, high o'er the rest in arms, the graceful Turnus rode, a triple of plumes his crest adorned, on which with belching flames Chimaira burned. The more the kindled combat rises higher, the more with fury burns the blazing fire. Fair Io graced his shield, but Io now with horns exalted stands, and seems to low. A noble charge, her keeper by her side, to watch her walks, his hundred eyes applied, 
and on the brims her sire the watery god rolled from a silver urn his crystal flood a cloud of foot succeeds and fills the fields with swords and pointed spears and clattering shields of argives and of old sicanian bands and those who plow the rich rutulian lands auruncan youth and those sacrana yields and the proud labicans with painted shields and those who near numitian streams reside and those whom tiber's holy forests hide or circe's hills from the mainland divide where ufanes glides along the lowly lands or the black water of pomptina stands last from the volscians fair camilla came and led her warlike troops a warrior dame unbred to spinning in the loom unskilled she chose the nobler palace of the field mixed with the first the fierce virago fought sustained the toils of arms the danger sought outstripped the winds in speed upon the plain flew o'er the fields nor hurt the bearded grain she swept the seas and as she skimmed along her flying feet unbathed on billows hung men boys and women stupid with surprise where ere she passes fix their wondering eyes longing they look and gaping at the sight devour her o'er and o'er with vast delight her purple habit sits with such a grace on her smooth shoulders and so suits her face her head with ringlets of her hair is crowned and in a golden call the curls are bound she shakes her myrtle javelin and behind her lycian quiver dances in the wind end of book seven recording by alan brown houston texas Book Eight, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Eight. Arcadian Allies, Part One. When Turnus had assembled all his powers, his standard planted on Laurentium's towers, when now the springly trumpet from afar had given the signal of approaching war, had roused the neighing steeds to score the fields, while the fierce riders clattered on their shields, trembling with rage the Latian youth prepare to join the allies and headlong rush to war. Fierce Ufens and Mesopus led the crowd, with bold Mesentius who blasphemed aloud. These through the country took their wasteful course, the fields to forage and to gather force. Then Venulus to Diomed they send, to beg his aid Asonia to defend declare the common danger and inform the grecian leader of the growing storm aeneas landed on the latian coast with banished gods and with a baffled host yet now aspired to conquest of the state and claimed a title from the gods and fate what numerous nations in his quarrel came and how they spread his formidable name what he designed what mischief might arise if fortune favoured his first enterprise was left for him to weigh whose equal fears and common interest was involved in theirs while turnus and the allies thus urged the war the trojan floating in a flood of care beholds the tempest which his foes prepare this way and that he turns his anxious mind thinks and rejects the counsels he designed explores himself in vain in every part and gives no rest to his distracted heart so when the sun by day or moon by night strike on the polished brass that trembling light the glittering species here and there divide and cast their dubious beams from side to side now on the walls, now on the pavement play, and to the ceiling flash the glaring day. 
It was night, and weary nature lulled asleep, The birds of air, and fishes of the deep, And beasts, and mortal men. The Trojan chief Was laid on Tiber's bank, oppress'd with grief, And found in silent slumber late relief. Then thro' the shadows of the poplar wood Arose the father of the Roman flood, an azure robe was o'er his body spread, A wreath of shady reeds adorned his head. Thus manifest to sight the god appeared, And with these pleasing words his sorrow cheered. Undoubted offspring of ethereal race, O long expected in this promised place, Who through the foes hast borne thy banished gods, Restore them to their hearths and old abodes, this is thy happy home, the clime where fate ordains thee to restore the Trojan state. Fear not, the war shall end in lasting peace, and all the rage of haughty Juno cease, and that this nightly vision may not seem the effect of fancy or an idle dream. A sow beneath an oak shall lie along, all white herself, and white her thirty young. When thirty rolling years have run their race, thy son, Ascanius, on this empty space, shall build a royal town of lasting fame, which from this omen shall receive the name. Time shall approve the truth, for what remains, and how with sure success to crown thy pains. With patience next attend a banished band, driven with Evander from the Arcadian land, have planted here and placed on high their walls, their town the founder Palantium calls. Derived from Pallas, his great-grandsire's name, but the fierce Latians' old possession claim. With war infesting the new colony, these make thy friends, and on their aid rely. To thy free passage I submit my streams, wake son of Venus, from thy pleasing dreams. And when the setting stars are lost in day, to Juno's power thy just devotion pay. With sacrifice the wrathful queen appease, her pride at length shall fall, her fury cease. When thou returnst victorious from the war, perform thy vows to me with grateful care. The god am I, whose gel of water flows, Around these fields it fattens as it goes. Tiber my name among the rolling floods, Renowned on earth esteemed among the gods. This is my certain seat in times to come, My waves shall wash the walls of mighty Rome. He said and plunged below, while yet he spoke. His dream Aeneas and his sleep were soaked. He rose, and looking up, beheld the skies, With purple blushing, and the day arise. The water in his hollow palm he took, From Tiber's flood, and thus the powers bespoke. Laurentian nymphs, by whom the streams are fed, And Father Tiber in thy sacred bed, Receive Aeneas, and from danger keep, Whatever found, whatever holy deep conceals thy watery stores wherever they rise and bubbling from below salute the skies thou king of horned floods whose plenteous urn suffices fatness to the fruitful corn for this thy kind compassion of our woes shall share my morning song and evening woes but o oh, be present to thy people's aid and firm the gracious promise thou hast made Thus, having said to Gallus from his stores, With care he chooses mans and fits with oars. Now on the shore the fatal swine is found, Wondrous to tell she lay along the ground. Her well-fed offspring at her others hung, She white herself, and white her thirty young. Aeneas takes the mother and her brood, And all on Juno's altar are bestowed. The following night, and the succeeding day, Propitious Tiber smoothed his watery way. He rolled his river back, and poised he stood, A gentle swelling, and a peaceful flood. The Trojans mount their ships, they put from shore, Borne on the waves, and scarcely dip an oar. 
shouts from the land give omen to their course, and the pitched vessels glide with easy force. The woods and waters wonder at the gleam of shields and painted ships that stem the stream. One summer's night and one whole day they pass betwixt the greenwood shades and cut the liquid glass. The fiery sun had finished half his race, looked back and doubted in the middle space. When they from far beheld the rising towers, the tops of sheds and shepherds' lowly bars, thin as they stood, which then on homely clay now rise in marble from the Roman sway. These cots, Evander's kingdom, mean and poor, the Trojan saw and turned his ships to shore. It was a solemn day, the Arcadian states, the king and prince without the city gates, then paid their offsprings in a sacred grove to Hercules, the warrior son of Jove. Thick clouds of rolling smoke involve the skies, and fat of entrails on his altar fries. But when they saw the ship that stemmed the flood, and glittered through the covert of the wood, they rose with fear and left the unfinished feast, till dauntless Pallas reassured the rest, to pay the rites himself without delay. A javelin ceased and singly took his way then gained a rising ground and called from far resolve me strangers whence and what you are your business here and bring you peace or war high on the stern aeneas his stand and held a branch of olive in his hand while thus he spoke the phrygians arms you see expelled from troy provoked in italy by latian foes with war unjustly made, at first affianced, then at last betrayed. This message bear, the Trojans and their chief, bring holy peace and beg the king's relief. Struck with so great a name and all on fire, the youth replies, whatever you require. Your fame exacts upon our shores descend, a welcome guest and what you wish a friend. He said, and downward hasting to the strand, embraced the stranger prince, and joined his hand. Conducted to the groove, Aeneas broke, the silence first, and thus the king bespoke, Best of the Greeks to whom, by fate's command, I bear these peaceful branches in my hand. Undaunted I approach you, though I know, your birth is Grecian, and your land my foe. From Artres, though your ancient lineage came, and boast the brother kings your kindred claim, yet myself conscious worth your high renown, your virtue through neither neighboring nations blown. Our father's mingled blood, Apollo's voice, have led me hither less my need than choice. Our founder Dardanus, as fame has sung, and Greeks and knowledge from Electra sprung. Electra from the loins of Atlas came, Atlas whose head sustains the starry frame. Your sire is Mercury, whom long before, on cold Kalinus' top fair Maya bore. Maya the fair, on fame if we rely, was Atlas' daughter, who sustains the sky. Thus from one common source our streams divide, Ours is the Trojan, yours the Aridian side. Raised by these hopes, I sent no news before, nor asked your leave, nor did your faith implore. But come, without a pledge, my own ambassador, the same Rutulians who with arms pursue the Trojan race are equal foes to you. Our host expelled, what farther force can stay? the victor troops from universal sway. Then will they stretch their power at worth the land, and either see from side to side command. Receive our offered faith, and give us thine. Ours is a generous and experienced line. We want no hearts nor bodies for the war. In council cautious, and in fields we dare. He said, and while spoke, 
with piercing eyes, Evander viewed the man with vast surprise, pleased with his action, ravished with his face, then answered briefly with a royal grace. O oh, valiant leader of the Trojan line, in whom the features of thy father shine, how I recall Anchises, how I see his motions, mean and all my friend in thee. Long though it be, it's fresh within my mind, when Priam to his sister's court designed a welcome visit with a friendly stay, and through the Arcadian kingdom took his way and then past a boy the callow down began to shade my chin and call me first a man i saw the shining train with vast delight and priam's goodly person pleased my sight but great anchises far above the rest with awful wonder fired my youthful breast i longed to join in friendship's holy bands our mutual hearts and plight our mutual hands i first accosted him i sued i sought and with a loving force to phineus brought he gave me when at length constrained to go a lycian quiver and a gnosian bow a vest embroidered glorious to behold and two rich bridles with their bits of gold which my son's courses in obedience hold the league you ask i offer as you right and when to-morrow's sun reveals the light with swift supplies you shall be sent away now celebrate with us this solemn day whose holy rites admit no long delay Honour our annual feast, and take your seat, with friendly welcome at a homely treat. Thus having said, the bowls removed for fear, the youth replaced and soon restored the cheer. On sods of turf he set the soldiers round, a maple throne raised higher from the ground, received the Trojan chief, and o'er the bed a lion's shaggy hide for ornament they spread the loaves were served in canisters the wine in bowls the priest renewed the rites divine broiled entrails are their flood and beef's continued shine but when the rage of hunger was repressed thus spoke evander to his royal guest these rites these altars and this feast o king from no vain fears of superstition spring or blind devotion or from blinder chance or heeded zeal or brutal ignorance but saved from danger with a grateful sense the labours of a god we recompense see from afar yon rock that mates the sky about whose feet such heaps of rubbish lie such indigested ruin bleak and bare how desart now it stands exposed in air it was once a robber's den enclosed around with living stone and deep beneath the ground the monster carcass more than half a beast this hold impervious to the sun possessed the pavement ever foul with human gore heads and their mangled members hung the door vulcan this plague begot and like his sire black clouds he belched and flakes of livid fire time long expected eased us of our load and brought the needful presence of a god the avenging force of hercules from spain arrived in triumph from geron slain thrice livid the giant and thrice livid in vain his prize the lowing herds alcides drew near tiber's bank to grace the shady grove allured with hope of plunder and intent by force to rob by fraud to circumvent the brutal carcass as by chance they strayed for oxen thence and for fair kind conveyed and lest the printed footsteps might be seen he dragged them backwards to his rocky den the tracks averse a lying notice gave and led the searcher backward from the cave meantime the herdsman hero shifts his place to find fresh pasture and untrodden grass the beasts who missed their mates filled all around with bellowing and the rocks restored the sound 
One heifer who had heard her love complain, Roared from the cave, and made the project vain. Alcides found the fraud; with rage he shook, And toss'd about his head his knotted oak. Swift as the winds, or Scythian arrows flight, He clomb with eager haste the aerial height. Then first we saw the monster mend his pace, Fear his eyes, and paleness in his face. Confess'd the god's approach, trembling he springs, As terror had increas'd his feet with wings. Nor stay'd for stairs, but down the depth he threw, His body on his back, the door he drew. The door, a rib of living rock with pains, His father hew'd it out, and bound it with iron chains. He broke the heavy links, the mountains clos'd, And bars and levers to his foe opposed. The wretch had hardly made his dungeons fast. The fierce avenger came with bounding haste, surveyed the mouth of the forbidden hold, and here and there his raging eyes he rolled. He gnashed his teeth, and thrice he compassed round, with winged speed the circuit of the ground. Thrice at the cavern's mouth he pulled in vain, and panting thrice desisted from his pain. A pointed flinted rock, all bare and black, Grew gibbons from behind the mountain's back, Owls, ravens, all ill omens of the night, Here built their nests, and hither winged their flight. The leaning head hung, threatening o'er the flood, And nodded to the left the hero stud. Adverse with planted feet, and from the right, Tagged at the solid stone with all his might. Thus heaved the fixed foundation of the rock, Gave way, heaven echoed at the rattling shock. Tumbling it choked the flood on either side, The banks leap backward and the streams divide. The sky shrunk upward with unusual dread, And trembling Tiber divide beneath his bed. The court of Cacus stands revealed to sight. The cavern glares with new admitted light, so the pent vapours with rumbling sound he from below and rend the hollow ground a sounding flaw succeeds and from on high the gods with hate beheld the nether sky the ghost repine at violated night and curse the invading sun and sicken at the sight the graceless monster caught in open day enclosed and in despair to fly away howls horrible from underneath and fills his hollow palace with unmanly yells the hero stands above and from afar plies him with darts and stones and distant war he from his nostrils huge mouth expires black clouds of smoke amidst his father's fires gathering with each repeated blast the night to make uncertain aim and erring sight the wrathful god then plunges from above and where in thickest waves the sparkles draw their lights and wades through fumes and groups his way half singed half stifled till he grasps his prey the monster spewing fruitless flames he found he squeezed his throat he writhed his neck around, and in a knot his crippled members bound. Then from their sockets tore his burning eyes, rolled on a heap the breathless robber lies. The doors unbarred receive the rushing day, and thorough lights disclose the ravished prey. The bulls redeemed breathe open air again, next by the feet they drag him from his den. The wandering neighborhood with glad surprise behold his shagged breast, his giant size, his mouth that flames no more, and his extinguished eyes from that auspicious day with rites divine. We worship at the hero's holy shrine. Potitius first ordained these annual vows, as priests we added the Pinarian house, who raised this altar in the sacred shade where honors ever due for ever shall be paid. For these deserts and this high virtue shown, we warlike youth your heads with garlands crown. Fill high the goblets with a sparkling flood, 
and with deep draughts invoke our common god. This said, a double wreath Evander twined, and poplars black and white his temples bind, then brims his ample bowl with like design. The rest invoke the gods with sprinkled wine. Meantime the sun descended from the skies, and the bright evening star began to rise. And now the priest, Potitius at their head, in skins of beasts involved the long procession led, held high the flaming tapers in their hands, as custom had prescribed their holy bands. Then with a second course the table slowed, and with full chargers offered to the god. The sali sing, and sends his altars round, with saban smoke, their heads with poplar bound. One choir of old, another of the young, to dance and bear the burthen of the song. The lay records the labors and the praise, and all the mortal acts of Hercules. First how the mighty babe, when swathed in bands, the serpent strangled with his infant hands. Then, as in years and matchless force he grew, the Ocalian walls and Trojan overthrew. Besides, a thousand hazards they relate, procured by Juni and Eurystus' hate. Thy hand's unconquered hero could subdue the cloud-born Kentaurs and the monster's crew, nor thy resistless arms the bull withstood, nor the roaring terror of the wood. The triple porter of the Stygian seat with lolling tongue lay fawning at thy feet, and seized with fear forgot his mangled meat, the infernal waters tremble at thy sight. The god no face of danger could affright, no huge typhus nor the unnumbered snake, increased with hissing heads in Lerna's lake. Hail, Jove's undoubted son, an added grace to heaven and the great author of thy race. Receive the grateful offerings which we pay, and smile propitious on thy solemn day. In numbers thus they sung about the rest, the den and death of Carcus crown the feast. The woods to hollow vales convey the sound, the vales to hills, and hills the notes rebound. The rites performed, the cheerful train retire. Betwixt young Pallas and his aged sire, the Trojan passed the city to survey, and pleasing talk beguiled the tedious way. The stranger cast around his curious eyes, new objects viewing still with new surprise, with greedy joy inquires of various things, and acts and monuments of ancient kings. Then thus the founder of the Roman towers, these woods were first the seat of sylvan powers, of nymphs and fauns and salvage men who took their birth from trunks of trees and stubborn oak. No laws they knew, nor manners, nor the care of labouring oxen or the shining share, nor arts of gain, nor what they gained to spare. Their exercise, the chase, the running flood, supplied their thirst, the trees supplied their food, then Saturn came, who fled the power of Jove, robbed of his realms, and banished from above. The men, dispersed on hills, to towns he brought, and lores ordained, and civil customs taught. And Latium called the land where safe he lay, from his unduteous son and his usurping sway. With his mild empire peace and plenty came, and hence the golden times did read their name. A more degenerate and discoloured age succeeded this with avarice and rage. The Ausonians then, and bold Sicanians came, and Saturn's empire often changed the name. Then kings, gigantic Tibris, and the rest, with arbitrary sway the land oppressed. For Tibris' flood was Albula before, till from the tyrant's fate his name it bore. I last arrived driving from my native home by fortune's power and fate's resistless doom. Long tossed on seas I sought this happy land, worn by my mother nymph and called by heaven's command. End of Book Eight, Part One
Read by Lars Rolander. Book Eight, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden, Book Eight. Arcadian Allies, Part Two. Thus walking on, he spoke and showed the gate, since called Carmental by the Roman state, where stood an altar sacred to the name of old Carmenta, the prophetic dame, who to her son foretold the Aenean race, sublime in fame and Rome's imperial place. Then shows the forest, which in after times fierce Romulus for perpetrated crimes, a sacred refuge made with this the shrine, where Pan below the rock had rites divine. Then tells of Argus' death, his murdered guest, whose grave and tomb his innocence attest. Thence to steep Tarpeian rock he leads, now roofed with gold, then thatched with homely reeds. A reverent fear, such superstition reigns among the rude, even then possessed the swains. Some god they knew, what god they could not tell, did there amidst the sacred horror dwell. The Arcadian thought him Jove, and said they saw the mighty thunderer with majestic ape, who took his shield and dealt his bolts around, and scattered tempests on the teeming ground. Then saw two heaps of ruins, once they stood, two stately towns on either side the flood. Saturnius and Jan Nicholas remains, and either place the founder's name retains. Discoursing thus together they'd resort, where poor Evander kept his country court. They viewed the ground of Rome's litigious hall, once oxen load where now the lawyers bawl. Then stooping through the narrow gate they pressed, when thus the king bespoke his Trojan guest. Mean as it is this palace and this door, received Alcides then a conqueror. Dare to be poor except our homely food, which feasted him and emulate a god. Then underneath a lowly roof he led the weary prince and laid him on a bed. Then stuffing leaves with hides of bears o'erspread. Now night had shed her silver dews around, And with her sable wings embraced the ground. When love's fair goddess, anxious for her son, New tumults racing and new wars begun, Couched with her husband in his golden bed, With these alluring words invokes his aid, And that her pleasing speech his mind may move, inspires each accent with its charms of love while cruel fate conspired with grecian powers to level with the ground the trojan towers i'd ask not aid the unhappy to restore nor did the succor of thy skill implore nor urge the labors of my lord in vain a sinking empire longer to sustain though much i owe to priam's house and more the dangers of Aeneas did deplore. But now, by Jove's command and fate's decree, his race is doomed to reign in Italy. With humble suit I beg thy needful art, O still propitious power that rules my heart. A mother kneels a suppliant for her son, by Tethys and Aurora thou art one, to forge impenetrable shields and grace, with fated arms a less illustrious race. Behold what haughty nations are combined against the relics of the Phrygian kind. With fire and sword my people to destroy, and conquer Venus twice in conquering Troy. She said, and straight her arms of snowy hue about her unresolving husband threw. Her soft embraces soon infused desire, 
his bones and marrow sudden warmth inspire and all the godhead feels the wonted fire not half so swift the rattling thunder flies or forky lightning flash along the skies the goddess proud of her successful wiles and conscious of her form in secret smiles then thus the power obnoxious to her charms panting and half dissolving in her arms why seek you reasons for a cause so just or your own beauties or my love detrust long since had you required my helpful hand the artificer and art you might command to labour arms for troy nor jove nor fate confined their empire to so short a date and if you now desire new wars to wage my skill i promise and my pains engage whatever melting metals can conspire or breathing bellows or the forming fire is freely yours your anxious fears remove and think no task is difficult to love trembling he spoke and eager of her charms he snatched the willing goddess to his arms till in her lap infused he lay possessed of full desire and sunk to pleasing rest now when the night her middle rays had rode and his first slumber had refreshed the god the time when early housewives leave the bed when living embers on the hearth they spread supply the lamp and call the maids to rise with yawning mouths and with half-opened eyes they ply the distaff by the winking light and to their daily labour add their night thus frugally they earn their children's bread and uncorrupted keep the nuptial bed not less concerned nor at a later hour rose from his downy couch the forging power sacred to vulcan's name an isle there lay betwixt cecilia's coast and lepare raised high on smoking rocks and deep below in hollow caves the fires of etna glow the kiklops here their heavy hammer steel loud strokes and hissings of tormented steel are heard around the boiling waters roar and smoky flames through fuming tunnels soar hither the father of the fire by night through the brown air precipitates his flight on their eternal anvils here he found the brethren beating and the blows go round a load of pointless thunder now there lies before their hands to ripen for the skies these starts for angry jove they daily cast consumed on mortals with prodigious waste three rays of rhythm rain of fire three more of winged southern winds and cloudy store as many parts the dreadful mixture frame and fears are added and avenging flame inferior ministers for mars repair his broken axle trees and blunted war and send him forth again with furbished arms to wake the lazy war with trumpets loud alarms the rest refresh the scaly snake that fold the shield of pallas and renew their gold full on the crest of gorgon's head they place with eyes that roll in death and with distorted face my sons said vulcan set your task aside your strength and master skill must now be tried arms for a hero forge arms that require your force your speed and all your forming fire he said they set their former work aside and their new toils with eager haste divide a flood of molten silver brass and gold and deadly steel in the large furnace rolled of this their artful hands a shield prepare alone sufficient to sustain the war seven orbs within a spacious round they close one stirs the fire and one the bellows blows the hissing steel is in the smithy drowned the grot with beaten anvils groans around by turns their arms advance in equal time by turns their hands descend and hammers chime they turn the glowing mass with crooked tongues the fiery work proceeds with rustic songs 
while at the limnian gods command they urge their labors thus and ply the aeolian forge the cheerful morn salutes evander's eyes and songs of chirping birds invite to rise he leaves his lowly bed his buskins meet above his ankles sandals sheath his feet he sets his trusty sword upon his side and o'er his shoulder throws a panther's hide to menial dogs before the master pressed thus clad and guarded thus he seeks his kingly guest mindful of promised aid he mends his pace but meets aeneas in the middle space young pallas did his father's steps attend and true achates waited on his friend they join their hands a secret seat they choose the arcadian first their former talk renews undaunted prince i never can believe the trojan empire lost while you survive command the assistance of a faithful friend but feeble are the succors i can send our narrow kingdom here the tiber bounds that other side the latian state surrounds insults our walls and wastes our fruitful grounds but mighty nations i prepare to join their arms with yours and aid your just design you come as by your better genius sent and fortune seems to favour your intent not far from hence there stands a hilly town of ancient buildings and of high renown torn from the tuscans by the lydian race who gave the name of Cary to the place once agelina called it flourished long in pride of wealth and warlike people strong till cursed mesentius in a fatal hour assumed the crown with arbitrary power what words can paint those execrable times the subject's sufferings and the tyrant's crimes that blood those murders o ye gods replace on his own head and on his impious race the living and the dead at his command were coupled face to face and hand to hand till choked with stench in loathed embraces tied the lingering wretches pined away and died thus plunged in ills and meditating more the people's patience tired no longer bore the raging monster but with arms beset his house and vengeance and destruction threat they fire his place while the flame ascends they force his guards and execute his friends he cleaves the crowd and favoured by the night to turnus friendly court directs his flight by just revenge the tuscans set on fire with arms the king to punishment require their numerous troops now mustered on the strand my counsel shall submit to your command their navy swarms upon the coasts they cry to hoist their anchors but the gods deny an ancient augur skilled in future fate with these foreboding words restrains their hate ye brave in arms ye lydian blood the flower of tuscan youth and choice of all their power whom just revenge against mesentius arms to seek your tyrant's death by lawful arms know this no native of our land may lead this powerful people seek a foreign head out with these words in camps they still abide and wait with longing looks their promised guide Tarcon, the Tuscan chief, to me has sent their crowned and every regal ornament. The people join their own with his desire, and all my conduct as their king require. But the chill blood that creeps within my veins, and age and listless limbs unfit for pains, and a soul conscious of its own decay, have forced me to refuse imperial sway my palace were more fit to mount the throne and should but he is a sabine mother's son and half a native but in you combine a manly vigour and a foreign line where fate and smiling fortune shew the way pursue the ready path to sovereign sway 
the staff of my declining days my son shall make your good or ill success his own in fighting fields from you shall learn to dare and serve the hard apprenticeship of war your matchless courage and your conduct view and early shall begin to admire and copy you besides two hundred horse he shall command though few a warlike and well-chosen band these in my name are listed and my son as many more has added in his own scarce had he said achates and his guest with downcast eyes their silent grief expressed who short of succors and in deep despair shook at the dismal prospect of the war but his bright mother from a breaking cloud to cheer her issue thundered thrice aloud thrice forky lightning flashed along the sky and tyrrhena trumpets thrice were heard on high then gazing up repeated peals they hear and in a heaven serene refulgent arms appear reddening the skies and glittering all around the tempered metals clash and yield a silver sound the rest stood trembling struck with awe divine aeneas only conscious to the sign presaged the event and joyful viewed above the accomplished promise of the queen of love then to the arcadian king this prodigy dismiss your fear belongs alone to me heaven calls me to the war the expected sign is given of promised aid and arms divine my goddess mother whose indulgent care foresaw the dangers of the growing war this omen gave when bright vulcanian arms fated from force of steel by stygian charms suspended shone on high she then foreshowed approaching fights and fields to float in blood turnus shall dearly pay for faith forsworn and corps and swords and shields on tiber borne shall choke his flood now sound the loud alarms and latian troops prepare your perjured arms he said and rising from his homely throne the solemn rites of hercules begun and on his altars wake the sleeping fires then cheerful to his household gods retires their offers chosen she the arcadian king and trojan youth the same oblation spring next of his men and ships he makes review draws out the best and ablest of the crew down with the falling stream the refuse run to raise with joyful news his drooping son steeds are prepared to mount the trojan band who wait their leader to the tyrrhene land a sprightly courser fairer than the rest the king himself presents his royal guest a lion's hide his back and limbs enfold precious with studded work and paws of gold fame through the little city spreads aloud the intended march amid the fearful crowd the matrons beat their breasts dissolve in tears and double their devotion in their fears the war at hand appears with more affright and rises every moment to the sight then old evander with a close embrace strained his departing friend and tears overflow his face would heaven said he my strength and youth recall such as i was beneath prenestus wall then when i made the foremost foes retire and set whole heaps of conquered shields on fire when herelus in single fight i slew whom with three lives feronia did endure and thrice i sent him to the stygian shore till the last ebbing soul returned no more such if i stood renewed not these alarms nor death should rend me from my palace's arms nor proud mesentius thus unpunished boast his rapes and murders on the tuscan coast ye gods and mighty jove in pity bring relief and hear a father and a king if fate and you reserve these eyes to see 
my son return with peace and victory if the loved boy shall bless his father's sight if we shall meet again with more delight then draw my life in length let me sustain in hopes of his embrace the worst of pain but if your hard decrees which oh i dread have doomed to death his undeserving head this oh this very moment let me die while hopes and fears in equal balance lie while yet possessed of all his youthful charms i strain him close within these aged arms before that fatal news my soul shall wound he said and swooning sunk upon the ground his servants bore him off and softly laid his languished limbs upon his homely bed the horsemen march the gates are open wide aeneas at their head achates by his side next these the trojan leaders rode along last follows in the rear the arcadian throng young pallas shone conspicuous o'er the rest gilded his arms embroidered was his vest so from the seas exerts his radiant head the star by whom the lights of heaven are led shakes from his rosy locks the pearly dews dispels the darkness and the day renews the trembling wives the walls and turrets crowd and follow with their eyes the dusty cloud which winds disperse by fits and shew from far the blaze of arms and shields and shining war the troops drawn up in beautifully array o'er hearthy plains pursue the ready way repeated peals of shouts are heard around the neighing courses answer to the sound and shake with horny hoofs the solid ground a greenswood shade for long religion known stands by the streams that wash the tuscan town encompassed round with gloomy hills above which add a holy horror to the grow the first inhabitants of grecian blood that sacred forest to sylvanus vowed the guardian of their flocks and fields and pay their due a devotions on his annual day not far from hence along the river side in tents secure the tuscan troops abide by tarcon led now from a rising ground aeneas cast his wandering eyes around and all the tyrrhene army had in sight stretched on the spacious plain from left to right thither his warlike train the trojan led refreshed his men and wearied horses fed meantime the mother goddess crowned with charms breaks through the clouds and brings the fated arms within a winding vale she finds her son on the cool river's banks retired alone she shews her heavenly form without disguise and gives herself to his desiring eyes behold she said performed in every part my promise made and vulcan's laboured art now seek secure the latian enemy and the haughty turnus to the fields defy she said and having first a son embraced the radiant arms beneath an oak she placed proud of the gift he rolled his greedy sight around the work and gazed with vast delight he lifts he turns he poises and admires the crested helm that vomits radiant fires his hands the fatal sword and corslet hold one keen with tempered steel one stiff with gold both ample flaming both and beamy bright so shines a cloud when edged with adverse light he shakes the pointed spear and longs to try the plated cushions on his manly thigh but most admires the shield's mysterious mould and roman triumphs rising on the gold for these embossed the heavenly smith had wrought not in the rolls of future fate untaught the wars in order and the race divine of warriors issuing from the julian line the cave of mars was dressed with mossy greens there by the wolf were laid the martial twins intrepid on her swelling dugs they hung the foster dam lolled out her fawning tongue 
they sucked secure while bending back her head she licked their tender limbs and formed them as they fed not far from thence new rome appears with games projected for the rape of sabine dames the pit resounds with shrieks a war succeeds for breach of public faith and unexampled deeds here for revenge the sabine troops contend the romans there with arms the prey defend wearied with tedious war at length they cease and both the kings and kingdoms plight the peace the friendly chiefs before jove's altar stand both armed with each a charger in his hand a fatted sow for sacrifice is led with imprecations on the perjured head near this the traitor metius stretched between for fiery steeds is dragged along the green by tullus doom the brambles drink his blood and his thorn limbs are left the vulture's food there porcina to rome proud tarquin brings and would by force restore the banished kings one tyrant for his fellow tyrant fights the roman youth assert their native rights before the town the tuscan army lies to win by famine or by fraud surprise the king half threatening half disdaining stood while cockles broke the bridge and stemmed the flood the captive maids there tempt the raging tide scraped from their chains with cloelia for their guide high on a rock heroic manlius stood to guard the temple and the temple's god then rome was poor and there you might behold the palace thatched with straw now roofed with gold the silver goose before the shining gate there flew and by her cackle saved the state she told the gauls approach the approaching gauls obscure in night ascend and seize the walls the gold dissembled well their yellow hair and golden chains on their white necks they wear gold are their vests long alpine spears they wield and their left arm sustains a length of shield hard by the leaping salian priests advance and naked through the streets the mad luperci dance in caps of wool the targets dropped from heaven her modest matrons in soft litters driven to pay their vows in solemn pomp appear and odorous gums in their chaste hands they bear far hence removed the stygian seats are seen pains of the damned and punished cataline hung on a rock the traitor and around the furies hissing from the nether ground apart from these the happy souls he draws and cato's holy ghost dispensing laws betwixt the quarters flows a golden sea but foaming surges there in silver play the dancing dolphins with their tails divide the glittering waves and cut the precious tide amid the main two mighty fleets engage their brazen beaks opposed with equal rage axiom surveys the well-disputed prize levcata's watery plain with foamy billows fries young caesar on the stern in armour bright here leads the roman and their gods to fight his beamy temples shoot their flames afar and over his head is hung the julian star agrippa seconds him with prosperous gales and with propitious gods his foes assails a naval crown that binds his manly brows the happy fortune of the fight foreshows ranged on the line of post antonius springs barbarian aids and troops of eastern kings the arabian near and bactrians from afar of tongues discordant and a mingled war and rich in gaudy robes amidst the strife his ill fate follows him the egyptian wife moving they fight with oars and forky prows the froth is gathered and the water glows it seems as if the cycladus again were rooted up and justled in the main or floating mountains floating mountains meet such is the fierce encounter of the fleet 
Fireballs are thrown, and pointed jav'lins fly; The fields of Neptune take the purple dye. The queen herself, amidst the loud alarms, With cymbals toss'd her fainting soldiers warms. Fool as she was, who had not yet divin'd Her cruel fate, nor saw the snakes behind; Her country gods, the monsters of the sky, Great Neptune, Pallas, and Love's queen defy. The dog Anubis barks, but barks in vain, Nor longer dares oppose th' ethereal train. Mars in the middle of the shining shield Is grav'd and strides along the liquid field. The dee results from heav'n with swift descent, And discord dyed in blood with garments rent. Divides the priest, her steps Bellona treads, And shakes her iron rod above their heads. This scene Apollo from his Axian height Pours down his arrows at whose winged flight The trembling Indians and Egyptians yield. And soft Sabines quit the water field, The fatal mistress hoists her silken sails, And shrinking from the fight invokes the gales. Aghast she looks, and heaves her breast for breath, Panting and pale with fear of future death. The god had figured her as driving along by winds and waves and scudding through the throng. Just opposite, sad Nilus opens wide his arms and ample bosom to the tide, and spreads his mantle over the winding coast, in which he wraps his queen and hides the flying host. The victor to the gods his thanks expressed, and Rome triumphant with his presence blessed. Three hundred temples in the town he placed, With spoils and altars every temple graced. Three shining nights and three succeeding days, The fields resound with shouts, the streets with praise, The domes with songs, the theatres with plays. All altars flame before each altar lies, Drenched in his gore the destined sacrifice. Great Caesar sits sublime upon his throne before Apollo's porch of Parian stone, accepts the presents vowed for victory, and hangs the monumental crowns on high. Vast crowds of vanquished nations march along, various in arms, in habit, and in tongue. Here Malciber assigns the proper place for Carians and the ungirt Numidian race. Then ranks the Trachians in the second row, with Scythians expert in the dart and bow. And here the tamed Euphrates humbly glides, and there the Rhine submits her swelling tides. And proud Araxas, whom no bridge could bind, the Danes' unconquered offspring march behind, and Morini, the last of humankind. These figures on the shield divinely wrought, by Vulcan labored and by Venus brought, with joy and wonder fill the hero's thought. Unknown the names, he yet admires the grace, and bears aloft the fame and fortune of his race. End of Book Eight Read by Lars Rolander Nine, part one of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. While these affairs in distant places pass, it, the various eyes Juno sends with haste to find bold Turnus, who with anxious thought the secret shade of his great-grandsire sought. Retired alone, she found the daring man, and oped her rosy lips, and thus began. What none of all the gods could grant thy vows, that Turnus this auspicious day bestows. Aeneas, gone to seek the Arcadian prince, has left the Trojan camp without defence 
and short of succors there employs his pains in parts remote to raise the tuscan swains now snatch an hour that favors thy designs unite thy forces and attack their lines this said on equal wings she poised her weight and formed a radiant rainbow in her flight the Daunian hero lifts his hands, eyes, and thus invokes the goddess as she flies. Iris, the grace of heaven, what power divine, has sent thee down through dusky clouds to shine? See, they divide, immortal day appears, and glittering planets dancing in their spheres. With joy these happy omens I obey, and follow to the wall the god that leads the way. Thus having said, as by the brook he stood, he scooped the water from the crystal flood. Then with his hands the drops to heaven he throws, and loads the powers above with offered woes. Now march the bold confederates through the plain, well horsed, well clad, a rich and shining train. Mesopus leads the van, and in the rear the sons of Tyrius in bright arms appear. In the main battle, with his flaming crest, the mighty Turnus towers above the rest. Silent they move majestically slow, like ebbing Nile or Ganges in his flow. The Trojans view the dusty cloud from far, and the dark menace of the distant war. Caicus from the rampire saw it rise, blackening the fields and thickening through the skies. Then to his fellows thus aloud he calls, What rolling clouds, my friends, approach the walls? Arm, arm, and man the works, prepare your spears, And pointed darts the Latian host appears. Thus warned, they shut their gates, with shouts ascend, The bulwarks and secure their foes attend. For their wise general, with foreseeing care, had charged them not to tempt the doubtful war, nor, though provoked in open fields advance, but close within their lines attend their chance. Unwilling, they yet they keep the strict command, and sorely await in arms the hostile band. The fairy Turnus flew before the rest, a piebald steed of Trachian strain he pressed. His helm of massy gold and crimson was his crest, with twenty horse to second his designs. An unexpected foe he faced the lines. Is there, he said in arms, who bravely dare his leader honour and his danger share? Then spurring on, his brandished dart he threw, in sign of war, applauding shouts ensue. Amazed to find a dastard race that run behind the rampires and the battle shun, he rides around the camp with rolling eyes, and stops at every post and every passage tries. So roams the nightly wolf about the fold, wet with descending showers and stiff with cold. He howls for hunger, and he grins for pain, his gnashing teeth are exercised in vain. An impotent of anger finds no way in his distended paws to grasp the prey. The mothers listen, but the bleeding lambs securely swig the dug beneath the dams. Thus ranges eager Turnus o'er the plain, sharp with desire and furious with disdain. So veys each passage with a piercing sight to force his foes in equal field to fight. Thus, while he gazes round at length, he spies, Where fenced with strong redoubts their navy lies. Close underneath the walls, the washing tide Secures from all approach this weaker side. He takes the wished occasion, fills his hand With ready fires, and shakes a flaming brand. Urged by his presence, every soul is warmed, And every hand with kindled furs is armed. From the furred pines the scattering sparkles fly, Fat vapors mixed with flames involve the sky. What power, O Muses, could avert the flame, Which threatened in the fleet the Trojan name? Tell, for the fact through length of time obscure, Is hard to fate, yet shall the fame endure. Tis said that when the chief prepared his flight, And fell his timber from Mount Ida's height, the grand goddess then approached her son, 
and with a mother's majesty begun grant me she said the sole request i bring since conquered heaven has owned you for its king on ida's brows for ages past there stood with firs and maples filled a shady wood and on the summit rose a sacred grove where i was worshipped with religious love those woods that holy grew my long delight i gave the trojan prince to speed his flight now filled with fear on their behalf i come let neither winds o'erset nor waves entomb the floating forests of the sacred pine but let it be their safety to be mine then thus replied her awful son who rolls the radiant stars and heaven and earth controls how dare you mother endless state demand for vessels moulded by a mortal hand what then is fate shall bold aeneas ride of safety certain on the uncertain tide yet what i can i grant when wafted o'er the chief is landed on the latian shore whatever ships escape the raging storms at my command shall change their fading forms to nymphs divine and plough the watery way like dotis and the daughters of the sea to seal this sacred vow by styx he swore the lake of liquid pitch the dreary shore and phlegaton's innavigable flood and the black regions of his brother god he said and shook the skies with his imperial nod and now at length the numbered hours were come prefixed by fate's irrevocable doom when the great mother of the gods was free to save her ships and finish joe's decree first from the quarter of the morn there sprung a light that signed the heavens and shots along then from a cloud fringed round with golden fires where timbrels heard and Berecynthian choirs and last a voice with more than mortal sounds both hosts in armed opposed with equal horror wounds o trojan race your needless aid forbear and know my ships are my peculiar care with greater ease the bold rutulian may with hissing brands attempt to burn the sea then singe my sacred pines but you may charge loosed from your crooked anchors launch at large exalted each a nymph forsake the sand and swim the seas at sibylus command no sooner had the goddess ceased to speak when lo the obedient ships their hawsers break and strange to tell like dolphins in the main they plunge their prows and dive and spring again as many beauteous maids the billows sweep as rode before tall vessels on the deep the foes surprised with wonder stood aghast mesopus curb his fiery course as haste old tiber roared and raising up his head called back his waters to their oasy bed turnus alone undaunted bore the shock and with these words his trembling troops bespoke these monsters for the trojans fate are meant and are by jove for black presages sent he takes the coward's last relief away for fly they cannot and constrained to stay must yield unfought a base inglorious prey the liquid half of all the globe is lost heaven shuts the seas and we secure the coast theirs is no more than that small spot of ground which myriads of our martial men surround their fates i fear not or vain oracles it was given to venus they should cross the seas and land secure upon the latian plains their promised hour is past and mine remains tis in the fate of turnus to destroy with sword and fire the faithless race of troy shall such affronts as these alone inflame the grecian brothers and the grecian name my cause and theirs is one a fatal strife and final ruin for a ravished wife was not enough that punished for the crime they fell but will they fall a second time one would have thought they paid enough before to curse the costly sex and durst offend no more can they securely trust their feeble wall a slight partition a thin interval 
betwixt their fate and them when troy though built by hands divine yet perished by their guilt lend me for once my friends your valiant hands to force from out their lines these dastard bands less than a thousand ships will end this war nor vulcan needs his fated arms prepare let all the tuscans all the arcadians join nor these nor those shall frustrate my design let them not fear the treasons of the night the robbed palladium the pretended flight our onset shall be made in open light no wooden engine shall their town betray fires they shall have around but fires by day no grecian babes before their camp appear whom hector's arms detain to the tenth tardy year now since the sun is rolling to the west give we the silent night to needful rest refresh your bodies and your arms prepare the morn shall end the small remains of where the post of honour to mesopus falls to keep the nightly guards to watch the walls to pitch the fires at distances around and close the trojans in their scanty ground twice seven rutulian captains ready stand and twice seven hundred horse these chiefs command all clad in shining arms the works invest each with a radiant helm and waving crest stretched at their length they press the grassy ground they laugh they sing the jolly bowls go round with lights and cheerful fires renew the day and pass the wakeful night in feasts and play the trojans from above their foes beheld and with armed legions all the rampires filled seized with affright the their gates they first explore join works to works with bridges tower to tower thus all things needful for defence abound menestus and brave serestus walk the round commissioned by their absent prince to share the common danger and divide the care the soldiers draw their lots and as they fall by turns relieve each other on the wall nigh where the foes their utmost guards advance to watch the gate was warlike nisus chance his father hyrtacus of noble blood his mother was a huntress on the wood and sent him to the wars well could he bear his lance in fight and dart the flying spear but better skilled unerring shafts to send beside him stood every alus his friend every alus then whom the trojan host no fairer face or sweeter air could boast scarce had the down to shade his cheeks begun one was their care and their delight was one one common hazard in the war they shared and now were both by choice upon the guard then nisus thus or do the gods inspire this warmth or make we gods of our desire a generous ardour boils within my breast eager of action enemy to rest this urges me to fight and fires my mind to leave a memorable name behind thou seest the foe secure how faintly shine their scattered fires the most in sleep supine along the ground an easy conquest lie the wakeful few of fuming flagon ply all hashed around now hear what i revolve a thought unripe and scarcely yet resolved our absent prince both camp and council mourn by message both would hasten his return if they confer what i demand on thee for fame is recompense enough for me methinks beneath yon hill i have espied a way that safely will my passage guide every aulus stood listening while he spoke with love of praise and noble envy struck then to his ardent friend exposed his mind all this alone and leaving me behind am i unworthy nisus to be joined thinkest thou i can share of glory yield or send thee unassisted to the field not so my father taught my childhood arms born in a siege and bred among alarms nor is my youth unworthy of my friend nor of the heaven-born hero i attend the thing called life with ease i can disclaim and think it oversold to purchase frame then nisus thus alas thy tender years would minister new matter to my fears 
so may the gods who view this friendly strife restore me to thy loved embrace with life condemned to pay my vows as sure i trust this thy request is cruel and unjust but if some chance as many chances are and doubtful hazards in the deeds of war if one should reach my head there let it fall and spare thy life i would not perish all thy bloomy youth deserves a longer date live thou to mourn thy love's unhappy fate to bear my mangled body from the foe or buy it back and funeral rites bestow or if hard fortune shall those dues deny thou canst at least an empty tomb supply o oh, let not me the widow's tears renew nor let a mother's curse my name pursue thy pious parents who for love of thee forsook the coast of friendly sicily her age committing to the seas and wind when every weary matron stayed behind to this every aulus you plead in vain and but protract the course you cannot gain no more delays but haste with that he wakes the nodding watch each of his office takes the guard relieved the generous couple went to find the consul at the royal tent all creatures else forgot their daily care and sleep the common gift of nature share except the trojan peers who wakeful sate in nightly council for the endangered state they vote a message to their absent chief shew their distress and beg a swift relief amid the camp a silent seat they chose remote from clamour and secure from foes on their left arms their ample shields they bear the right reclined upon the bending spear now nisus and his friend approach the guard and beg admission eager to be heard the affair important not to be deferred ascanius bids them be conducted in ordering the more experienced to begin then nisus thus ye fathers lend your ears nor judge our bold attempt beyond our years the foe securely drenched in sleep and wine neglect their watch the fires but thinly shine and where the smoke in cloudy vapours flies cowering the plain and curling to the skies betwixt two paths which at the gate divide close by the sea a passage we have spied which will our way to great aeneas guide expect each hour to see him safe again loaded with spoils of foes in battle slain snatch we the lucky minute while we may nor can we be mistaken in the way for hunting in the vale we both have seen the rising turrets and the stream between and know the winding course with every ford he ceased and old aletus took the word our country gods in whom our trust we place will yet from ruin save the trojan race while we behold such dauntless worth appear in dawning youth and souls so void of fear then into tears of joy the father broke each in his longing arms by turns he took panted and paused and thus again he spoke ye brave young men what equal gifts can we in recompense of such desert decree the great is sure and best you can receive the gods and your own conscious worth will give the rest our grateful general will bestow and young ascanius till his manhood owe and i whose welfare in my father lies ascanius adds by the great deities by my dear country by my household gods by hoary vestus rites and dark abouts adjure you both on you my fortune stands that and my faith i plight into your hands make me but happy in his safe return whose wonted presence i can only mourn your common gift shall two large goblets be of silver wrought with curious imagery and high embossed which when old priam reigned my conquering sire at sacked Arisiba gained and more two tripods cast in antique mould with two great talents of the finest gold beside a costly bowl engraved with art which dido gave when first she gave her heart but if in conquered italy we reign when spoils by lot the victor shall obtain 
thou sawest the courser by proud turnus pressed that nisus and his arms and nodding crest and shield from chance exempt shall be thy share twelve labouring slaves twelve handmaids young and fair all clad in rich attire and trained with care and last a latian field with fruitful plains and a large portion of the king's domains but thou whose years are more to mine allied no fate my vowed affection shall divide from thee heroic youth be fully mine take full possession all my soul is thine one faith one fame one fate shall both attend my life's companion and my bosom friend my peace shall be committed to thy care and to thy conduct my concerns in wear then thus the young Evrialus replied whatever fortune good or bad betide the same shall be my age as now my youth no time shall find me wanting to my truth this only from your goodness let me gain and this ungranted all rewards are vain of priam's royal race my mother came and sure the best that ever bore the name whom neither troy nor sicily could hold from me departing but o'erspent and old my fate she followed ignorant of this whatever danger neither parting kiss nor pious blessing taken her i leave and in this only act of all my life deceive by this right hand and conscious night i swear my soul so sad a farewell could not bear be you her comfort fill my vacant place permit me to presume so great a grace support her age forsaken and distressed that hope alone will fortify my breast against the worst of fortunes and of fears he said the moved assistance melt in tears then thus ascanius wonderstruck to see that image of his filial piety so great beginnings in so green an age exact the faith which i again engage thy mother all the dues shall justly claim craves i had and only want the name whatever event thy bold attempt shall have tis merit to have borne a son so brave now by my head a sacred oath i swear my father used it what returning here crowned with success i for thyself prepare that if thou fail shall thy loved mother share he said and weeping while he spoke the word from his broad belt he drew a shining sword magnificent with gold decaon made and in an ivory scabbard sheathed the blade this was his gift great menestus gave his friend a lion's hide his body to defend and good aletus furnished him beside with his own trusty helm of temper tried thus armed they went the noble trojans wait their issuing forth and follow to the gate with prayers and vows above the rest appears ascanius manly far beyond his years and messages committed to their care which all in winds were lost and flitting air the trenches first they passed then took their way where their proud foes in pitched pavilions lay to many fatal ere themselves were slain they found the careless host dispersed upon the plain who gorged and drunk with wine supinely snore unharnessed chariots stand along the shore amidst the wheels and reins the goblets by a medley of debauch and war they lie observing nisus shewed his friend the sight behold a conquest gained without a fight occasion offers and i stand prepared there lies our way be thou upon the guard and look around while i securely go and you a passage through the sleeping foe softly he spoke then striding took his way with his drawn sword where haughty ramness lay his head raised high on tapestry beneath and heaving from his breast he drew his breath a king and prophet by king turnus loved but fate by prescience cannot be remote him and his sleeping slaves he slew then spies where remus with his rich retinue lies his armour bearer first and next he kills his charioteer entrenched betwixt the wheels and his loved horses last invades their lord full on his neck he drives the fatal sword the gasping head flies off a purple flood 
flows from the trunk that welters in the blood which by the spurning heels dispersed around the bed besprinkles and bedews the ground lamus the bold and lamyrus the strong he slew and then serranus fair and young from dice and wine the youth retired to rest and puffed the fumy god from out his breast even then he dreamt of drink and lucky play more lucky had it lasted till the day the famished lion thus with hunger bold o'erleaps the fences of the nightly fold and tears the peaceful flocks with silent awe trembling they lie and pant beneath his pow nor with less rage Evrialus employs the wrathful sword or fewer foes destroys but on the noble crowd his fury flew he fathers hebesus and rueto slew oppressed with heavy sleep the former fell but rueto's wakeful and observing all behind a spacious jar he slinked for fear the fatal iron found and reached him there for as he rose it pierced his naked side and reeking thence returned in crimson dyed the wound pours out a stream of wine and blood the purple soul comes floating in the flood now where mesapus quartered they arrive the fires were fainting there and just alive the warrior horses tied in order fed nisus observed the discipline and said our eager thirst of blood may both betray and see the scattered streaks of dawning day foe to nocturnal thefts no more my friend here let our glutted execution end a lane through slaughtered bodies we have made the bold ebrialus though loath obeyed of arms and arras and of plate they find a precious load but these they leave behind yet fond of gaudy spoils the boy would stay to make the rich caparison his prey which on the steed of conquered ramnus lay nor did his eyes less longingly behold the girdle belt with nails of burnished gold this present sedicus the rich bestowed on remulus when friendship first they vowed and absent joined in hospital ties he dying to his heir bequeathed the prize till by the conquering ardian troops oppressed he fell and they the glorious gift possessed these glittering spoils now made the victors gain he to his body suits but suits in vain mesapus helm he finds among the rest and lays his on and wears the waving crest proud of their conquest prouder of their prey they leave the camp and take the ready way end of book nine part one read by lars rolande book nine part two of the Aeneid. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book 9a. Night Surti, A Day Assault. Part 2. But far they had not passed before they spied three hundred horse with balsams for their guide. The queen a legion to King Turnus sent, but the swift horse the slower foot prevent. And now advancing sought the leader's tent, they saw the pair for throw the doubtful shade, his shining helm Evrialis betrayed, on which the moon with full reflection played. Tis not for naught, cried Volsons from the crowd, these men go there, then raised his voice aloud stand stand why thus in arms and whither bent from whence to whom and on what errand sent silent they scud away and haste their flight to neighbouring woods and trust themselves to night the speedy horse all passages belay and spur their smoking steeds to cross their way and watch each entrance of the winding wood black was the forest thick with speech it stood 
horrid with fern and intricate with thorn few paths of human feet or tracks of beasts were worn the darkness of the shades his heavy prey and fear misled the younger from his way but nisus hit the turns with happier haste and thoughtless of his friend the forest passed and alban plains from alba's name so called where king latinus then his oxen stole till turning at the length he stood his ground and missed his friend and cast his eyes around ah wretch he cried where have i left behind the unhappy youth where shall i hope to find or what way take again he ventures back and treads the mazes of his former track he winds the wood and listening hears the noise of tramping courses and the rider's voice the sound approached and suddenly he viewed the foes enclosing and his friend pursued forelaid and taken while he strove in vain the shelter of the friendly shades to gain what should he next attempt what arms employ what fruitless force to free the captive boy or desperate should he rush and lose his life with odds suppressed in such unequal strife resolved at length his pointed spear he shook and casting on the moon a mournful look guardian of groves and goddess of the night fair queen he said direct my dart aright if ever my pious father for my sake did grateful offerings on thy altars make or i increased them with my sylvan's toils and hung thy holy roofs with savage spoils give me to scatter these then from his ear he poised and aimed and launched the trembling spear the deadly weapon hissing from the grove impetuous on the back of sulmo drove pierced his thin armour drank his vital blood and in his body left the broken he staggers round his eyeballs roll in death and with short sobs he gasps away his breath all stand amazed a second javelin flies with equal strength and quivers through the skies this through thy temples targos forced the way and in the brain-pan warmly buried lay fierce volsons foams with rage and gazing round descried not him who gave the fatal wound nor knew to fix revenge but thou he cries shalt pay for both and at the prisoner flies with his drawn sword then struck with deep despair that cruel sight the lover could not bear but from his covert rushed in open view and sent his voice before him as he flew me me he cried turn all your swords alone on me the fact confess the fault my own he neither could nor durst the guiltless youth ye moan and stars bear witness to the truth his only crime if friendship can offend is too much love to this unhappy friend too late he speaks the sword which fury guides driven with full forth had pierced his tender sides down fell the beauteous youth the yawning wound gushed out a purple stream and stained the ground his snowy neck reclines upon his breast like a fair flower by the keen share oppressed like a white poppy sinking on the plain whose heavy head is overcharged with rain despair and rage and vengeance justly vowed drove nisus headlong on the hostile crowd volsens he seeks on him alone he bends borne back and bored by his surrounding friends onward he pressed and kept him still in sight then whirled aloft his sword with all his might the unerring steel descended while he spoke peered his wide mouth and through his wesson broke dying he slew and staggering on the plain with swimming eyes he sought his lover slain then quiet on his bleeding bosom fell content in death to be revenged so well o oh, happy friends for if my verse can give immortal life your fame shall ever live
fix'd as the capitol's foundation lies, And spread wherever the Roman eagle flies. The conquering party first divide the prey, Then their slain leader to the camp convey. With wonder, as they went, the troops were fill'd to see such numbers whom so few had kill'd. Serranus, Rhamnus, and the rest they found, vast crowds the dying and the dead surround. And the yet reeking blood o'erflows the ground, or knew the helmet which Mesopus lost, but mourned a purchase that so dear had cost. Now rose the ruddy morn from Teton's bed, and with the dawn of day the skies o'erspread. Nor long the sun his daily course withheld, but added colors to the world revealed, when earthly Turnus, wakening with the light, all clad in armor, calls his troops to fight. His martial men with fierce harangue he fired, and his own ardor in their souls inspired. This done to give new terrors to his foes, the heads of Nisus and his friends he shows, raised high on pointed spears a ghastly sight, loud peals of shouts ensue, and barbarous delight. Meantime the Trojans run where danger calls, they line their trenches and they man their walls. In front extended to the left they stood, Safe was the right, surrounded by the flood. But casting from their towers a frightful view, They saw the faces which too well they knew. Though then disguised in death and smeared all over, With filth obscene and dropping putrid gore, Soon hasty fame through the sad city bears The mournful messages to the mother's ears. An icy cold benumbs her limbs, she shakes, her cheeks the blood, her hand the web forsakes. She runs the rampires round amidst the war, nor fears the flying darts, she rends her hair, and fills with loud laments the liquid air. Thus then my loved Euryalus appears, thus looks the prop my declining years. Wast on this face my famished eyes I fed, Oh, how unlike the living is the dead! And couldst thou leave me cruel thus alone, Not one kind kiss from a departing son, No look, no last adieu before he went, An ill-boding hour to slaughter sent, Cold on the ground and pressing foreign clay, To Latian dogs and fowls he lies a prey, nor was I near to close his dying eyes, To wash his wounds, to weep his obsequies, To call about his corpse, his crying friends, Or spread the mantle made for other ends, On his dear body, which I woe with care, Nor did my daily pains or nightly labour spare. Where shall I find his corpse? What earth sustains? His trunk dismembered, and his cold remains. For this, alas, I left my needful ease, Exposed my life to winds and winter seas. If any pity touch Rutulian hearts, Here empty all your quivers, all your darts. Or if they fail, thou, Jove, conclude my woe, And send me thunderstruck to shades below. Her shrieks and clamours pierce the Trojans' ears, Unman their courage and augment their fears. Nor young Ascanius could the sight sustain, Nor old Ilionius his tears restrain. But Actor and Idaeus jointly sent To bear the madding mother to her tent. And now the trumpets terribly from far With rattling clangour rouse the sleepy war. The soldiers' shouts succeed the brazen sounds, And heaven from pole to pole the noise rebounds. The Volscians bear their shields upon their head, And rushing forward form a moving shed. These fill the ditch, those pull the bulwarks down, Some raise the ladders, others scale the town. But where void spaces on the walls appear, Or thin defence, they pour their forces there. With pools and missive weapons from afar, The Trojans keep aloof the rising war. 
Taught by their ten years' siege defensive fight, They roll down ribs of rocks, and unresisted wait, To break the pent house with a pond'rous blow, Would yet the patient Volscians undergo, But could not bear th' unequal combat long. For where the Trojans find the thickest throng, The ruin falls, their shatter'd shields give way, And their crush'd heads become an easy prey. They shrink for fear, abated of their rage, Nor longer dare in a blind fight engage. Contended now to gall them from below, With darts and slings, and with a distant bow. Elsewhere, Mesentius, terrible to view, A blazing pine within the trenches threw. But brave Messapus, Neptune's warlike son, Broke down the palisades the trenches won, And loud for ladders calls to scale the town. Calliope, begin ye sacred nine, Inspire your poet in his high design, To sing what slaughter manly Turnus made, what souls he sent below the Stygian shade, what fame the soldiers with their captain share, and the vast circuit of the fatal war. For you in singing martial facts excel, you best remember and alone can tell. There stood a tower amazing to the sight, built up of beams and of stupendous height. Art and the nature of the place conspired, to furnish all the strength that war required. To level this the bold Italians join, the wary Trojans obviate their design. With weighty stones overwhelm their troops below, shoot through the loopholes and sharp javelins throw. Turnus, the chief, tossed from his thundering hand against the wooden walls a flaming brand. It stuck the fiery plague, the winds were high, the planks were seasoned and the timber dry. Contagion caught the posts it spread along, Scorched and to distance drew the scattered throng. The Trojans fled, the fire pursued amain, Still gathering fast upon the trembling train, Till crowding to the corners of the wall, Down the defence and the defenders fall. The mighty flaw makes heaven itself resound, the dead and dying Trojans strew the ground. The tower that followed on the fallen crew Whelmed over their heads and buried whom it slew. Some stuck upon the darts themselves had sent, All the same equal ruin underwent. Young Lycus and Helenor only escaped, Saved, how they know not, from the steep leap. Helenor, elder of the two by birth, on one side royal, one a son of earth, whom to the Lydian king Lycumnia bare, and sent her boasted bastard to the war, a privilege which none but freemen share. Slight were his arms, a sword and silver shield, no marks of honour charged its empty field. Light as he fell, so light the youth arose, and rising found himself amidst his foes. Nor flight was left, nor hopes to force his way. Emboldened by despair, he stood at bay, And like a stag whom all the troop surrounds, O eager huntsman and invading hounds, Resolved on death, he dissipates his fears, And bounds aloft against the pointed spears. So dares the youth, secure of death and throes, His dying body on his thickest foes. But Lycus, swifter on his feet by far, Runs, doubles, winds, and turns amidst the war, Springs to the walls and leaves his foes behind, And snatches at the beam he first can find, Looks up and leaps aloft at all the stretch, In hopes the helping hand of some kind friend to reach. But Turnus followed hard his hunted prey, His spear had almost reached him in the way, Short of his reins, and scarce a span behind. Fool, said the chief, thou fleeter than the wind. Couldst thou presume to scape when I pursue? He said, and downward by the feet he drew. The trembling dastard at the tug he falls. Vast ruins come along, rent from the smoking walls. Thus on some silver swan or timorous hare, 
Jove's bird comes sousing down from upper air; Her crooked talons truss the fearful prey, Then out of sight she soars, and wings her way. So seizes the grim wolf the tender lamb, In vain lamented by the bleating dam; Then rushing onward, with a barb'rous cry, The troops of Turnus to the combat fly. The ditch with fagots fill'd, the daring foe Toss'd firebrands to the steepy turrets throw. Ilonius, as bold as Lucetius came, To force the gate, and feed the kindling flame, Roll'd down the fragment of a rock so right, It crush'd him double underneath his weight. Two more young, Liger and Asila slow, To bend the bow, young Liger better knew. Asila's best the pointed javelin threw, Brave Caeneus laid Ortygius on the plain. The victor Caeneus was by Turnus slain. By the same hand Clonius and Aetus fall, Sagar and Ida standing on the wall. From Capis arms his fate Privernus found, Hurt by Temilla, first but slight the wound. His shield thrown by, to mitigate the smart, He clapp'd his hand upon the wounded part. The second shaft came swift and unespied, and pierced his hand, and nailed it to his side. Transfixed his breathing lungs and beating heart, the soul came issuing out, and hissed against the dart. The son of Arcans shone amid the rest, in glittering armour and a purple vest. Fair was his face, his eyes inspiring love, bred by his father in the Martian grove. Where the fat altars of Palicus flame, And send in arms to purchase early fame, Him, when he spied from far the Tuscan king, Laid by the lance, and took him to the sling. Thrice whirled the throng around his head, and threw, The heated lead half melted as it flew. It pierced his hollow temples and his brain, The youth came tumbling down, and spurned the plain. Then young Ascanius, who before this day Was wont in woods to shoot the savage prey, First bent in martial strife the twanging bow, And exercised against a human foe. With this bereft Numanus of his life, Who Turnus' younger sister took to wife, Proud of his realm and of his royal bride, Vaunting before his troops and lengthened with a stride, in these insulting terms the Trojans he defied. Twice conquered cowards, now your shame is shown, Cooped up a second time within your town, Who dare not issue forth in open field, But hold your walls before you for a shield. Thus threat you war, thus our alliance force, What gods, what madness, hither steered your course. You shall not find the sons of Atreus here, nor need the frauds of sly Ulysses fear. Strong from the cradle of a sturdy brood, we bear our new-born infants to the flood. There bathed amid the stream, our boys we hold, with winter hardened and inured to cold. They wake before the day to range the wood, kill ere they eat nor taste unconquered food. No sports but what belong to war they know, To break the stubborn colt, to bend the bow. Our youth of labour patient earn their breed, Hardly they work with frugal diet fed. From ploughs and harrows sent to seek renown, They fight in fields and storm the shaken town. No part of life from toils of war is free, No change in age or difference in degree. We plough and till in arms our oxen feel, Instead of goads the spur and pointed steel. The inverted lance makes furrows in the plain, Even time that changes all, yet changes us in vain. The body, not the mind, nor can control, The immortal vigour or abate the soul. Our helms defend the young, disguise the grey, we live by plunder and delight in prey. Your vests embroidered with rich purple shine, In sloth you glory, and in dances join. Your vests have sweeping sleeves with female pride, Your turbans underneath your chins are tied. Go, Phrygians, to your dindymus again, 
go less than women in the shape of men go mixed with eunuchs in the mother's rites where with unequal sound the flute invites sing dance and howl by turns in ida's shade resign the war to men who know the martial trade this foul reproach ascanius could not hear with patience or a vowed revenge forbear at the full stretch of both his hands he drew and almost joined the horns of the tough yew but first before the throne of jove he stood and thus hands invoked the god my first attempt great jupiter succeed an annual offering in thy grove shall bleed a snow-white steer before thy altar led who like his mother bears aloft his head butts with his threatening brows and bellowing stands and dares the fight and spurns the yellow sands joe bowed the heavens and lent a gracious ear and thundered on the left sounded at once the bow and swiftly flies the feathered death and hisses through the skies the steel through both his temples for way extended on the ground numanus lay go now vain boaster and true valour scorn the phrygians twice subdued yet make this third return ascanius said no more the trojans shake the heavens with shouting and new vigour take apollo then bestrode a golden cloud to view the feats of arms and fighting crowd and thus the beardless victor he bespoke aloud advance illustrious youth increase in fame and wide from east gods thyself and rome shall owe to thee a race of demigods below this is the way to heaven the powers divine from this beginning date the julian line to thee to them and their victorious heirs the conquered war is due and the vast world is theirs troy is too narrow for thy name he said and plunging downward shot his radiant head dispelled the breathing air that broke his flight shorn of his beams a man to mortal sight old Bootus form he took anchise squire now left to rule ascanius by his sire his wrinkled visage and his hoary hairs his mien his habit and his arms he wears and thus salutes the boy to forward for his years suffice it thee thy father's worthy son the warlike prize thou hast already won the god of archers gives thy youth a part of his own praise nor envies equal art now tempt the war no more he said and flew obscure in air and vanished from their view the trojans by his arms their patron know and hear the twanging of his heavenly bow then duteous force they use and phoebus name to keep from fight the youth to fond of fame undaunted they themselves no danger shun from wall to wall the shouts and clamours run they bend their bows they whirl their slings around heaps of spent arrows fall and strew the ground and helms and shields and rattling arms resound the combat thickens like the storm that flies from westward when the showery kids arise or pattering hail comes pouring on the main when jupiter descends in hardened rain or bellowing clouds burst with a stormy sound and with an armed winter strew the ground pandrus and Bitias thunderbolts of war whom hiera to bold alcanor bear on ida's top to youth of height and size like firs that on their mother mountain rise presuming on their force the gates unbar and of their own accord invite the war with fates averse against the king's command armed on the right and on the left they stand and flank the passage shining steel they wear and waving crests above their heads appear thus two tall oaks that pardus banks adorn lift up to heaven their leafy heads unshorn and overpressed with nature's heavy load dance to the whistling winds and at each other nod 
inflows a tide of Latians, when they see The gate set open, and the passage free. Bold Quercens, with rash Tamarus rushing on, Equicolus, that in bright armour shone, And Haemon first, but soon repulsed they fly, Or in the well-defended pass they die. These with success are fired, and those with rage, And each on equal terms at length engage. Drawn from their lines, and issuing on the plain, The Trojans hand to hand the fight maintain. Fierce Turnus in another quarter fought, When suddenly the unhoped for news was brought. The foes had left the fastness of their place, Prevailed in fight, and had his men in chase. He quits the attack, and to prevent their fate, Runs where the giant brothers guard the gate. The first he met, Antiphatus the brave, But base begotten on a Theban slave. Sardeon's son he slew, the deadly dart, Found passage through his breast and pierced his heart. Fixed in the wound the Italian cornel stood, Warmed in his lungs and in his vital blood. Aphidnus next and Erymantus dies, and Meropus and the gigantic size of Beatias threatening with his ardent eyes, not by the feeble dart he fell oppressed, a dart were lost within that roomy breast, but from a knotted lance, large, heavy, strong, which roared like thunder as it whirled along. Not two bull hides the impetuous force withhold, nor coat of double mail with scales of gold down sunk the monster bulk and pressed the ground his arms and clattering shield on the vast body sound not with less ruin than the bayan mole raised on the seas the surges to control at once comes tumbling down the rocky wall prone to the deep the stones disjointed fall of the vast pile the scattered ocean flies black sands discoloured froth and mingled mud arise the frighted billows roll and seek the shores, Then trembles Procyta, then Ischia roars. Typhius, thrown beneath by Jove's command, Astonished at the flaw that shakes the land, Soon shifts his weary side, and scarce awake, With wonder feels the weight press lighter on his back. The warrior god the Latian troops inspired, New strung their sinews, and their courage fired, But chills the Trojan hearts with cold affright, Then black despair precipitates their flight. When Pandarus beheld his brother killed, The town with fear and wild confusion filled, He turns the hinges of the heavy gate With both his hands, and adds his shoulders to the weight. Some happier friends within the walls enclosed, the rest shut out to certain death exposed. Fool as he was, and franting in his care, to admit young Turnus and include the war. He thrust amid the crowd, securely bold, like a fierce tiger pent amid the fold. Too late his blazing buckler they descry, and sparkling fires that shoot from either eye his mighty members and his ample breast, his rattling armour and his crimson crest. Far from that hated face the Trojans flee, all but the fool who sought his destiny. Mad Pandarus steps forth with vengeance vowed, for Beatia's death and threatens thus aloud. These are not Ardea's walls, nor his the town. Armata proffers with Lavinia's crown. Tis hostile earth you tread, of hope bereft. No means of safe return by flight are left. To whom with countenance calm and soul sedate, Thus Turnus, then begin and try thy fate. My message to the ghost of Priam bear, Tell him a new Achilles sent thee there. A lance of tough ground ash the Trojan threw, Rough in the rind and knotted as it grew. With his full force he whirled it first around, but the soft yielding air received the wound. Imperial Juno turned the course before, and fixed the wandering weapon in the door. But hope not thou, said Turnus, when I strike, to shun thy fate, our force is not alike. 
nor thy steel temper'd by the lemnian god then rising on his outmost stretch he stood and aim'd from high the full descending blow cleaves the broad front and beardless cheeks in two down sinks the giant with a thundering sound his ponderous limbs oppress the trembling ground blood brains and foam gush from the gaping wound scalp face and shoulders the keen steel divides and the shard visage hangs on equal sides the trojans fly from their approaching fate and had the victor then secured the gate and to his troops without unclosed the bars one lucky day had ended all his wars but boiling youth and blind desire of blood pushed his fury to pursue the crowd hamstring behind unhappy gigas died then phalaris is added to his side the pointed javelins from the dead he drew and their friends arms against their fellows threw strong harley stands in vain weak phlegus flies saturnia still at hand new force and fire supplies then harleus pritanus alcander fall engaged against the foes who scaled the wall but whom they feared without they found within but whom they feared without they found within at last though late by lynceus he was seen he calls new succors and assaults the prince but weak his force and vain is their defence turned to the right his sword the hero drew and at one blow the bold aggressor slew he joins the neck and with a stroke so strong the helm flies off and bears the head along next him the huntsman amicus he killed in darts in venkond and in poison skilled then cleitus fell beneath his fatal spear and cretius whom the muses held so dear he fought with courage and he sung the fight arms were his business versus his delight the trojan chiefs behold with rage and grief their slaughtered friends and hasten their relief bold menestus rallies first the broken train whom brave serestus and his troop sustain to save the living and revenge the dead against one warrior's arms all troy they led o oh, void of sense and courage menestus cried where can you hope your coward heads to hide ah where beyond these rampires can you run one man and in your camp enclosed you shun shall then a single sword such slaughter boast and pass unpunished from a numerous host forsaking honour and renouncing fame your gods your country and your king you shame this just reproach their virtue does excite they stand they join they thicken to the fight now turnus doubts and yet disdains to yield but with slow paces measures back the field and inches to the walls where tiber's tide washing the camp defends the weaker side the more he loses they advance the more and tread in every step he trod before they shout they bear him back and whom by might they cannot conquer they oppress with weight as compassed with a wood of spears around the lordly lion still maintains his ground grins horrible retires and turns again threats his distended paws and shakes his mane he loses while in vain he presses on nor will his courage let him dare to run so turnus fares and unresolved of flight moves tardy back and just recedes from fight yet twice in rage the combat he renews twice breaks and twice his broken foes pursues but now they swarm and with fresh troops supplied come rolling on and rush from every side nor juno who sustained his arms before dares with new strength suffice the exhausted store for joe with sour commands sent iris down to force the invader from the frighted town with labour spent no longer can he wield the heavy fanchion or sustain the shield o'erwhelmed with darts which from afar they fling the weapons round his hollow temples ring 
His golden helm gives way with stony blows, Batter'd and flat, and beaten to his brows. His crest is rash'd away, his ample shield Is falsified, and round with javelins fill'd. The foe now faint, the Trojans overwhelm, And Mnestus lays hard load upon his helm. Six sweet succeeds, he drops at every pore, With driving dust his cheeks are pasted o'er. Shorter and shorter every gasp he takes, And vain efforts and hurtless blows he makes. Plunged in the flood, and may the waters fly, The yell of God the welcome burthen bore and whipped the sweet and washed away the gore then gently wafts him to the farther coast and sends him safe to cheer his anxious host end of book nine of the any eat read by lars rolander book ten part one of the aeneid this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book 10. The Death of Princes. Part 1. The gates of heaven unfold. Jove summons all the gods to counsel in the common hall. Sublimely seated, he surveys from far the fields, the camp, the fortune of the war, and all the inferior world. From first to last the sovereign senate in degrees are placed. Then thus the almighty sire began. Ye gods, natives or denizens of blessed abodes, from whence these murmurs and this change of mind, this backward fate from what was first designed, why this protracted war, when my commands pronounced a peace, and gave the Latian lands? What fear or hope on either part divides our heavens, and arms our powers on different sides? A lawful time of war at length will come, nor need your haste anticipate the doom, when Carthage shall contend the world with Rome, shall force the rigid rocks and alpine chains, and like a flood come pouring on the plains, then is your time for faction and debate, for partial favour and permitted hate. Let now your immature dissension cease. Sit quiet and compose your souls to peace. Thus Jupiter in few unfolds the charge, but lovely Venus thus replies at large. O oh, power immense, eternal energy, for to what else protection can we fly? Seest thou the proud Rutulians, how they dare in fields unpunished and insult my care? How lofty Turnus vaunts amid his train in shining arms triumphant on the plain? Even in their lines and trenches they contend, and scarce their walls the Trojan troops defend. The town is filled with slaughter, and o'erfloats with a red deluge their increasing moats. Aeneas, ignorant and far from thence, has left a camp exposed without defence. This endless outrage shall they still sustain? Shall Troy renewed be forced and fired again? A second siege my banished issue fears, and a new Diomede in arms appears. One more audacious mortal will be found, and I, thy daughter, wait another wound. Yet if with fates averse, without thy leave, the Latian lands my progeny receive, bear they the pains of violated law, and thy protection from their aid withdraw. But if the gods their sure success foretell, if those of heaven consent with those of hell to promise Italy, who dare debate the power of Jove or fix another fate? What should I tell of tempests on the main, of earless usurping Neptune's reign, of Iris sent with Bacchanalian heat to inspire the matrons and destroy the fleet. Now Juno to the Stygian sky descends, solicits hell for aid, and arms the fiends. That new example wanted yet above, an act that well became the wife of Jove. Alecto, raised by her, with rage inflames the peaceful bosoms of the Latian dames. Imperial sway no more exalts my mind. Such hopes I had, indeed, while heaven was kind. 
now let my happier foes possess my place whom jove prefers before the trojan race and conquer they whom you with conquest grace since you can spare from all your wide command no spot of earth no hospitable land which may my wandering fugitives receive since haughty juno will not give you leave then father if i still may use that name by ruined troy yet smoking from the flame i beg you let ascanius by my care be freed from danger and dismiss the war inglorious let him live without a crown the father may be cast on coasts unknown struggling with fate but let me save the son mine is cythera mine the cyprian towers in those recesses and those sacred bowers obscurely let him rest his right resign to promised empire and his julian line then carthage may the ausonian towns destroy nor fear the race of a rejected boy what profits it my son to scape the fire armed with his gods and loaded with his sire to pass the perils of the seas and wind evade the greeks and leave the war behind to reach the italian shores if after all our second pergamus is doomed to fall much better had he curbed his high desires and hovered o'er his ill-extinguished fires to simois banks the fugitives restore and give them back to war and all the woes before deep indignation swelled saturnia's heart and must i own she said my secret smart what with more decence were in silence kept and but for this unjust reproach had slept did god or man your favourite son advise with war unhoped the latians to surprise by fate you boast and by the god's decree he left his native land for italy confess the truth by mad cassandra more than heaven inspired he sought a foreign shore did i persuade to trust his second troy to the raw conduct of a beardless boy with walls unfinished which himself forsakes and through the waves a wandering voyage takes when have i urged him meanly to demand the tuscan aid and arm a quiet land did i or iris give this mad advice or made the fool himself the fatal choice you think it hard the latians should destroy with swords your trojans and with fires your troy hard and unjust indeed for men to draw their native air nor take a foreign law that turnus is permitted still to live to whom his birth a god and goddess give but yet is just and lawful for your line to drive their fields and force with fraud to join realms not your own among your clans divide and from the bridegroom tear the promised bride petition while you public arms prepare pretend a peace and yet provoke a war twas given to you your darling son to shroud to draw the dastard from the fighting crowd and for a man obtained an empty cloud from flaming fleets you turned the fire away and changed the ships to daughters of the sea but is my crime the queen of heaven offends if she presume to save her suffering friends your son not knowing what his foes decree you say is absent absent let him be yours is cythera yours the cyprian towers the soft recesses and the sacred bowers why do you then these needless arms prepare and thus provoke a people prone to war did i with fire the trojan town deface or hinder from return your exiled race was i the cause of mischief or the man whose lawless lust the fatal war began think on whose faith the adulterous youth relied who promised who procured the spartan bride when all the united states of greece combined to purge the world of the perfidious kind then was your time to fear the trojan fate your quarrels and complaints are now too late thus juno murmurs rise with mixed applause just as they favour or dislike the cause so winds when yet unfledged in woods they lie in whispers first their tender voices try 
then issue on the main with bellowing rage and storms to trembling mariners presage then thus to both replied the imperial god who shakes heaven's axles with his awful nod when he begins the silent senate stand with reverence listening to the dread command the clouds dispel the winds their breath restrain and the hushed waves lie flatted on the main celestials your attentive ears incline since said the god the trojans must not join in wished alliance with the latin line since endless jarrings and immortal hate tend but to discompose our happy state the war henceforward be resigned to fate each to his proper fortune stand or fall equal and unconcerned i look on all Rutulians, Trojans are the same to me, and both shall draw the lots their fates decree. Let these assault, if fortune be their friend, and if she favours those, let those defend. The fates will find their way. The thunderer said, and shook the sacred honours of his head, attesting Styx, the inviolable flood, and the black regions of his brother God. Trembled the poles of heaven, and earth confessed the nod. This end the sessions had. The Senate rise, and to his palace wait their sovereign through the skies. Meantime, intent upon their siege, the foes within their walls the Trojan host enclose. They wound, they kill, they watch at every gate, renew the fires and urge their happy fate. The Aeneans wish in vain their wanted chief, hopeless of flight, more hopeless of relief. Thin on the towers they stand, and even those few, a feeble, fainting, and dejected crew. Yet in the face of danger some there stood, the two bold brothers of Sarpedon's blood, Asius and Acmon, both the Asarakai, young Hemon, and though young resolved to die. With these were Clarus and Thymoites joined, Tibris and Castor, both of Lycian kind, from Acmon's hands a rolling stone there came, so large it half deserved a mountain's name. Strong sinewed was the youth, and big of bone. His brother Nestus could not more have done, or the great father of the intrepid son. Some firebrands throw, some flights of arrows send, and some with darts, and some with stones defend. Amid the press appears the beauteous boy, the care of Venus, and the hope of Troy. His lovely face unarmed, his head was bare, In ringlets o'er his shoulders hung his hair. His forehead circled with a diadem, Distinguished from the crowd, he shines a gem Enchased in gold, or polished ivory set, Amidst the meaner foil of sable jet. Nor Ismarus was wanting to the war, Directing pointed arrows from afar, And death with poison armed, In Lydia born, where plenteous harvests The fat fields adorn where proud Pactolus floats the fruitful lands, and leaves a rich manure of golden sands. There Capis, author of the Capuan name, and there was Mnestheus, too, increased in fame since Turnus from the camp he cast with shame. Thus mortal war was waged on either side. Meantime the hero cut the nightly tide, for, anxious from Evander when he went, he sought the Tyrrhene camp and Tarchon's tent. Exposed the cause of coming to the chief, his name and country told, and asked relief, proposed the terms, his own small strength declared, what vengeance proud Mesentius had prepared, what Turnus bold and violent designed, then showed the slippery state of humankind and fickle fortune, warned him to beware, and to his wholesome counsel added prayer. Tarchon without delay the treaty signs, and to the Trojan troops the Tuscan joins. They soon set sail, nor now the fates withstand, their forces trusted with a foreign hand. Aeneas leads, upon his stern appear two lions carved, which rising Ida bear, Ida to wandering Trojans ever dear. Under their grateful shade Aeneas sat, revolving war's events and various fate. His left young Pallas kept, fixed to his side, And oft of winds inquired, and of the tide, Oft of the stars, and of their watery way, And what he suffered both by land and sea. Now, sacred sisters, open all your spring, 
the Tuscan leaders and their army sing, which followed great Aeneas to the war. Their arms, their numbers, and their names declare. A thousand youths brave Massicus obey, born in the tiger through the foaming sea, from Asium brought, and Cosa by his care. For arms, light quivers, bows, and shafts they bear. Fierce Abbas next, his men bright armour wore, his stern Apollo's golden statue bore. Six hundred Populonia sent along, all skilled in martial exercise and strong. Three hundred more for battle Ilva joins, an isle renowned for steel and unexhausted mines. As Silas on his prow the third appears, who heaven interprets and the wandering stars, from offered entrails prodigies expounds, and peals of thunder with presaging sounds, a thousand spears in warlike order stand, sent by the Pisans under his command. Fair Astur follows in the watery field, proud of his managed horse and painted shield. Gravisca, noisome from the neighbouring fen, and his own Caere sent three hundred men, with those which Minio's fields and Pergi gave, all bred in arms, unanimous and brave. Thou, muse, the name of Siniras renew, And brave Cupavo, followed but by few, Whose helm confessed the lineage of the man, And bore with wings displayed a silver swan. Love was the fault of his famed ancestry, Whose forms and fortunes in his ensigns fly. For Cycnus loved unhappy Phaeton, And sung his loss in poplar groves alone, Beneath the sister shades to soothe his grief. Heaven heard his song and hastened his relief, And changed to snowy plumes his hoary hair, And winged his flight to chant aloft in air. His son Cupavo brushed the briny flood, Upon his stern a brawny centaur stood, Who heaved a rock, and threatening still to throw, With lifted hands alarmed the seas below. They seemed to fear the formidable sight, And rolled their billows on to speed his flight. Ocnus was next, who led his native train Of hardy warriors through the watery plain, The son of Manto by the Tuscan stream, From whence the Mantuan town derives the name, An ancient city but of mixed descent, Three several tribes compose the government, Four towns are under each, but all obey The Mantuan laws and own the Tuscan sway. Hate to Mezentius armed five hundred more, Whom Mincius from his sire Benacus bore. Mincius with wreaths of reeds his forehead covered o'er. These grave Auletes leads, a hundred sweep With stretching oars at once the glassy deep. Him and his martial train the triton bears, High on his poop the sea-green god appears, Frowning he seems his crooked shell to sound, And at the blast the billows dance around. A hairy man above the waist he shows, A porpoise tail beneath his belly grows, And ends a fish. His breast the waves divides, And froth and foam augment the murmuring tides. Full thirty ships transport the chosen train For Troy's relief, and scour the briny main. Now was the world forsaken by the sun, And Phoebe half her nightly race had run, the careful chief, who never closed his eyes, Himself the rudder holds, the sails supplies. A choir of Nereids met him on the flood, Once his own galleys, hewn from Ida's wood, But now, as many nymphs, the sea they sweep, As rode before tall vessels on the deep. They know him from afar, and in a ring Enclose the ship that bore the Trojan king. Chimodice, whose voice excelled the rest, Above the waves advanced her snowy breast. Her right hand stops the stern, Her left divides the curling ocean And corrects the tides. She spoke for all the choir, And thus began with pleasing words To warn the unknowing man. Sleeps our loved lord? O oh, goddess-born, awake! Spread every sail, pursue your watery track, And haste your course. Your navy once were we, from Ida's height descending to the sea, till Turnus, as at anchor fixed we stood, presumed to violate our holy wood. Then, loosed from shore, we fled his fires profane, unwillingly we broke our master's chain. 
and since have sought you through the Tuscan main. The mighty mother changed our forms to these, and gave us life immortal in the seas. But young Ascanius in his camp distressed by your insulting foes is hardly pressed. The Arcadian horsemen and Etrurian host advance in order on the Latian coast. To cut their way the Dornian chief designs before their troops can reach the Trojan lines. Thou, when the rosy morn restores the light, first arm thy soldiers for the ensuing fight. Thyself the fated sword of Vulcan wield, and bear aloft the impenetrable shield. Tomorrow's sun, unless my skill be vain, shall see huge heaps of foes in battle slain. Parting she spoke, and with immortal force pushed on the vessel in her watery course, for well she knew the way. Impelled behind, the ship flew forward and outstripped the wind. The rest make up. Unknowing of the cause, the chief admires their speed, and happy omens draws. Then thus he prayed, and fixed on heaven his eyes. Hear thou, great mother of the deities, with turrets crowned, on Ida's holy hill fierce tigers, reined and curved, obey thy will. Firm thy own omens, lead us on to fight, and let thy Phrygians conquer in thy right. He said no more and now renewing day had chased the shadows of the night away. He charged the soldiers with preventing care their flags to follow and their arms prepare, warned of the ensuing fight, and bade them hope the war. Now his lofty poop he viewed below his camp encompassed and the enclosing foe. His blazing shield embraced he held on high, the camp received the sign and with loud shouts reply. Hope arms their courage. From their towers they throw their darts with double force and drive the foe. Thus, at the signal given, the cranes arise before the stormy south and blacken all the skies. King Turnus wondered at the fight renewed, till, looking back, the Trojan fleet he viewed. The seas with swelling canvas covered o'er, and the swift ships descending on the shore. The Latians saw from far with dazzled eyes the radiant crest that seemed in flames to rise, and dart diffusive fires around the field, and the keen glittering of the golden shield. Thus threatening comets, when by night they rise, shoot sanguine streams, and sadden all the skies. So Sirius flashing forth sinister lights, pale humankind with plagues and with dry famine fright. Yet Turnus, with undaunted mind, is bent to man the shores and hinder their descent, and thus awakes the courage of his friends. What you so long have wished, kind fortune sends, in ardent arms to meet the invading foe, you find, and find him at advantage now. Yours is the day, you need but only dare, your swords will make you masters of the war. Your sires, your sons, your houses and your lands, and dearest wives, are all within your hands. Be mindful of the race from whence you came, and emulate in arms your father's fame. Now take the time, while staggering yet they stand, with feet unfirm, and prepossess the strand. Fortune befriends the bold. No more he said, but balanced whom to leave and whom to lead. Then these elects, the landing to prevent, and those he leaves to keep the city pent. Meantime the Trojan sends his troops ashore, some are by boats exposed, by bridges more. With labouring oars they bear along the strand, where the tide languishes, and leap a land. Tarkon observes the coast with careful eyes, and where no fort he finds, no water fries, nor billows with unequal murmurs roar, but smoothly slide along and swell the shore. That course he steered, and thus he gave command. Here ply your oars, and at all hazard land, force on the vessel that her keel may wound this hated soil, and furrow hostile ground. Let me securely land, I ask no more, then sink my ships, or shatter on the shore. This fiery speech inflames his fearful friends. They tug at every oar, and every stretcher bends. They run their ships aground, the vessels knock, thus forced ashore, and tremble with the shock. Tarkon's alone was lost, that stranded stood, stuck on a bank and beaten by the flood. She breaks her back, 
the loosened sides give way, and plunge the Tuscan soldiers in the sea. Their broken oars and floating planks withstand their passage while they labour to the land, and ebbing tides bear back upon the uncertain sand. Now Turnus leads his troops without delay, advancing to the margin of the sea. The trumpets sound. Aeneas first assailed the clowns new raised and raw, and soon prevailed. Great Theron fell, an omen of the fight. Great Theron, large of limbs, of giant height. He first in open field defied the prince, but armour scaled with gold was no defence against the fated sword, which opened wide his plated shield, and pierced his naked side. Next Lycas fell, who, not like others born, was from his wretched mother ripped and torn, sacred, O Phoebus, from his birth to thee, for his beginning life from biting steel was free. Not far from him was Gaius laid along, of monstrous bulk, with Kisseus fierce and strong, vain bulk and strength. For when the chief assailed, nor valour nor Herculean arms availed, nor their famed father wont in war to go with great Alcides when he toiled below. The noisy Pharos next received his death. Aeneas writhed his dart and stopped his bawling breath. Then wretched Sidon had received his doom, who courted Clytius in his beardless bloom, and sought with lust obscene polluted joys, the Trojan sword had cured his love of boys, had not his seven bold brethren stopped the course of the fierce champions with united force. Seven darts were thrown at once, and some rebound from his bright shield, some on his helmet sound. The rest had reached him, but his mother's care prevented those, and turned aside in air. The prince then called Achates to supply the spears that knew the way to victory, those fatal weapons which inured to blood in Grecian bodies under Ilium stood. Not one of those my hand shall toss in vain against our foes on this contended plain, he said, then seized a mighty spear and threw, which, winged with fate, through Myon's buckler flew, pierced all the brazen plates and reached his heart. He staggered with intolerable smart. Alcanor saw, and reached, but reached in vain, his helping hand, his brother to sustain, a second spear which kept the former course from the same hand, and sent with equal force his right arm pierced, and, holding on, bereft his use of both, and pinioned down his left. Then Numitor from his dead brother drew the ill-omened spear, and at the Trojan threw. Preventing fate direct the lance away, which, glancing, only marked Achates' thigh. In pride of youth the Sabine Clausus came, and from afar at Dryops took his aim. The spear flew hissing through the middle space, and pierced his throat, directed at his face. It stopped at once the passage of his wind, and the free soul to flitting air resigned. His forehead was the first that struck the ground. Life-blood and life rushed mingled through the wound. He slew three brothers of the Borean race, and three whom Ismarus, their native place, had sent to war, but all the sons of Thrace. Helesus next the bold Aurunki leads. The son of Neptune to his aid succeeds, conspicuous on his horse. On either hand these fight to keep, and those to win, the land. With mutual blood the Arsonian soil is dyed while on its borders each their claim decide, as wintry winds contending in the sky with equal force of lungs their titles try. They rage, they roar, the doubtful rack of heaven stands without motion, and the tide undriven, each bent to conquer, neither side to yield. They long suspend the fortune of the field. Both armies thus perform what courage can, foot set to foot, and mingled man to man. But in another part the Arcadian horse with ill success engaged the Latin force, for where the impetuous torrent rushing down huge craggy stones and rooted trees had thrown, they left their courses, and unused to fight on foot were scattered in a shameful flight. 
Pallas, who with disdain and grief had viewed his foes pursuing, and his friends pursued, used threatenings mixed with prayers his last resource, with these to move their minds, and those to fire their force. Which way, companions? Whither would you run? By you yourselves and mighty battles won, by my great sire, by his established name, and early promise of my future fame, by my youth, emulous of equal right to share his honours, shun ignoble flight. Trust not your feet, your hands must hew way through yon black body and that thick array. Tis through that forward path that we must come, there lies our way and that our passage home. Nor powers above nor destinies below oppress our arms. With equal strength we go, with mortal hands to meet a mortal foe. See on what foot we stand. A scanty shore, the sea behind, our enemies before. No passage left unless we swim the main, or forcing these the Trojan trenches gain. This said, he strode with eager haste along and bore amidst the thickest of the throng. Largus, the first he met with fate to foe, had heaved a stone of mighty weight to throw. Stooping, the spear descended on his chine just where the bone distinguished either loin. It stuck so fast, so deeply buried lay, that scarce the victor forced the steel away. His bond came on, but while he moved too slow to wish to revenge, the prince prevents his blow, for, warding his at once, at once he pressed and plunged the fatal weapon in his breast. Then lewd and chemilus he laid in dust, who stained his stepdam's bed with impious lust, and after him the Daucian twins were slain, Laris and Thimbrus, on the Latian plain, so wondrous like in feature, shape, and size as caused an error in their parents' eyes, grateful mistake. But soon the sword decides the nice distinction, and their fate divides, for Thimbrus' head was lopped, and Laris' hand, dismembered, sought its owner on the strand. The trembling fingers yet the Phocian strain, and threaten still the intended stroke in vain. Now, to renew the charge, the Arcadians came. Sight of such acts, and sense of honest shame, and grief with anger mixed, their minds in flame. Then with a casual blow was Roetius slain, who chanced, as Pallas threw, to cross the plain. The flying spear was after Ilus sent, but Roetius happened on a death unmeant. From Toithras and from Tyres, while he fled, the lance athwart his body laid him dead. Rolled from his chariot with a mortal wound, and intercepted fate, he spurned the ground, as when in summer welcome winds arise, the watchful shepherd to the forest flies and fires the midmost plants. Contagion spreads, and catching flames infect the neighbouring heads. Around the forest flies the furious blast, and all the leafy nation sinks at last, and Vulcan rides in triumph o'er the waste. The pastor, pleased with his dire victory, beholds the satiate flames in sheets ascend the sky. So palace troops their scattered strength unite, and pouring on their foes their prince delight. Halesus came, fierce with desire of blood, but first collected in his arms he stood, Advancing then, he plied the spear so well, Ladon, Demodocus, and Ferries fell. Around his head he tossed his glittering brand, And from Strymonius hewed his better hand, Held up to guard his throat, Then hurled a stone at Toas' ample front, And pierced the bone. It struck beneath the space of either eye, And blood and mingled brains together fly. Deep skilled in future fates, Halesus' sire did with the youth to lonely groves retire. But when the father's mortal race was run, dire destiny laid hold upon the son, and hauled him to the war, to find, beneath the Evandrian spear, a memorable death. Pallas the encounter seeks, but ere he throws, to Tuscan Tiber thus addressed his vows. O oh, sacred stream, direct my flying dart, and give to pass the proud Halesus' heart. His arms and spoils thy holy oak shall bear. Pleased with the bribe, the god received his prayer, for while his shield protects a friend distressed, 
the dart came driving on and pierced his breast. But Lausus, no small portion of the war, permits not panic fear to reign too far, caused by the death of so renowned a knight, but by his own example cheers the fight. Fierce Abbas first he slew, Abbas, the stay of Trojan hopes and hindrance of the day. The Phrygian troops escaped the Greeks in vain, they and their mixed allies now load the plain. To the rude shock of war both armies came, their leaders equal and their strength the same. The rear so pressed the front they could not wield their angry weapons to dispute the field. Here Pallas urges on, and Lausus there, of equal youth and beauty both appear, but both by fate forbid to breathe their native air. Their congress in the field great Jove withstands, both doomed to fall, but fall by greater hands. End of Book Ten, Part One Book Ten, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book Ten. The Death of Princes. Part Two. Meantime, Juturna warns the Daunian chief of Lausus' danger, urging swift relief. With his driven chariot he divides the crowd, and, making to his friend, thus calls aloud, Let none presume his needless aid to join. Retire and clear the field. The fight is mine. To this right hand is Pallas only due. Oh, were his father here my just revenge to view. From the forbidden space his men retired. Pallas their awe and his stern words admired, surveyed him o'er and o'er with wondering sight, struck with his haughty mien and towering height. Then to the king, your empty vaunts forbear, success I hope and fate I cannot fear. Alive or dead I shall deserve a name, Jove is impartial and to both the same. He said, and to the void advanced his pace, pale horror sat on each Arcadian face. Then Turnus, from his chariot leaping light, addressed himself on foot to single fight, and as a lion, when he spies from far a bull that seems to meditate the war, bending his neck and spurning back the sand, runs roaring downward from his hilly stand, imagine eager Turnus, not more slow, to rush from high on his unequal foe. Young Pallas, when he saw the chief advance within due distance of his flying lance, prepares to charge him first, resolved to try if fortune would his want of force supply, and thus to heaven and Hercules addressed. Alcides, once on earth Evander's guest, his son adjures you by those holy rites, that hospitable board, those genial knights, assist my great attempt to gain this prize, and let proud Turnus view with dying eyes his ravished spoils. "'Twas heard the vain request. "'Alcides mourned and stifled sighs within his breast. "'Then Jove, to soothe his sorrow, thus began. "'Short bounds of life are set to mortal man. "'Tis virtue's work alone to stretch the narrow span. "'So many sons of gods in bloody fight "'around the walls of Troy have lost the light. "'My own Sarpedon fell beneath his foe, nor I, his mighty sire, could ward the blow. Even Turnus shortly shall resign his breath, and stands already on the verge of death. This said, the god permits the fatal fight, but from the Latian fields averts his sight. Now with full force his spear young Pallas threw, and having thrown, his shining fortune drew. The steel just grazed along the shoulder joint and marked it slightly with the glancing point. Fierce Turnus first to nearer distance drew and poised his pointed spear before he threw. Then, as the winged weapon whizzed along, See now, said he, whose arm is better strung. 
the spear kept on the fatal course unstayed by plates of iron which o'er the shield were laid through folded brass and tough bull hides it passed his corslet pierced and reached his heart at last in vain the youth tugs at the broken wood the soul comes issuing with the vital blood he falls his arms upon his body sound and with his bloody teeth he bites the ground turnus bestrode the corpse arcadians hear said he my message to your master bear such as the sire deserved the son i send it costs him dear to be the phrygian's friend the lifeless body tell him i bestow unasked to rest his wandering ghost below he said and trampled down with all the force of his left foot and spurned the wretched course then snatched the shining belt with gold inlaid the belt eurytian's artful hands had made where fifty fatal brides expressed to sight all in the compass of one mournful night deprived their bridegrooms of returning light in an ill hour insulting turnus tore those golden spoils and in a worse he wore o oh, mortals blind in fate who never know to bear high fortune or endure the low the time shall come when turnus but in vain shall wish untouched the trophies of the slain shall wish the fatal belt were far away and curse the dire remembrance of the day the sad arcadians from the unhappy field bear back the breathless body on a shield O oh, grace and grief of war, at once restored with praises to thy sire, at once deplored. One day first sent thee to the fighting field, beheld whole heaps of foes in battle killed. One day beheld thee dead, and borne upon thy shield. This dismal news not from uncertain fame, but sad spectators to the hero came. His friends upon the brink of ruin stand, unless relieved by his victorious hand. He whirls his sword around without delay, and hews through adverse foes an ample way to find fierce Turnus of his conquest proud. Evander, Pallas, all that friendship owed to large deserts are present to his eyes, his plighted hand and hospitable ties. Four sons of Sulmo, four whom Ufens bred, he took in fight, and living victims led to please the ghost of Pallas, and expire in sacrifice before his funeral fire. At Magus next he threw, he stooped below the flying spear, and shunned the promised blow. Then, creeping, clasped the hero's knees, and prayed, By young Iulus, by thy father's shade, oh, spare my life! and send me back to see my longing sire and tender progeny. A lofty house I have, and wealth untold, in silver ingots and in bars of gold. All these, and sums besides which see no day, the ransom of this one poor life shall pay. If I survive, will Troy the less prevail? A single soul's too light to turn the scale. He said. The hero sternly thus replied, Thy bars and ingots, and the sums beside, leave for thy children's lot. Thy Turnus broke all rules of war by one relentless stroke when Pallas fell. So deems, nor deems alone, my father's shadow, but my living son. Thus having said, of kind remorse bereft, he seized his helm and dragged him with his left, then with his right hand, while his neck he wreathed, up to the hilts his shining fortune sheathed. Apollo's priest, Emonides, was near, his holy fillets on his front appear, glittering in arms he shone amidst the crowd, much of his god, more of his purple proud. Him the fierce Trojan followed through the field, the holy coward fell and forced to yield, the prince stood o'er the priest, and at one blow sent him an offering to the shades below. His arms, Serestus on his shoulders bears, designed a trophy to the god of wars. Vulcanian Caeculus renews the fight, and Umbro, born upon the mountain's height. 
the champion cheers his troops to encounter those and seeks revenge himself on other foes at anxia's shield he drove and at the blow both shield and arm to ground together go anxia had boasted much of magic charms and thought he wore impenetrable arms so made by muttered spells and from the spheres had life secured in vain for length of years then tarquitus the field in triumph trod a nymph his mother his sire a god exulting in bright arms he braves the prince with his protended lance he makes defence bears back his feeble foe then pressing on arrests his better hand and drags him down stands o'er the prostrate wretch and as he lay vain tales inventing and prepared to pray mows off his head the trunk a moment stood then sunk and rolled along the sand in blood the vengeful victor thus upbraids the slain lie there proud man unpitied on the plain lie there inglorious and without a tomb far from thy mother and thy native home exposed to savage beasts and birds of prey or thrown for food to monsters of the sea on lycus and antaeus next he ran two chiefs of turnus and who led his van they fled for fear with these he chased along camers the yellow locked and numa strong both great in arms and both were fair and young camers was son to volscens lately slain in wealth surpassing all the latian train and in amycla fixed his silent easy reign and as aegean when with heaven he strove stood opposite in arms to mighty jove moved all his hundred hands provoked the war defied the forky lightning from afar at fifty mouths his flaming breath expires and flash for flash returns and fires for fires in his right hand as many swords he wields and takes the thunder on as many shields with strength like his the trojan hero stood and soon the fields with falling corpse were strowed when once his fortune found the taste of blood with fury scarce to be conceived he flew against nepheus whom four coursers drew they when they see the fiery chief advance and pushing at their chests his pointed lance wheeled with so swift a motion mad with fear they threw their master headlong from the chair they stare they start nor stop their course before they bear the bounding chariot to the shore now lucagus and liger scour the plains with two white steeds but liger holds the reins and lucagus the lofty seat maintains bold brethren both the former waved in air his flaming sword aeneas couched his spear unused to threats and more unused to fear then liger thus thy confidence is vain to scape from hence as from the trojan plain nor these the steeds which diomede bestrode nor this the chariot where achilles rode nor venus vale is here near neptune's shield thy fatal hour is come and this the field thus liger vainly vaunts the trojan peer returned his answer with his flying spear as lucagus to lash his horses bends prone to the wheels and his left foot protends prepared for fight the fatal dart arrives and through the borders of his buckler drives passed through and pierced his groin the deadly wound cast from his chariot rolled him on the ground whom thus the chief upbraids with scornful spite blame not the slowness of your steeds in flight vain shadows did not force their swift retreat but you yourself forsake your empty seat he said and seized at once the loosened rein for liger lay already on the plain by the same shock then stretching out his hands the recreant thus his wretched life demands now by thyself o more than mortal man by her and him from whom thy breath began who formed thee thus divine i beg thee spare this forfeit life and hear thy suppliant's prayer thus much he spoke and more he would have said but the stern hero turned aside his head and cut him short i hear another man you talked not thus before the fight began 
Now take your turn, and as a brother should, Attend your brother to the Stygian flood. Then through his breast his fatal sword he sent, And the soul issued at the gaping vent. As storms the skies and torrents tear the ground, Thus raged the prince, and scattered deaths around. At length Ascanius and the Trojan train Broke from the camp so long besieged in vain. Meantime the king of gods and mortal man Held conference with his queen, and thus began. My sister goddess and well-pleasing wife, Still think you Venus' aid supports the strife? Sustains her Trojans, or themselves alone With inborn valour force their fortune on. How fierce in fight with courage undecayed! Judge if such warriors want immortal aid. To whom the goddess with the charming eyes, Soft in her tone, submissively replies, Why, O oh my sovereign lord, whose frown I fear, And cannot unconcerned your anger bear, why urge you thus my grief? When, if I still, as once I was, Were mistress of your will, From your almighty power your pleasing wife Might gain the grace of lengthening Turner's life, Securely snatch him from the fatal fight, And give him to his aged father's sight. Now let him perish, since you hold it good, And glut the Trojans with his pious blood, Yet from our lineage he derives his name, And in the fourth degree from God Pilumnus came. Yet he devoutly pays you rites divine, And offers daily incense at your shrine. Then shortly thus the sovereign God replied, Since in my power and goodness you confide, If for a little space, a lengthened span, You beg reprieve for this expiring man, I grant you leave to take your turnus hence from instant fate, and can so far dispense. But if some secret meaning lies beneath to save the short-lived youth from destined death, or if a father thought you entertain to change the fates, you feed your hopes in vain. To whom the goddess thus with weeping eyes, And what if that request your tongue denies, your heart should grant, and not a short reprieve, but length of certain life to Turnus give. Now speedy death attends the guiltless youth, if my presaging soul divines with truth, which, oh, I wish might err through causeless fears, and you, for you have power, prolong his years. Thus having said, involved in clouds, she flies, and drives a storm before her through the skies, Swift she descends, alighting on the plain, Where the fierce foes a dubious fight maintain. Of air condensed a spectre soon she made, And what Aeneas was, such seemed the shade. Adorned with Dardan arms, the phantom bore His head aloft, a plumy crest he wore. This hand appeared a shining sword to wield, And that sustained an imitated shield. With manly mien he stalked along the ground, Nor wanted voice belied, nor vaunting sound. Thus haunting ghosts appear to waking sight, Or dreadful visions in our dreams by night. The spectre seems the Daunian chief to dare, And flourishes his empty sword in air. At this advancing, Turnus hurled his spear, The phantom wheeled and seemed to fly for fear. Deluded Turnus thought the Trojan fled, and with vain hopes his haughty fancy fed. Whither, O coward, thus he calls aloud, nor found he spoke to wind and chased a cloud. Why thus forsake your bride? Receive from me the fated land you sought so long by sea, he said, and brandishing at once his blade, with eager pace pursued the flying shade. By chance a ship was fastened to the shore, which from old Clusium King Osinius bore. The plank was ready laid for safe ascent, for shelter there the trembling shadow bent, and skipped and skulked and under hatches went. Exulting Turnus with regardless haste ascends the plank and to the galley passed. Scarce had he reached the prow, Saturnia's hand the halsers cuts and shoots the ship from land. 
with wind in poop the vessel ploughs the sea and measures back with speed her former way meantime aeneas seeks his absent foe and sends his slaughtered troops to shades below the guileful phantom now forsook the shroud and flew sublime and vanished in a cloud too late young turnus the delusion found far on the sea still making from the ground then thankless for a life redeemed by shame with sense of honour stung and forfeit fame fearful besides of what in fight had passed his hands and haggard eyes to heaven he cast o jove he cried for what offence have i deserved to bear this endless infamy whence am i forced and whither am i born how and with what reproach shall i return shall ever i behold the latian plain or see laurentum's lofty towers again what will they say of their deserting chief the war was mine i fly from their relief i led to slaughter and in slaughter leave and even from hence their dying groans receive here overmatched in fight in heaps they lie there scattered o'er the fields ignobly fly gape wide o earth and draw me down alive or o ye pitying winds a wretch relieve on sands or shelves the splitting vessel drive or set me shipwrecked on some desert shore where no rutulian eyes may see me more unknown to friends or foes or conscious fame lest she should follow and my flight proclaim thus turnus raved and various fates revolved the choice was doubtful but the death resolved and now the sword and now the sea took place that to revenge and this to purge disgrace sometimes he thought to swim the stormy main by stretch of arms the distant shore to gain thrice he the sword essayed and thrice the flood but juno moved with pity both withstood and thrice repressed his rage strong gales supplied and pushed the vessel o'er the swelling tide at length she lands him on his native shores and to his father's longing arms restores meantime by jove's impulse mesentius armed succeeding turnus with his ardour warmed his fainting friends reproached their shameful flight repelled the victors and renewed the fight against their king the tuscan troops conspire such is their hate and such their fierce desire of wished revenge on him and him alone all hands employed and all their darts are thrown he like a solid rock by seas enclosed to raging winds and roaring waves opposed from his proud summit looking down disdains their empty menace and unmoved remains beneath his feet fell haughty hebrus dead then latagus and palmus as he fled at latagus a weighty stone he flung his face was flatted and his helmet wrung but palmus from behind receives his wound hamstringed he falls and grovels on the ground his crest and armour from his body torn thy shoulders lausus and thy head adorn avas and mimas both of troy he slew mimas his birth from fair teano drew born on that fatal night when big with fire the queen produced young paris to his sire but paris in the phrygian fields was slain unthinking mimas on the latian plain and as a savage boar on mountains bred with forest mast and fattening marshes fed when once he sees himself in toils enclosed by huntsmen and their eager hounds opposed he wets his tusks and turns and dares the war the invaders dart their javelins from afar all keep aloof and safely shout around but none presumes to give a nearer wound he frets and froths erects his bristled hide and shakes a grove of lances from his side not otherwise the troops with hate inspired and just revenge against the tyrant fired their darts with clamour at a distance drive and only keep the languished war alive from coritus came acron to the fight who left his spouse betrothed and unconsummate night mesentius sees him through the squadron's ride proud of the purple favours of his bride then 
as a hungry lion who beholds a gamesome goat who frisks about the folds, or beamy stag that grazes on the plain. He runs, he roars, he shakes his rising mane, he grins and opens wide his greedy jaws, the prey lies panting underneath his paws. He fills his famished maw, his mouth runs o'er with unchewed morsels while he churns the gore. So proud Mezentius rushes on his foes, and first unhappy Acron overthrows. Stretched at his length he spurns the swarthy ground. The lance, besmeared with blood, lies broken in the wound. Then with disdain the haughty victor viewed Orodes flying, nor the wretch pursued, nor thought the dastard's back deserved a wound, but running, gained the advantage of the ground, then turning short, he met him face to face, to give his victory the better grace. Orodes falls, in equal fight oppressed. Mezentius fixed his foot upon his breast, and rested lance, and thus aloud he cries, Lo, here the champion of my rebels lies. The fields around with Io Paean ring, and peals of shouts applaud the conquering king. At this the vanquished with his dying breath thus faintly spoke, and prophesied in death. Nor thou, proud man, unpunished shalt remain, like death attends thee on this fatal plain. Then, sourly smiling, thus the king replied, For what belongs to me let Jove provide, But die thou first, whatever chance ensue, He said, and from the wound the weapon drew. A hovering mist came swimming o'er his sight, And sealed his eyes in everlasting night. By Caedicus Alcathous was slain, Sacrator laid Hidaspes on the plain, Orses the strong to greater strength must yield, He, with Parthenius, were by Rapo killed. Then brave Messapus Erechites slew, Who from Lycaon's blood his lineage drew. But from his headstrong horse his fate he found, Who threw his master as he made a bound, The chief alighting struck him to the ground. Then Clonius hand to hand on foot assails, the Trojan sinks, and Neptune's son prevails. Argus the Lycian, stepping forth with pride, To single fight the boldest foe defied, Whom Tuscan Valerus by force o'ercame, And not belied his mighty father's fame. Salius to death the great Antronius sent, But the same fate the victor underwent, Slain by Nealce's hand, well skilled to throw the flying dart, and draw the far-deceiving bow. Thus equal deaths are dealt with equal chance. By turns they quit their ground, by turns advance, victors and vanquished in the various field, nor wholly overcome, nor wholly yield. The gods from heaven survey the fatal strife, and mourn the miseries of human life. Above the rest two goddesses appear, concerned for each, here Venus, Juno there. Amidst the crowd infernal Arte shakes her scourge aloft, and crest of hissing snakes. Once more the proud Mezentius with disdain brandished his spear and rushed into the plain, where, towering in the midmost rank, he stood, like tall Orion stalking o'er the flood. When with his brawny breast he cuts the waves, his shoulders scarce the topmost billow laves, or like a mountain ash whose roots are spread deep fixed in earth, in clouds he hides his head. The Trojan prince beheld him from afar, and dauntless undertook the doubtful war. Collected in his strength and like a rock, poised on his base, Mezentius stood the shock. He stood, and measuring first with careful eyes the space his spear could reach, Aloud he cries, My strong right hand and sword assist my stroke. Those only gods Mezentius will invoke. His armour from the Trojan pirate torn By my triumphant Lausus shall be worn. He said, and with his utmost force he threw the massy spear, Which hissing as it flew reached the celestial shield That stopped the course 
but glancing thence the yet unbroken force took a new bent obliquely and betwixt the side and bowels famed anthores fixed anthores had from argos travelled far alcides friend and brother of the war till tired with toils fair italy he chose and in evander's palace sought repose now falling by another's wound his eyes he cast to heaven on argos thinks and dies the pious trojan then his javelin sent the shield gave way through treble plates it went of solid brass of linen trebly rolled and three bull hides which round the buckler fold all these it passed resistless in the course transpierced his thigh and spent its dying force the gaping wound gushed out a crimson flood the trojan glad with sight of hostile blood his fortune drew to closer fight addressed and with new force his fainting foe oppressed his father's peril lausus viewed with grief he sighed he wept he ran to his relief and here heroic youth tis here i must to thy immortal memory be just and sing an act so noble and so new posterity will scarce believe tis true pained with his wound and useless for the fight the father sought to save himself by flight encumbered slow he dragged the spear along which pierced his thigh and in his buckler hung the pious youth resolved on death below the lifted sword springs forth to face the foe protects his parent and prevents the blow shouts of applause ran ringing through the field to see the son the vanquished father shield all fired with generous indignation strive and with a storm of darts to distance drive the trojan chief who held at bay from far on his vulcanian orb sustained the war as when thick hail comes rattling in the wind the ploughman passenger and labouring hind for shelter to the neighbouring covert fly or housed or safe in hollow caverns lie but that o'erblown when heaven above em smiles return to travel and renew their toils aeneas thus o'erwhelmed on every side the storm of darts undaunted did abide and thus to lausus loud with friendly threatening cried why wilt thou rush to certain death and rage in rash attempts beyond thy tender age betrayed by pious love nor thus forborn the youth desists but with insulting scorn provokes the lingering prince whose patience tired gave place and all his breast with fury fired for now the fates prepared their sharpened shears and lifted high the flaming sword appears which full descending with a frightful sway through shield and corslet forced the impetuous way and buried deep in his fair bosom lay the purple streams through the thin armour strove and drenched the embroidered coat his mother wove and life at length forsook his heaving heart loath from so sweet a mansion to depart but when with blood and paleness all o'erspread the pious prince beheld young lausus dead he grieved he wept the sight an image brought of his own filial love a sadly pleasing thought then stretched his hand to hold him up and said poor hapless youth what praises can be paid to love so great to such transcendent store of early worth and sure presage of more accept what erinaeus can afford untouched thy arms untaken be thy sword and all that pleased thee living still remain inviolate and sacred to the slain thy body on thy parents i bestow to rest thy soul at least if shadows know or have a sense of human things below there to thy fellow ghosts with glory tell twas by the great aeneas hand i fell with this his distant friends he beckons near provokes their duty and prevents their fear himself assists to lift him from the ground with clotted locks and blood that welled from out the wound meantime his father 
Now no father stood, and washed his wounds by Tiber's yellow flood, oppressed with anguish, panting and o'erspent, his fainting limbs against an oak he lent. A bow his brazen helmet did sustain, his heavier arms lay scattered on the plain. A chosen train of youth around him stand, his drooping head was rested on his hand, his grisly beard his pensive bosom sought, and all on Lausus ran his restless thought. Careful, concerned his danger to prevent, he much inquired, and many a message sent to warn him from the field. Alas, in vain. Behold, his mournful followers bear him slain. O'er his broad shield still gushed the yawning wound, and drew a bloody trail along the ground. Far off he heard their cries, far off divined the dire event with a foreboding mind. With dust he sprinkled first his hoary head, then both his lifted hands to heaven he spread. Last, the dear corpse embracing, thus he said, What joys, alas, could this frail being give that I have been so covetous to live? To see my son and such a son resign his life a ransom for preserving mine. And am I then preserved, and art thou lost? How much too dear has that redemption cost! Tis now my bitter banishment I feel. This is a wound too deep for time to heal. My guilt thy growing virtues did defame, My blackness blotted thy unblemished name. Chased from a throne, abandoned and exiled, For foul misdeeds were punishments too mild. I owed my people these, and from their hate With less resentment could have borne my fate. And yet I live, and yet sustain the sight Of hated men, and of more hated light. But will not long. With that he raised from ground his fainting limbs That staggered with his wound, Yet with a mind resolved, and unappalled with pains or perils, For his courser called, well-mouthed, well-managed, Whom himself did dress with daily care, and mounted with success, His aid in arms, his ornament in peace. Soothing his courage with a gentle stroke, The steed seemed sensible while thus he spoke, O oh, Roebus, we have lived too long for me. If life and long were terms that could agree, This day thou either shalt bring back the head And bloody trophies of the Trojan dead, This day thou either shalt revenge my woe For murdered Lausus on his cruel foe, Or, if inexorable fate deny our conquest, With thy conquered master die. For after such a lord I rest secure, Thou wilt no foreign reins or Trojan load endure. He said, and straight the officious courser kneels To take his wonted weight. His hand he fills with pointed javelins, On his head he laced his glittering helm, Which terribly was graced with waving horsehair, Nodding from afar. Then spurred his thundering steed amidst the war. Love, anguish, wrath, and grief to madness wrought, Despair and secret shame, and conscious thought of inborn worth, His labouring soul oppressed, rolled in his eyes and raged within his breast. Then loud he called Aeneas thrice by name, The loud repeated voice to glad Aeneas came. Great Jove, he said, and the far-shooting God, Inspire thy mind to make thy challenge good. He spoke no more, but hastened, void of fear, And threatened with his long protended spear. To whom Mezentius thus, Thy vaunts are vain, my Lausus lies extended on the plain. He is lost, thy conquest is already won, The wretched sire is murdered in the sun. Nor fate I fear, but all the gods defy. Forbear thy threats, my business is to die. But first receive this parting legacy. He said, and straight a whirling dart he sent, 
another after and another went round in a spacious ring he rides the field and vainly plies the impenetrable shield thrice rode he round and thrice aeneas wheeled turned as he turned the golden orb withstood the strokes and bore about an iron wood impatient of delay and weary grown still to defend and to defend alone to wrench the darts which in his buckler light urged and o'erlaboured in unequal fight at length resolved he throws with all his force full at the temples of the warrior horse just where the stroke was aimed the unerring spear made way and stood transfixed through either ear seized with unwonted pain surprised with fright the wounded steed curvets and raised upright lights on his feet before his hoofs behind spring in air aloft and lash the wind down comes the rider headlong from his height his horse came after with unwieldy weight and floundering forward pitching on his head his lord's encumbered shoulder overlaid from either host the mingled shouts and cries of trojans and rutulians rend the skies aeneas hastening waved his fatal sword high o'er his head with this reproachful word now where are now thy vaunts the fierce disdain of proud mezentius and the lofty strain struggling and wildly staring on the skies with scarce recovered sight he thus replies why these insulting words this waste of breath to souls undaunted and secure of death tis no dishonour for the brave to die nor came i here with hope of victory nor ask i life nor fought with that design as i had used my fortune use thou thine my dying son contracted no such band the gift is hateful from his murderer's hand for this this only favour let me sue if pity can to conquered foes be due refuse it not but let my body have the last retreat of human kind a grave too well i know the insulting people's hate protect me from their vengeance after fate this refuge for my poor remains provide and lay my much-loved lausus by my side he said and to the sword his throat applied the crimson stream disdained his arms around and the disdainful soul came rushing through the wound end of book 10「Eleven, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Cho. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Eleven, Debaters and a Warrior Girl, Part One. Scarce had the rosy morning raised her head above the waves, and left her watery bed. The pious chief, whom double cares attend for his unburied soldiers and his friend, yet first to heaven performed a victor's vows. He barred an ancient oak of all her boughs. Then on a rising ground the trunk he placed, which with the spoils of his dead foe he graced. The coat of arms by proud Mezentius worn, now on a naked snag in triumph born was hung on high and glittered from afar a trophy sacred to the god of war above his arms fixed on a leafless wood appeared his plumy crest besmeared with blood his brazen buckler on the left was seen truncheons of shivered lances hung between and on the right was placed his corslet board and to the neck was tied his unavailing sword a crowd of chiefs enclosed the godlike man who thus conspicuous in the midst began our toils my friends are crowned with sure success the greater part performed achieve the less now follow cheerful to the trembling town press but an entrance and presume at one fear is no more 
for fierce mezentious lies, as the first fruits of war, a sacrifice. Turnus shall fall extended on the plain, and in this omen is already slain. Prepared in arms, pursue your happy chance, that none unwarned may plead his ignorance. And I, at heaven's appointed hour, may find your warlike ensigns waving in the wind. Meantime, the rites and funeral pomps prepare, due to your dead companions of the war, the last respect the living can bestow, to shield their shadows from contempt below. That conquered earth be theirs for which they fought, and which for us with their own blood they bought, but first the corpse of our unhappy friend to the sad city of Evander send, who, not inglorious in his age's bloom, was hurried hence by too severe a doom. Thus, weeping while he spoke, he took his way, where, new in death, lamented Pallas lay. Acoetes watched the corpse, whose youth deserved the father's trust, and now the son he served with equal faith, but less auspicious care. The attendants of the slain his sorrow share. A troop of Trojans mixed with these appear, and mourning matrons with disheveled hair. Soon as the prince appears, they raise a cry. All beat their breasts, and echoes rend the sky. They rear his drooping forehead from the ground. But when Aeneas viewed the grisly wound, which Pallas in his manly bosom bore, and the fair flesh disdained with purple gore, first melting into tears, the pious man deplored so sad a sight, then thus began. Unhappy youth, when fortune gave the rest of my full wishes, she refused the best. She came, but brought not thee along, to bless my longing eyes and share in my success. She grudged thy safe return, the triumphs due to prosperous valor in the public view. Not thus I promised when thy father lent thy needless succor with his sad consent embraced me, parting for the Turian land, and sent me to possess a large command. He warned, and from his own experience told, our foes were warlike, disciplined, and bold. And now, perhaps, in hopes of thy return, rich odors on his loaded altars burn, while we, with vain officious pomp, prepare to send him back his portion of the war a bloody breathless body which can owe no farther debt but to the powers below the wretched father ere his race is run shall view the funeral honors of his son these are my triumphs of the latian war fruits of my plighted faith and boasted care and yet unhappy sire thou shalt not see a son whose death disgraced his ancestry thou shalt not blush old man however grieved thy palace no dishonest wound received he died no death to make thee wish too late thou hadst not lived to see his shameful fate but what a champion has the sonian coast and what a friend hast thou ascanius lost thus having mourned he gave the word around to raise the breathless body from the ground and chose a thousand horse the flower of all his warlike troops to wait the funeral, to bear him back and share Evander's grief, a well-becoming but a weak relief. Of oaken twigs they twist an easy bier, then on their shoulders the sad burden rear. The body on this rural hearse is borne, strewed leaves and funeral greens the bier adorn. All pale he lies, and looks a lovely flower, new cropped by virgin hands, to dress the bower. Unfaded yet, but yet unfed below, no more to mother earth or the green stern shall owe. Then two fair vests, of wondrous work and cost, of purple woven, and with gold embossed, for ornament the Trojan hero brought, which with her hands Sidonian Dido wrought. One vest arrayed the corpse, and one they spread o'er his closed eyes and wrapped around his head, that when the yellow hair in flame should fall, the catching fire might burn the golden call. 
besides the spoils of foes in battle slain when he descended on the latian plain arms trappings horses by the hearse are led in long array the achievements of the dead then pinioned with their hands behind appear the unhappy captives marching in the rear appointed offerings in the victor's name to sprinkle with their blood the funeral flame inferior trophies by the chiefs are borne gauntlets and helms their loaded hands adorn and fair inscriptions fixed and titles read of latian leaders conquered by the dead Acoetes on his pupil's corpse attends with feeble steps supported by his friends pausing at every pace in sorrow drowned betwixt their arms he sinks upon the ground where groveling while he lies in deep despair he beats his breast and rends his hoary hair the champion's chariot next is seen to roll besmeared with hostile blood and honorably foul to close the pomp aethon the steed of state is led the funerals of his lord to wait stripped of his trappings with a sullen pace he walks and the big tears run rolling down his face the lance of pallas and the crimson crest are borne behind the victor seized the rest the march begins the trumpets hoarsely sound the pikes and lances trail along the ground thus while the trojan and arcadian horse to palantian towers direct their course in long procession ranked the pious chief stopped in the rear and gave a vent to grief the public care, he said, which war attends, diverts our present woes, at least suspends. Peace with the manes of great palace dwell, hail holy relics, and a last farewell. He said no more, but inly through he mourned, restrained his tears, and to the camp returned. Now suppliants from Laurentum sent demand a truce with olive branches in their hand. Obtest his clemency, and from the plain beg leave to draw the bodies of their slain. They plead that none those common rights deny to conquered foes that in fair battle die. All cause of hate was ended in their death, nor could he war with bodies void of breath. A king, they hoped, would hear a king's request, whose son he once was called, and once his guest. Their suit, which was too just to be denied, the hero grants, and farther thus replied, O Latian princes, how severe a fate in causeless quarrels has involved your state, and armed against an unoffending man, who sought your friendship ere the war began, you beg a truce which I would gladly give, not only for the slain, but those who live. I came not hither but by heaven's command, and sent by fate to share the Latian land. Nor wage I wars unjust, your king denied my proffered friendship and my promised bride. Left me for Turnus, Turnus then should try his cause in arms, to conquer or to die. My right and his are in the slain fell without fault our quarrel to maintain in equal arms let us alone contend and let him vanquish whom his fates befriend this is the way so tell him to possess the royal virgin and restore the peace bear this message back with ample leave that your slain friends may funeral rites receive thus having said the ambassadors amazed stood mute a while and on each other gazed drances their chief who harbored in his breast long hate to turnus as his foe professed broke silence first and to the godlike man with graceful action bowing thus began auspicious prince in arms a mighty name but yet whose actions far transcend your fame would I your justice or your force express, thought can be equal, and all words are less. Your answer we shall thankfully relate, and favors granted to the Latian state. If wished success our labor shall attend, think peace concluded, and the king your friend. 
let Turnus leave the realm to your command, and seek alliance in some other land. Build you the city which your fates assign, we shall be proud in the great work to join. Thus Drances, and his words so well persuade the rest empowered, that soon a truce is made. Twelve days the term allowed, and during those, Latians and Trojans now no longer foes. Mixed in the woods, for funeral piles prepare to fell the timber and forget the war. Loud axes through the groaning groves resound, oak, mountain ash, and poplar spread the ground. First fall from high, and some the trunks receive in loaded wains, with wedges some they cleave. And now the fatal news by fame is blown through the short circuit of the Arcadian town, a palace slain by fame, which just before his triumphs on distended pinions bore. Rushing from out the gate the people stand, each with a funeral flambeau in his hand. Wildly they stare, distracted with amaze. The fields are lightened with a fiery blaze that cast a sullen splendor on their friends, the marching troop which their dead prince attends. Both parties meet, they raise a doleful cry. The matrons from the walls with shrieks reply, and their mixed mourning rends the vaulted sky. The town is filled with tumult and with tears, till the loud clamors reach Evander's ears. Forgetful of his state, he runs along, with a disordered pace, and cleaves the throng, falls on the corpse, and groaning there he lies, with silent grief that speaks but at his eyes. Short sighs and sobs succeed, till sorrow breaks a passage, and at once he weeps and speaks. O Pallas, thou hast failed thy plighted word, to fight with caution, not to tempt the sword. I warned thee, but in vain, for well I knew what perils youthful ardor would pursue. That boiling blood would carry thee too far, young as thou wert in dangers, raw to war. O cursed essay of arms, disastrous doom, prelude of bloody fields and fights to come. Hard elements of unauspicious war, vain vows to heaven and unavailing care thrice happy thou dear partner of my bed whose holy soul the stroke of fortune fled precious of ills and leaving me behind to drink the dregs of life by fate assigned beyond the goal of nature i have gone my palace late set out but reached too soon if for my league against the Sonian state, amidst their weapons I had found my fate, deserved from them, then I had been returned, a breathless victor, and my son had mourned. Yet will I not my Trojan friend upbraid, nor grudge the alliance I so gladly made. Twas not his fault my palace fell so young, but my own crime for having lived too long. Yet since the gods had destined him to die, at least he led the way to victory. First for his friends he won the fatal shore, and sent whole herds of slaughtered foes before. A death too great, too glorious to deplore, nor will I add new honors to thy grave, content with those the Trojan hero gave. That funeral pomp thy Phrygian friends designed, in which the Tuscan chiefs and army joined. Great spoils and trophies gained by thee they bear. Then let thy own achievements be thy share. Even thou, O Turnus, hadst a trophy stood, whose mighty trunk had better graced the wood. If Pallas had arrived with equal length of years to match thy bulk with equal strength, but why, unhappy man, dost thou detain these troops to view the tears thou shedst in vain. Go, friends, this message to your lord relate. Tell him that, if I bear my bitter fate, and after Pallas's death live lingering on, tis to behold his vengeance for my son. I stay for Turnus, whose devoted head is owing to the living and the dead. 
my son and I expect it from his hand. Tis all that he can give, or we demand. Joy is no more, but I would gladly go to greet my palace with such news below. The morn had now dispelled the shades of night, restoring toils when she restored the light. The Trojan king and Tuscan chief command to raise the piles along the winding strand. Their friends convey the dead funeral fires, black smoldering smoke from the green wood expires. The light of heaven is choked and the new day retires. Then thrice around the kindled piles they go, for ancient custom had ordained it so. Thrice horse and foot about the fires are led, and thrice with loud laments they hail the dead. Tears trickling down their breasts bedew the ground, and drums and trumpets mix their mournful sound. Amid the blaze their pious brethren throw the spoils in battle taken from the foe. Helms, bits embossed, and swords of shining steel, one casts a target, one a chariot wheel. Some to their fellows their own arms restore, the falchions which in luckless fight they bore. Their bucklers pierced, and their darts bestowed in vain, and shivered lances gathered from the plain. Whole herds of offered bulls about the fire, and bristled boars and woolly sheep expire. Around the piles a careful troop attends to watch the wasting flames and weep their burning friends, lingering along the shore till dewy night new decks the face of heaven with starry light. The conquered Latians, with like pious care, piles without number for their dead prepare. Part in the places where they fell are laid, and part are to the neighboring fields conveyed. The corps of kings and captains of renown, born off in state, are buried in the town. The rest, unhonored and without a name, are cast a common heap to feed the flame. Trojans and Latians vie with like desires to make the field of battle shine with fires, and the promiscuous blaze to heaven aspires. Now had the morning thrice renewed the light, and thrice dispelled the shadows of the night, when those who round the wasted fires remain, perform the last sad office to the slain. They rake the yet warm ashes from below, these and the bones unburned in earth bestow. These relics with their country rites they grace, and raise a mount of turf to mark the place. But in the palace of the king appears a scene more solemn and a pomp of tears. Maids, matrons, widows mix their common moans, orphans their sires, and sires lament their sons. All in that universal sorrow share and curse the cause of this unhappy war. A broken league, a bride unjustly sought, a crown usurped, which with their blood is bought. These are the crimes with which they load the name of Turnus, and on him alone exclaim, Let him who lords it o'er the Ausonian land engage the Trojan hero hand to hand. His is the gain, our lot is but to serve. Tis just, though sway he seeks, he should deserve. This Drances aggravates, and adds with spite, His foe expects and dares him to the fight. Nor Turnus wants a party to support his cause and credit in the Latian court. His former acts secure his present fame, and the queen shades him with her mighty name. While thus their factious minds with fury burn, the legates from the Tolian prince return. Sad news they bring that, after all the cost and care employed, their embassy is lost, that Diomedes refused his aid in war, unmoved with presence, and as deaf to prayer. Some new alliance must elsewhere be sought, or peace with Troy on hard conditions bought. Latinus, sunk in sorrow, finds too late, a foreign son is pointed out by fate, and till Aeneas shall Lavinia wed, the wrath of heaven is hovering o'er his head. The gods he saw espoused the juster side, when late their titles in the field were tried. Witness the fresh laments, and funeral tears undried. 
Thus, full of anxious thought, he summons all the Latian senate to the council hall. The princes come, commanded by their head, and crowd the paths that to the palace led. Supreme in power and reverenced for his years, he takes the throne and in the midst appears. Majestically sad, he sits in state and bids his envoys their success relate. When Venulus began, the murmuring sound was hushed, and sacred silence reigned around. We have, said he, performed your high command, and passed with peril a long tract of land. We reached the place desired, with wonder filled, the Grecian tents and rising towers beheld. Great Diomede has compassed round with walls the city, which Argyrippa he calls, from his own Argos named. We touched with joy the royal hand that raised unhappy Troy. When introduced, our presence first we bring, then crave an instant audience from the king. His leave obtained, our native soil we name, and tell the important cause for which we came. Attentively he heard us while we spoke, then with soft accents and a pleasing look made this return. Ausonian race, of old, renowned for peace and for an age of gold. What madness has your altered minds possessed to change for war hereditary rest? Solicit arms unknown and tempt the sword, a needless ill your ancestors abhorred? We, for myself I speak, and all the name of Grecians, who to Troy's destruction came, omitting those who were in battle slain or borne by rolling Simois to the main. Not one but suffered and too dearly bought the prize of honor which in arms he sought. Some doomed to death and some in exile driven, outcasts abandoned by the care of heaven, so worn, so wretched, so despised a crew, as even old Priam might with pity view. Witness the vessels by Minerva tossed in storms, the vengeful Capharian coast, the Euboean rocks, the prince whose brother led our armies to revenge his injured bed in Egypt lost. Ulysses with his men have seen Charybdis and the Cyclops' den. Why should I name Idomeneus in vain, restored to scepters and expelled again? Or young Achilles by his rival slain? Even he, the king of men, the foremost name of all the Greeks, and most renowned by fame, the proud revenger of another's wife, yet by his own adulteress lost his life, fell at his threshold and the spoils of Troy, the foul polluters of his bed enjoy. The gods have envied me the sweets of life, my much-loved country and my more-loved wife. Banished from both, I mourn, while in the sky, transformed to birds, my lost companions fly. Hovering about the coast, they make their moan, and cuff the cliffs with pinions not their own. What squalid spectres in the dead of night break my short sleep and skim before my sight? I might have promised to myself those harms, mad as I was when I, with mortal arms, presumed against immortal powers to move, and violate with wounds the queen of love. Such arms this hand shall never more employ. No hate remains with me to ruined Troy. I war not with its dust, nor am I glad to think of past events, or good or bad. Your presence I return. Whate'er you bring to buy my friendship, send the Trojan king. We met in fight, I know him, to my cost. With what a whirling force his lance he tossed! Heavens, what a spring was in his arm to throw! How high he held his shield and rose at every blow! Had Troy produced two more his match in might, they would have changed the fortune of the fight. The invasion of the Greeks had been returned, our empire wasted and our cities burned. The long defense the Trojan people made the war protracted and the siege delayed, were due to Hector's and this hero's hand, both brave alike and equal in command. Aeneas, not inferior in the field, in pious reverence to the gods excelled. 
Make peace, ye Latians, and avoid with care Th' impending dangers of a fatal war. He said no more, but, with this cold excuse, Refused the alliance, and advised a truce. Thus Venulus concluded his report. A jarring murmur filled the factious court. As when a torrent rolls with rapid force, And dashes o'er the stones that stop the course, the flood constrained within a scanty space roars horrible along the uneasy race white foam in gathering eddies floats around the rocky shores rebellow to the sound the murmur ceased then from his lofty throne the king invoked the gods and thus begun i wish ye latians what we now debate had been resolved before it was too late much better had it been for you and me, Unforced by this our last necessity, To have been earlier wise than now to call a council When the foe surrounds the wall. O citizens, we wage unequal war, With men not only heaven's peculiar care, But heaven's own race, unconquered in the field, Or conquered, yet unknowing how to yield. What hopes you had in Diomedes lay down. Our hopes must center on ourselves alone. Yet those how feeble and indeed how vain, You see too well, nor need my words explain. Vanquished, without resource, laid flat by fate, Factions within, a foe without the gate. Not but I grant that all performed their parts With manly force and with undaunted hearts. With our united strength the war we waged, With equal numbers, equal arms, engaged. You see the event, now hear what I propose, To save our friends and satisfy our foes. A tract of land the Latians have possessed Along the Tiber, stretching to the west, Which now Rutulians and Aruncans till, And their mixed cattle graze the fruitful hill. Those mountains filled with firs that lower land, If you consent, the Trojan shall command. Called into part of what is ours, and there, On terms agreed, the common country share. There let them build and settle, if they please, Unless they choose once more to cross the seas, In search of seats remote from Italy, And from unwelcome inmates set us free. Then twice ten galleys let us build with speed, Or twice as many more, if more they need. Materials are at hand, a well-grown wood Runs equal with the margin of the flood. Let them the number and the form assign, The care and cost of all the stores be mine. To treat the peace, a hundred senators Shall be commissioned hence with ample powers, With olive the presents they shall bear, a purple robe, a royal ivory chair, And all the marks of sway that Latian monarchs wear, And sums of gold. Among yourselves debate this great affair, And save the sinking state. Then Drances took the word, who grudged long since, The rising glories of the Donian prince, Factious and rich, bold at the council board, But cautious in the field, he shunned the sword, a close caballer and tongue valiant lord. Noble his mother was, and near the throne, but what his father's parentage unknown. He rose and took the advantage of the times to load young Turnus with invidious crimes. Such truths, O king, said he, your words contain, as strike the sense, and all replies are vain. Nor are your loyal subjects now to seek what common needs require but fear to speak let him give leave of speech that haughty man whose pride this unauspicious war began for whose ambition let me dare to say fear set apart though death is in my way the plains of latium run with blood around so many valiant heroes fight the ground dejected grief in every face appears a town in mourning, and a land in tears. While he, the undoubted author of our harms, The man who menaces the gods with arms, Yet, after all his boasts, 
forsook the fight, And sought his safety in ignoble flight. Now, best of kings, since you propose to send Such bounteous presents to your Trojan friend, Add yet a greater at our joint request, One which he values more than all the rest. Give him the fair Lavinia for his bride, with that alliance let the league be tied, And for the bleeding land a lasting peace provide. Let insolence no longer awe the throne, But with a father's right bestow your own. For this maligner of the general good, If still we fear his force, he must be wooed. His haughty godhead we with prayers implore, Your scepter to release and our just rights restore. O cursed cause of all our ills, must we wage wars unjust, and fall in fight for thee? What right hast thou to rule the Latian state, and send us out to meet our certain fate? Tis a destructive war, from Turnus' hand our peace and public safety we demand. Let the fair bride to the brave chief remain, if not, the peace without the pledge is vain. Turnus, I know you think me not your friend, nor will I much with your belief contend. I beg your greatness not to give the law in others' realms, but, beaten, to withdraw. Pity your own, or pity our estate, nor twist our fortunes with your sinking fate. Your interest is, the war should never cease, but we have felt enough to wish the peace. A land exhausted to the last remains, depopulated towns, and driven plains. Yet, if desire of fame and thirst of power, a beauteous princess with a crown in dower. So fire your mind, in arms assert your right, and meet your foe who dares you to the fight. Mankind, it seems, is made for you alone, we but the slaves who mount you to the throne. A base, ignoble crowd, without a name, Unwept, unworthy of the funeral flame, By duty bound to forfeit each his life, That Turnus may possess a royal wife. Permit not, mighty man, so mean a crew Should share such triumphs, and detain from you The post of honor, your undoubted due. Rather alone your matchless force employ, to merit what alone you must enjoy. End of Book 11, Part 1 Recording by Lisa Cho Book 11, Part 2 of the Aeneid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book 11. Debaters and a Warrior Girl. Part 2. These words, so full of malice mixed with art, inflamed with rage the youthful hero's heart. Then, groaning from the bottom of his breast, he heaved to wind, and thus his wrath expressed. You, Drances, never want a stream of words. Then, when the public need requires our swords, first in the council hall to steer the state, and ever foremost in a tongue debate, while our strong walls secure us from the foe, ere yet with blood our ditches overflow. But let the potent orator declaim, and with the brand of coward blot my name, Free leave is given him when his fatal hand has covered with more corpse the Sandron strand, and high as mine his towering trophies stand. If any doubt remains, who dares the most? Let us decide it at the Trojan's cost, and issue both abreast where honour calls. Foes are not far to seek without the walls, unless his noisy tongue can only fight, and feet were given him but to speed his flight. I beaten from the field? I forced away? Who, but so known a dastard, dares to say? Had he but even beheld the fight, his eyes had witnessed for me what his tongue denies. What heaps of Trojans by this hand were slain, 
and how the bloody Tiber swelled the main. All saw but he, the Arcadian troops retire in scattered squadrons, and their prince expire. The giant brothers in their camp have found I was not forced with ease to quit my ground. Not such the Trojans tried me, when, enclosed, I singly their united arms opposed. First forced an entrance through their thick array, then, glutted with their slaughter, freed my way. "'Tis a destructive war, so let it be, but to the Phrygian pirate and to thee. Meantime, proceed to fill the people's ears with false reports, their minds with panic fears. Extol the strength of a twice-conquered race, our foes encourage and our friends debase. Believe thy fables, and the Trojan tongue triumphant stands. The Grecians are overthrown. Suppliant at Hector's feet Achilles lies, and Diomede from fierce Aeneas flies. Say, rapid Aufidus with awful dread runs backward from the sea and hides his head when the great Trojan on his bank appears. For that's as true as thy dissembled fears of my revenge. Dismiss that vanity. Thou, Drances, art below a death from me. Let that vile soul in that vile body rest. The lodging is well worthy of the guest. Now, royal father, to the present state of our affairs and of this high debate, if in your arms thus early you defied, and think your fortune is already tried, if one defeat has brought us down so low as never more in fields to meet the foe, then I conclude for peace, tis time to treat, and lie like vessels at the victor's feet. But, oh, if any ancient blood remains, one drop of all our fathers in our veins, that man would I prefer before the rest, who dared his death with an undaunted breast, who comely fell by no dishonest wound, to shun that sight, and, dying, gnawed the ground. But if we still have fresh recruits in store, if our confederates can afford us more, if the contended field we bravely fought, and not a bloodless victory was bought, their losses equaled ours, and for their slain with equal fires they filled the shining plain. Why thus, unforced, should we so tamely yield, and, ere the trumpet sounds, resign the field? Good unexpected, evils unforeseen, appear by turns, as fortune shifts the scene. Some, raised aloft, come tumbling down amain, then fall so hard, they bound and rise again. If Diomede refuse his aid to lend, the great Messippus yet remains our friend. Tolumnius, who foretells events, is ours. The Italian chiefs and princes join their powers, nor least in number, nor in name the last. Your own brave subjects have your cause embraced. Above the rest, the Volscian Amazon contains an army in herself alone, and heads a squadron, terrible to sight, with glittering shields in brazen armour bright. Yet, if the foe a single fight demand, and I alone the public peace withstand, if you consent, he shall not be refused, nor find a hand to victory unused. This new Achilles, let him take the field, with fated armour and Vulcanian shield. For you, my royal father, and my fame, I, Turnus, not the least of all my name, devote my soul. He calls me hand to hand, and I alone will answer his demand. Drances shall rest secure, and neither share the danger, nor divide the prize of war. While they debate, nor these, nor those will yield. Aeneas draws his forces to the field, and moves his camp. The scouts, with flying speed, return, and through the frighted city spread the unpleasing news. The Trojans are descried, in battle marching by the riverside, and bending to the town. They take the alarm, some tremble, some are bold, all in confusion arm. The impetuous youth press forward to the field, they clash the sword and clatter on the shield. The fearful matrons raise a screaming cry, old feeble men with fainter groans reply. A jarring sound results, and mingles in the sky, like that of swans, remurmuring to the floods, or birds of differing kinds in hollow woods. Turnus the occasion takes, and cries aloud, Talk on, you quaint haranguers of the crowd. Declaim in praise of peace when danger calls, and the fierce foes in arms approach the walls. He said, 
and turning short with speedy pace, casts back a scornful glance, and quits the place. Thou, Volusus, the Volscian troops command to mount, and lead thyself our Ardian band. Messapus and Catillus post your force along the fields to charge the Trojan horse. Some guard the passes, others man the wall. Drawn up in arms, the rest attend my call. They swarm from every quarter of the town, and with disordered haste the rampires crown. Good old Latinus, when he saw too late the gathering storm just breaking on the state, dismissed the council till a fitter time, and owned his easy temper as his crime, who, forced against his reason, had complied to break the treaty for the promised bride. Some helped to sink new trenches, others aid to ram the stones or raise the palisade. Hoarse trumpets sound the alarm, around the walls runs a distracted crew, whom their last labour calls. A sad procession in the streets is seen, of matrons that attend the mother queen, high in her chair she sits, and at her side, with downcast eyes, appears the fatal bride. They mount the cliff where palace temple stands, prayers in their mouths and presents in their hands, with censers first they fume the sacred shrine, then in this common supplication join. O patroness of arms, unspotted maid, propitious hear and lend thy Latin's aid. Break short the pirate's lance, pronounce his fate, and lay the Phrygian low before the gate. Now turn his arms for fight, his back and breast well-tempered steel and scaly brass invest. The quishes which his brawny thighs enfold are mingled metal damaxed o'er with gold. His faithful fortune sits upon his side, nor cask nor crest his manly features hide. But bare to view, amid surrounding friends, with godlike grace he from the tower descends. Exulting in his strength, he seems to dare his absent rival and to promise war. Freed from his keepers, thus with broken reins, the wanton courser prances o'er the plains, or in the pride of youth o'erleaps the mounds and snuffs the females in forbidden grounds, or seeks his watering in the well-known flood to quench his thirst and cool his fiery blood. He swims luxuriant in the liquid plain, and over his shoulder flows his waving mane. He neighs, he snorts, he bears his head on high. Before his ample chest the frothy waters fly. Soon as the prince appears without the gate, the Volscians, with their virgin leader, wait his last commands. Then, with a graceful mien, lights from her lofty steed the warrior queen. Her squadron imitates and each descends whose common suit Camilla thus commands. If sense of honour, if a soul secure of inborn worth, that can all tests endure, can promise aught, or on itself rely, greatly to dare, to conquer or to die, then I alone, sustained by these, will meet the Therene troops and promise their defeat. Ours be the danger, ours the sole renown. You, general, stay behind and guard the town. Turnus a while stood mute with glad surprise, and on the fierce Virago fixed his eyes. Then thus returned, O grace of Italy, with what becoming thanks can I reply? Not only words lie labouring in my breast, but thought itself is by thy praise oppressed. Yet rob me not of all, but let me join my toils, my hazard, and my fame with thine. The Trojan, not in stratagem unskilled, sends his light horse before to scour the field himself through steep ascents and thorny breaks a larger compass to the city takes this news my scouts confirm and i prepare to foil his cunning and his force to dare with chosen foot his passage to forlay and place an ambush in the widening way thou with thy volscians face the tuscan horse the brave messapus shall thy troops enforce with those of tiber and the latian band subjected all to thy supreme command. This said, he warns Messapus to the war, then every chief exhorts with equal care. All thus encouraged, his own troops he joins, and hastes to prosecute his deep designs. Enclosed with hills, a winding valley lies, by nature formed for fraud and fitted for surprise. A narrow track, by human steps untrode, leads, through perplexing thorns, to this obscure abode. High over the vale a steepy mountain stands, 
whence to the surveying site the nether ground commands. The top is level, an offensive seat of war, and from the war a safe retreat. For, on the right and left, is room to press the foes at hand, or from afar distress, to drive them headlong downward, and to pour on their descending backs a stony shower. Thither young Turnus took the well-known way, possessed the pass, and in blind ambush lay. Meantime, Latonian Phoebe, from the skies, beheld the approaching war with hateful eyes, and called the light-foot Opis to her aid, her most beloved and ever trusty maid. Then, with a sigh, began, Camilla goes to meet her death amidst her fatal foes. The nymphs I loved of all my mortal train, invested with Diana's arms, in vain. Nor is my kindness for the virgin new. T'was born with her, and with her years it grew. Her father Metabus, when forced away from old Privernum for tyrannic sway, snatched up, and saved from his prevailing foes, this tender babe, companion of his woes. Casmilla was her mother, but he drowned one hissing letter in a softer sound, and called Camilla. Through the woods he flies, wrapped in his robe the royal infant lies. His foes in sight he mends his weary pace, with shout and clamours they pursue the chase. The banks of Amasene at length he gains. The raging flood his farther flight restrains, raised o'er the borders with unusual rains. Prepared to plunge into the stream, he fears not for himself, but for the charge he bears. Anxious, he stops a while, and thinks in haste. Then, desperate in distress, resolves at last. A knotty lance of well-boiled oak he bore, the middle part with cork he covered o'er. He closed the child within the hollow space, with twigs of bending osier bound the case, then poised a spear, heavy with human weight, and thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the wood, and thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the woods, he said, sent by her sire this dedicated maid. Through air she flies a suppliant to thy shrine, and the first weapons that she knows are thine, he said, and with full force the spear he threw. Above the sounding waves Camilla flew. Then, pressed by foes, he stemmed the stormy tide, and gained, by stress of arms, the farther side. His fastened spear he pulled from out the ground, and, victor of his vows, his infant nymph unbound. Nor, after that, in towns which walls enclose, would trust his hunted life amidst his foes, but rough, in open air he chose to lie. Earth was his couch, his covering was the sky. On hills unshorn, or in a desert den, he shunned the dire society of men. A shepherd's solitary life he led, his daughter with the milk of mares he fed. The ducks of bears, and every salvage beast, he drew, and through her lips the liquor pressed. The little Amazon could scarcely go, he loads her with a quiver and a bow, and, that she might her staggering steps command, he with a slender javelin fills her hand. Her flowing hair no golden fillet bound, nor swept her trailing robe the dusty ground. Instead of these, a tiger's hide overspread her back and shoulders, fastened to her head. The flying dart she first attempted to fling, and round her tender temples tossed the sling. Then, as her strength with years increased, began to pierce aloft in air the soaring swan, and from the clouds to fetch the heron and the crane. The Tuscan matrons with each other vied to bless their rival sons with such a bride. But she disdains their love to share with me the sylvan shades and vowed virginity. And, oh, I wish, contented with my cares of salvage spoils, she had not sought the wars. Then had she been of my celestial train, and shunned the fate that dooms her to be slain. But since, opposing heaven's decree, she goes to find her death among forbidden foes, Haste with these arms, and take thy steepy flight, Where, with the gods averse, the Latins fight. This bow to thee, this quiver I bequeath, This chosen arrow to revenge her death. By whatever hand Camilla shall be slain, Or of the Trojan or Italian train, Let him not pass unpunished from the plain. Then, in a hollow cloud, myself will aid To bear the breathless body of my maid. Unspoiled shall be her arms, and unprofaned, her holy limbs with any human hand, and in a marble tomb laid in her native land, she said. 
the faithful nymph descends from high with rapid flight and cuts the sounding sky black clouds and stormy winds around her body fly by this the trojan and the tuscan horse drawn up in squadrons with united force approach the walls the sprightly coursers bound press forward on their bits and shift their ground shields arms and spears flash horribly from far and the fields glitter with a waving war opposed to these come on with furious force messapus chorus and the latian horse these in the body placed on either hand sustained and closed by fair camilla's band advancing in a line they couch their spears and less and less the middle space appears thick smoke obscures the field and scarce are seen the neighing coursers and the shouting men in distance of their darts they stop their course then man to man they rush and horse to horse the face of heaven their flying javelins hide and deaths unseen are dealt on either side tyrrhenus and acontius void of fear by mettled coursers borne in full career meet first opposed and with a mighty shock their horses heads against each other knock far from his steed is fierce acontius cast as with an engine's force or lightning's blast he rolls along in blood and breathes his last the latin squadrons take a sudden fright and sling their shields behind to save their backs in flight spurring at speed to their own walls they drew close in the rear the tuscan troops pursue and urge their flight Asilus leads the chase till seized with shame they wheel about and face receive their foes and raise a threatening cry the tuscans take their turn to fear and fly so swelling surges with a thundering roar driven on each other's backs insult the shore bound o'er the rocks encroach upon the land and far upon the beach eject the sand then backwards with a swing they take their way repulsed from upper ground and seek their mother sea with equal hurry quit the invaded shore and swallow back the sand and stones they spoop before twice were the tuscans masters of the field twice by the latins in their turn repelled ashamed at length to the third charge they ran both hosts resolved and mingled man to man now dying groans are heard the fields are strode with falling bodies and are drunk with blood arms horses men on heaps together lie confuse the fight and more confuse the cry orsilochus who durst not press too near strong remulus at distance drove his spear and stuck the steel beneath his horse's ear the fiery steed impatient of the wound curvets and springing upwards with a bound his helpless lord cast backward on the ground catillus pierced iolus first then drew his reeking lance and at herminius threw the mighty champion of the tuscan crew his neck and throat unarmed his head was bare but shaded with a length of yellow hair secure he fought exposed on every part a spacious mark for swords and for the flying dart across the shoulders came the feathered wound transfixed he fell and doubled to the ground the sands with streaming blood are sanguine dyed and death with honour sought on either side resistless through the war camilla rode in danger unappalled and pleased with blood one side was bare for her exerted breast one shoulder with her painted quiver pressed now from afar her fatal javelins play now with her axe's edge she hews her way diana's arms upon her shoulders sound and when too closely pressed she quits the ground from her bent bow she sends a backward wound her maids in martial pomp on either side lorena tulla fierce tarpeia ride italians all in peace their queen's delight in war the bold companions of the fight so marched the thracian amazons of old when thermodon with bloody billows rolled such troops as these in shining arms were seen when theseus met in fight their maiden queen such to the field penthesilea led from the fierce virgin when the grecians fled with such returned triumphant from the war her maids with cries attend the lofty car they clash with manly force their moony shields with female shouts resound the phrygian fields who foremost and who last heroic maid on the cold earth were by thy courage laid 
thy spear of mountain ash, Eumenius first with fury driven from side to side transpierced. A purple stream came spouting from the wound, bathed in his blood he lies and bites the ground. Liris and Pegasus at once she slew, the former as the slackened reins he drew of his faint steed, the latter as he stretched his arm to prop his friend, the javelin reached. By the same weapon, sent from the same hand, both fall together, and both spurn the sand. A mistress next is added to the slain, the rest in round she follows o'er the plain. Tereus, Harpalycus, Demophon, and Chromis at full speed her fury shun. Of all her deadly darts not one she lost. Each was attendant with a Trojan ghost. Young Ornithus bestrode a hunter's steed, swift for the chase, and of Apollyon breed. Him from afar she spied, in arms unknown. Over his broad back an ox's hide was thrown. His helm a wolf, whose gaping jaws were spread a covering for his cheeks, and grinned around his head. He clenched within his hand an iron prong, and towered above the rest, conspicuous in the throng. Him soon she singled from the flying train, and slew with ease, then thus insults the slain. Vain hunter, didst thou think, through woods to chase the savage herd, a vile and trembling race? Here seize thy vaunts, and own my victory. A woman warrior was too strong for thee. Yet, if the ghosts demand the conqueror's name, confessing great Camilla, save thy shame. Then Butus and Orsilochus she slew, the bulkiest bodies of the Trojan crew. But Butus breast to breast, the spear descends above the gorget where his helmet ends, and o'er the shield which his left side defends. Orsilochus and she their courses ply, he seems to follow and she seems to fly, but in a narrow ring she makes the race, and then he flies and she pursues the chase. Gathering at length on her deluded foe, she swings her axe and rises to the blow, full on the helm behind, with such a sway the weapon falls, the riven steel gives way. He groans, he roars, he sues in vain for grace. Brains, mingled with his blood, besmear his face. Astonished Honus just arrives by chance to see his fall, nor father dares advance, but fixing on the horrid maid his eye, he stares and shakes and finds it vain to fly. Yet, like a true Ligurian born to cheat, at least while fortune favoured his deceit, cries out aloud, what courage have you shown, who trust your course's strength and not your own? Forgo the vantage of your horse, alight, and then on equal terms begin the fight. It shall be seen, weak woman, what you can, when foot to foot you combat with a man, he said. She glows with anger and disdain, dismounts with speed to dare him on the plain, and leaves her horse at large among her train. With her drawn sword defies him to the field, and, marching, lifts aloft her maiden shield. The youth, who thought his cunning did succeed, reins round his horse and urges all his speed, adds the remembrance of the spur, and hides the goring rowels in his bleeding sides. "'Vain fool and coward!' cries the lofty maid. "'Caught in the train which thou thyself hast laid. On others practice thy Ligurian arts. Thin stratagems and tricks of little hearts are lost on me nor shalt thou safe retire with vaunting lies to thy fallacious sire. At this, so fast her flying feet she sped, that soon she strained beyond his horse's head. Then, turning short, at once she seized the rein, and laid the boaster grovelling on the plain. Not with more ease the falcon from above trusses in middle air the trembling dove, then plumes the prey in her strong pounces bound. The feathers, foul with blood, come tumbling to the ground. Now mighty Jove from his superior height with his broad eye surveys the unequal fight. He fires the breast of Tarkin with disdain and sends him to redeem the abandoned plain. Betwixt the broken ranks the Tuscan rides and these encourages and those he chides, recalls each leader by his name from flight, renews their ardour and restores the fight. What panic fear has seized your souls O oh, shame, O oh, brand perpetual of the Etrurian name! Cowards incurable, a woman's hand drives, breaks, and scatters your ignoble band. Now cast away the sword and quit the shield. 
what use of weapons which you dare not wield not thus you fly your female foes by night nor shun the feast when the full bowels invite when to fat offerings the glad augur calls and the shrill hornpipe sounds to bacchanals these are your studied cares your lewd delight swift to debauch but slow to manly fight thus having said he spurs amid the foes not managing the life he meant to lose the first he found he seized with headlong haste in his strong gripe and clasped around the waist twas venulus whom from his horse he tore and laid edward his own in triumph bore loud shouts ensue the latins turn their eyes and view the unusual sight with vast surprise the fiery tarkin flying over the plains pressed in his arms the ponderous prey sustains then with his shortened spear explores around his jointed arms to fix a deadly wound nor less the captive struggles for his life he writhes his body to prolong the strife and fencing for his naked throat exerts his utmost vigour and the point adverts so stoops the yellow eagle from on high and bears a speckled serpent through the sky fastening his crooked talons on the prey the prisoner hisses through the liquid way resists the royal hawk and though oppressed she fights in volumes and erects her crest turned to her foe she stiffens every scale and shoots her forky tongue and whisks her threatening tail against the victor all defence is weak the imperial bird still plies her with his beak he tears her bowels and her breast he gores then claps his pinions and securely soars thus through the midst of circling enemies strong tarkin snatched and bore away his prize the tyrene troops that shrunk before now press the latins and presume the like success then Aaron's, doomed to death, his arms essayed to murder unespied the Volscian maid. This way and that his winding course he bends, and, wheresoever she turns, her steps attends. When she retires victorious from the chase, he wheels about with care and shifts his place. When, rushing on, she seeks her foe's flight, he keeps aloof, but keeps her still in sight. He threats and trembles, trying every way, unseen to kill and safely to betray. Chloreus, the priest of Sibylle, from far, glittering in Phrygian arms amidst the war, was by the virgin viewed. The steed he pressed was proud with trappings, and his brawny chest with scales of gilded brass was covered over. A robe of Tyrian dye the rider wore. With deadly wounds he galled the distant foe. Gnosian his shafts, and Lycian was his bow. A golden helm his front and head surrounds, a gilded quiver from his shoulder sounds. Gold, weaved with linen, on his thighs he wore, with flowers of needlework distinguished o'er, with golden buckles bound and gathered up before. Him the fierce maid beheld with ardent eyes, fond and ambitious of so rich a prize, or that the temple might his trophies hold, or else to shine herself in Trojan gold. Blind in her haste, she chases him alone, and seeks his life, regardless of her own. This lucky moment the sly traitor chose, then, starting from his ambush, up he rose, and threw, but first to heaven addressed his vows. O patron of Socrates' high abodes, Phoebus, the ruling power among the gods, whom first we serve, whole woods of unctuous pine are felt for thee, and to thy glory shine. By thee protected with our naked souls, Through flames unsinged we march, And tread the kindled coals. Give me propitious power, To wash away the stains of this dishonourable day. Nor spoils, nor triumph from the fact I claim, But with my future actions trust my fame. Let me by stealth this female plague overcome, And from the field return in glorious home. Apollo heard, and granting half his prayer, Shuffled in winds the rest, and tossed in empty air. He gives the death desired, his safe return, By sudden tempests to the seas is borne. Now when the javelin whizzed along the skies, Both armies on Camilla turned their eyes, Directed by the sound. Of either host, the unhappy virgin, Though concerned the most, was only deaf. So greedy was she bent on golden spoils, And on her prey intent, till in her pap 
the winged weapon stood, infixed and deeply drunk the purple blood. Her sad attendants hastened to sustain their dying lady, drooping on the plain. Far from their sight the trembling Aaron's flies, with beating heart and fear confused with joys. Nor dares he farther to pursue his blow, or even to bear the sight of his expiring foe. As, when the wolf has torn a bullock's hide at unawares, or ranched a shepherd's side, conscious of his audacious deed, he flies, and claps his quivering tail between his thighs. So, speeding once, the wretch no more attends, but, spurring forward, hurts among his friends. She wrenched the javelin with her dying hands, but wetted within her breast the weapon stands. The wood she draws, the steely point remains. She staggers in her seat with agonizing pains. A gathering misto clouds her cheerful eyes, and from her cheeks the rosy color flies. Then turns to her whom of her female train she trusted most, and thus she speaks with pain. Akka, tis past, he swims before my sight, inexorable death, and claims his right. Bear my last words to Turnus, fly with speed, and bid him timely to my charge succeed. Repel the Trojans, and the town relieve. Farewell, and in this kiss my parting breath receive. She said, and, sliding, sunk upon the plain. Dying, her opened hand forsakes the rain. Short and more short she pants. By slow degrees, her mind the passage from her body frees. She drops her sword, she knots her plumy crest, her drooping head declining on her breast. In the last sigh her struggling soul expires, and, murmuring with disdain, to Stygian sounds retires. A shout that struck the golden stars ensued. Despair and rage the languished fight renewed. The Trojan troops and Tuscans in a line advance to charge, the mixed Arcadians join. But Cynthia's maid, high seated from afar, surveys the field and fortune of the war, unmoved a while, till prostrate on the plain, weltering in blood, she seized Camilla slain, and round her corpse of friends and foes a fighting train. Then from the bottom of her breast she drew a mournful sigh, and these sad words ensue. Too dear a fine, ah, much lamented maid, for warring with the Trojans thou hast paid, nor aught availed in this unhappy strive Diana's sacred arms to save thy life. Yet unrevenged thy goddess will not leave her votary's death, nor with vain sorrow grieve. Branded the wretch, and be his name abhorred, but after ages shall thy praise record. The inglorious coward soon shall press the plain. Thus vows thy queen, and thus the fates ordain. High o'er the field there stood a hilly mound, sacred the place, and spread with oaks around, where, in a marble tomb, their senes lay, a king that once in Latium bore the sway. The beauteous opus thither bent her flight, to mark the traitor errands from the height. Him in refulgent arms she soon espied, swollen with success, and loudly thus she cried. Thy backward steps, vain boaster, are too late. Turn like a man at length, and meet thy fate. Charged with my message to Camilla go, and say I send thee to the shades below, an honour undeserved from Cynthia's bow. She said, and from her quiver chose with speed the winged shaft predestined for the deed. Then to the stubborn ewe her strength applied, till the far distant horns approached on either side. The bowstring touched her breast, so strong she drew. Whizzing in air the fatal arrow flew. At once the twanging bow and sounding dart the traitor heard and felt the point within his heart. Him beating with his heels in pangs of death, his flying friends to foreign fields bequeath. The conquering damsel with expanded wings the welcome message to her mistress brings. Their leader lost, the Volscians quit the field, and, unsustained, the chiefs of Turnus yield. The frighted soldiers, when their captains fly, more on their speed than on their strength rely. Confused in flight, they bear each other down, and spur their horses headlong to the town. 
driven by their foes and to their fears resigned not once they turn but take their wounds behind these drop the shield and those the lance forgo or on their shoulders bear the slackened bow the hoofs of horses with a rattling sound beat short and thick and shake the rotten ground black clouds of dust come rolling in the sky and o'er the darkened walls and rampires fly the trembling matrons from their lofty stands rend heaven with female shrieks and wring their hands all pressing on pursuers and pursued are crushed in crowds a mingled multitude some happy few escape the throng too late rush on for entrance till they choke the gate even in sight of home the wretched sire looks on and sees his helpless son expire then in a fright the folding gates they close but leave their friends excluded with their foes the vanquished cry the victors loudly shout tis terror all within and slaughter all without blind in their fear they bounce against the wall or to the moats pursued precipitate their fall the latian virgins valiant with despair armed on the towers the common danger share so much of zeal their country's cause inspired so much camilla's great example fired poles sharpened in the flames from high they throw with imitated darts to gall the foe their lives for godlike freedom they bequeath and crowd each other to be first in death meantime to turnus ambushed in the shade with heavy tidings came the unhappy maid the volscians overthrown camilla killed the foes entirely masters of the field like a resistless flood come rolling on the cry goes off the plain and thickens to the town inflamed with rage for so the furies fire the daunian's breast and so the fates require he leaves the hilly pass the woods in vain possessed and downward issues on the plain scarce was he gone when to the straits now freed from secret foes the trojan troops succeed through the black forest and the ferny brake unknowingly secure their way they take from the rough mountains to the plain descent and there in order drawn their line extend both armies now in open fields are seen nor far the distance of the space between both to the city bent aeneas sees through smoking fields his hastening enemies and turnus views the trojans in array and hears the approaching horses proudly neigh soon had their hosts in bloody battle joined but westward to the sea the sun declined entrenched before the town both armies lie while night with sable wings involves the sky end of book 11Twelve, Part One of the Aeneid by Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lipa, San Francisco, California. The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by John Dryden. Book Twelve, The Fortunes of War, Part One. When Turnus saw the Latins leave the field their armies broken and their courage quelled himself become a mark of public spite his honor questioned for the promised fight the more he was with vulgar hate oppressed the more his fury boiled within his breast he roused his vigor for the last debate and raised his haughty soul to meet his fate as when the swains the libyan lion chase he makes a sour retreat nor mends his pace but if the pointed javelin pierce his side the lordly beast returns with double pride he wrenches out the steel he roars for pain his sides he lashes and erects his mane so turnus fares his eyeballs flash with fire through his wide nostrils clouds of smoke expire trembling with rage around the court he ran at length approached the king and thus began no more excuses or delays i stand in arms prepared to combat hand to hand 
this base deserter of his native land the trojan by his word is bound to take the same conditions which himself did make renew the truce the solemn rites prepare and to my single virtue trust the war the latians unconcerned shall see the fight this arm unaided shall assert your right then if my prostrate body press the plain to him the crown and beauteous bride remain to whom the king sedately thus replied brave youth the more your valor has been tried the more becomes it us with due respect to weigh the chance of war which you neglect you want not wealth or a successive throne or cities which your arms have made your own my towns and treasures are at your command and stored with blooming beauties is my land Laurentum more than one lavinia sees unmarried fair of noble families now let me speak and you with patience hear things which perhaps make great a lover's ear but sound advice proceeding from a heart sincerely yours and free from fraudful art the gods by signs have manifestly shown no prince italian born should heir my throne oft to have our augurs in prediction skilled and oft our priests foreign son revealed yet one by worth that cannot be withstood bribed by my kindness to my kindred blood urged by my wife who would not be denied i promised my lavinia for your bride her from her plighted lord by force i took all ties of treaties and of honour broke on your account i waged an impious war with what success tis needless to declare i and my subjects feel and you have had your share twice vanquished while in bloody fields we strive scarce in our walls we keep our hopes alive the rolling flood warm, runs warm with human gore the bones of latians blanch the neighboring shore why put i not an end to this debate still unresolved and still a slave to fate if turnus death a lasting peace can give why should i not procure it whilst you live should i to doubtful arms your youth betray what would my kinsmen the rutulians say and should you fall in flight which heaven defend how curse the cause which hastened to his end the daughter's lover and the father's friend weigh in your mind the various chance of war pity your parent's age and ease his care such balmy words he poured but all in vain the proffered medicine but provoked the pain the wrathful youth disdaining the relief with intermitting sobs thus vents his grief the care o best of fathers which you take for my concerns at my desire forsake permit me not to languish out my days but make the best exchange of life for praise this arm this lance can well dispute the prize and the blood follows where the weapon flies his goddess mother is not near to shroud the flying coward with an empty cloud but now the queen who feared for turnus life and loathed the hard conditions of the strife held him by force and dying in his death in these sad accents gave her sorrow breath o turnus i adjure thee by these tears and whatever price amata's honour bears within thy breast since thou art all my hope my sickly minds repose my sinking ages prop since on the safety of thy life alone depends latinus and the latian throne refuse me not this one this only prayer to waive the combat and pursue the war whatever chance attends this fatal strife think it includes in thine amata's life i cannot live a slave or see my throne usurped by strangers or a trojan son at this a flood of tears lavinia shed a crimson blush her beauteous face overspread varying her cheeks by turns with white and red the driving colors never at a stay run here and there and flush and fade away delightful change thus indian ivory shows which the bordering paint of purple glows or lilies damasked by the neighboring rose the lover gazed and burning with desire the more he looked the more he fed the fire revenge and jealous rage and secret spite rolled in his breast and roused him to the fight then fixing on the queen his ardent eyes firm to his first intent he thus replies o oh, mother do not by your tears prepare such boding omens and prejudge the war resolved on fight i am no longer free to shun my death if heaven my death decree then turning to the herald thus pursues 
Go greet the Trojan with ungrateful news. Denounce from me that when tomorrow's light shall gild the heavens, he need not urge the fight. The Trojan and Rutulian troops no more shall die with mutual blood the Latian shore. Our single swords the quarrel shall decide, and to the victor be the beauteous bride. He said, and striding on with speedy pace, he sought his coursers of the Thracian race. At his approach they tossed their heads on high, and proudly neighing promised victory. The sires of these Arithia sent from far, to grace Pilimenus when he went to war. The drifts of Thracian snows were scarce so white, nor northern winds in fleetness matched their flight. Officious grooms stand ready by his side, and some with combs their flowing manes divide, and others stroke their chests and gently soothe their pride. He sheathed his limbs and arms, a tempered mass of golden metal those, and mountain brass. Then to his head his glittering helm he tied, and girt his faithful falchion to his side. In his Atanian forge the god of fire, that falchion labored to the hero's sire. Immortal keenness on the blade bestowed, and plunged it hissing in the Stygian flood. Propped on a pillar, which the ceiling bore, was placed the lance a runcan actor wore, which with such force he brandished in his hand. The tough ash trembled like an osier wand, then cried, O ponderous spoil of actor slain, and never yet by Turnus tossed in vain. Fail not this day thy wanted force, but go, sent by this hand to fierce the Trojan foe. Give me to tear his corslet from his breast, and from that eunuch head to rend the crest, dragged in the dust his frizzled hair to soil, hot from the vexing iron and smeared with fragrant oil. Thus, while he raves, from his wide nostrils flies a fiery steam, and sparkles from his eyes, so fair as the bull his loved female's sight. Proudly he bellows and preludes the fight. He tries his goring horns against the tree, and meditates his absent enemy. He pushes at the winds, he digs the strand with his black hoofs, and spurns the yellow sand. Nor less the Trojan in his Lemnian arms, to future fight his manly courage warms. He wets his fury, and with joy prepares to terminate at once the lingering war. To cheer his chiefs, and tender son relates what heaven had promised, and expounds the fates. Then to the Latian king he sends, to cease the rage of arms, and ratify the peace. The morn ensuing, from the mountain's height, had scarcely spread the skies with rosy light. The ethereal cursors, bounding from the sea, from out their flaming nostrils breathed the day, when now the Trojan and Rutulian guard in friendly labor joined, the list prepared. Beneath the walls they measure out the space, then sacred altars rear on sods of grass, where, with religious, their common gods they place. In purest white the priests their heads attire, and living waters bear, and holy fire, and o'er their linen hoods and shaded hair long twisted wreaths of sacred varian wear. In order, issuing from the town appears, the Latin legion, armed with pointed spears, and from the fields, advancing on a line, the Trojan and the Tuscan forces join. Their various arms afford a pleasing sight. A peaceful train they seem, in peace prepared for fight, betwixt the ranks the proud commanders ride, glittering with gold, and vests in purple dyed. Here, Menestheus, author of the Memian line, and there Messapus, born of seed divine. The sign is given, and round the listed space each man in order fills his proper place. Reclining on their ample shields they stand, and fix their pointed lances in the sand. Now studious of the sight, a numerous throng of either sex, promiscuous, old and young, swarm the town. By those who rest behind, the gates and walls and houses topped are lined. Meantime the queen of heaven beheld the sight, with eyes unpleased from Mount Albano's height, since called Albano by succeeding fame, but then an empty hill without a name. She thence surveyed the field, the Trojan powers, the Latian squadrons, and Laurentine towers. 
Then thus the goddess of the skies bespoke, with sighs and tears, the goddess of the lake. King Turnus' sister, once a lovely maid, ere to the lust of lawless Jove betrayed, compressed by force, but by the grateful god, now made the nighest of the neighboring flood. O nymph, the pride of living lakes, said she, O most renowned and most beloved by me, long hast thou known, nor need I to record, the wanton sallies of my wandering lord, of every Latian fair whom Jove misled, to mount by stealth my violated bed. To thee alone I grudged not his embrace, but gave a part of heaven and an unenvied place. Now learn from me thy near approaching grief, nor think my wishes want to thy relief, while fortune favor nor heaven's king denied to lend my succor to the Latian side. I saved thy brother and the sinking state, but now he struggles with unequal fate, and goes, with gods averse, o'ermatched in might, to meet inevitable death and fight. Nor must I break the truce, nor can sustain the sight. Thou, if thou darest thy present aid supply, it well becomes a sister's care to try. At this the lovely nymph, with grief oppressed, thrice tore her hair and beat her comely breast, to whom Saturnia thus, Thy tears are late, haste, snatch him, if he can be snatched from fate, New tumults kindle, violate the truce. Who knows what changeful fortune may produce? It's not a crime to attempt what I decree, or if it were, discharge the crime on me, she said, and sailing on the winged wind, left the sad nymph suspended in her mind. And now, pomp the peaceful kings appear, four steeds the chariot of the Latinus bears, twelve golden beams around his temple play, to mark his lineage from the god of day. Two snowy coursers Turnus' chariot yoke, and in his hand two massy spears he shook. Then issued from the camp, in arms divine, Aeneas, author of the Roman line, and by his side Ascanius took his place, the second hope of Rome's immortal race. Adorned in white, a reverend priest appears, and offerings to the flaming altars bears a porket, and a lamb that never suffered shears. Then to the rising sun he turns his eyes, and strews the beasts designed for sacrifice. The salt and meal, with like officious care, he marks their foreheads, and he clips their hair. Betwixt their horns the purple wine he sheds, with the same generous juice the flame he feeds. Aeneas then unsheathed his shining sword, and thus with pious prayers the gods adored. All-seeing sun and thou, Ausonian soil, for which I have sustained so long a toil, thou king of heaven and thou the queen of air, propitious now and reconciled by prayer, thou god of war, whose unresisted sway the labors and events of arms obey, ye living fountains and ye running floods, all powers of ocean, all ethereal gods, hear and bear record if i fall in field or recreant in the fight to turnus yield my trojans shall increase evander's town ascanius shall renounce the estonian crown all claims all questions of debate shall cease nor he nor they with force infringe the peace but if my juster arms prevail in fight as sure they shall for if i divine aright my Trojans shall not o'er the Italians reign, both equal, both unconquered shall remain, joined in their laws, their lands, and their abodes. I ask but altars for my weary gods. The care of those religious rites be mine, the crown to King Latinus I resign. His be the sovereign sway, nor will I share his power in peace or his command in war. For me, my friends, another town shall frame and bless the rising towers with fair Lavinia's name. Thus he, then, with erected eyes and hands, the Latian king before his altar stands. By the same heaven, said he, and earth, and main, and all the powers that all three contain, by hell below, and by that upper god, whose thunder signs the peace, who seals it with his nod. So let Latona's double offspring hear, and double-fronted Janus what I swear. I touch the sacred altars, touch the flames, 
and all those powers attest and all their names whatever chance befall on either side no term of time this union shall divide no force no fortune shall my vows unbind or shake the steadfast tenor of my mind not though the circling seas should break their bound o'erflow the shores or sap the solid ground not though the lamps of heaven their spheres forsake hurled down and hissing in the nether lake even as this royal sceptre for he bore a sceptre of his hand shall never more shoot out in branches or renew the birth an orphan now cut from the mother earth by the keen axe dishonored of its hair and cased in brass for latian kings to bear when thus in public view the peace was tied with solemn vows and sworn on either side all dues performed which holy rites require the victim beasts are slain before the fire the trembling entrails from their bodies torn and to the fattened flames in chargers borne already the rutulians deem their man o'ermatched in arms before the fight began first rising fears are whispered through the crowd then gathering sound they murmur more aloud now side to side they measure with their eyes the champion's bulk their sinews and their size the nearer their approach the more is known the apparent disadvantage of their own turnus himself appears in public sight conscious of his fate desponding of the fight slowly he moves and at his altar stands with eyes dejected and with trembling hands and while he mutters undistinguished prayers a livid deadness in his cheeks appears with anxious pleasure when juturna viewed the increasing fright of the mad multitude when their short sighs and thickening sobs she heard and found their ready minds for change prepared dissembling her immortal form she took camertus mien his habit and his look a chief of ancient blood in arms well known was his great sire and he his greater son his shape assumed amid the ranks she ran and humouring their first motions thus began for shame rutulians can you bear the sight of one exposed for all in single fight can we before the face of heaven confess our courage colder our numbers less view all the trojan host the arcadian band and tuscan army count them as they stand undaunted to the battle if we go scarce every second man will share a foe turnus tis true in this unequal strife shall lose with honour his devoted life or change it rather for immortal fame succeeding to the gods from whence he came but you a servile and inglorious band for foreign lords shall sow your native land those fruitful fields your fighting fathers gained which have so long their lazy sons sustained with words like these she carried her design a rising murmur runs across the line then even the city troops and latians tired with tedious war seem with new souls inspired their champion's fate with pity they lament and of the league so lately sworn repent nor fails the goddess to foment the rage with lying wonders and a false presage but adds a sign which present to their eyes inspires new courage and a glad surprise for sudden in the fiery tracts above appears in pomp the imperial bird of jove a plump of fowl he spies that swims the lakes and o'er their head his sounding pinions shakes then stooping on the fairest of the train in his strong talons trusts a silver swan the italians wonder at the unusual sight but while he lags and labors in his flight behold the dastard fowl return anew and with united force the foe pursue clamorous around the royal hawk they fly and thickening in a cloud o'ershade the sky they cuff they scratch they cross his airy course nor can the encumbered burn sustain their force but vexed not vanquished drops the ponderous prey and lightened of his burthen wings his way the ausonian bands with shouts salute the sight eager of action and demand the fight then king toluminus versed in augur's arts cries out and thus his boasted skill imparts at length tis granted what i long desired this 
This is what my frequent vows required. Ye gods, I take your omen and obey. Advance, my friends, and charge, I lead the way. These are the foreign foes whose impious band, like that rapacious bird, infests our land. But soon, like him, they shall be forced to the sea, by strength united, and forego the prey. Your timely succor to your country bring, haste to the rescue, and redeem your king. He said, and, pressing onward through the crew, poised his lifted arm, and his lance he threw. The winged weapon, whistling in the wind, came driving on, nor missed the marked design. At once the cornel rattled in the skies, at once tumultuous shouts and clamors rise. Nine brothers in a goodly band there stood, born of Arcadian mixed with Tuscan blood. Gylippus's sons, the fatal javelin threw, aimed at the midmost of the friendly crew. A passage through the jointed arms it found, just where the belt was to the body bound and struck the gentle youth extended on the ground. Then fired with pious rage, the generous train run madly forward to revenge the slain, and some with eager haste their javelins throw, and some with sword in hand assault the foe. The wished insult the Latin troops embrace, and meet their ardor in the middle space. The Trojans, Tuscans, and Arcadian line with equal courage obviate their design, Peace leaves the violated fields, and hate both armies urges to their mutual fate. With impious haste their altars are o'erturned, the sacrifice half broiled and half unburned. Thick storms of steel from either army fly, and clouds of clashing darts obscure the sky. Brands from the fire are missive weapons made, with chargers, bowls, and all the priestly trade. Latinus, frightened, hastens from the fray, and bears his unregarded gods away. These on horses vault, those yoke the car, the rest with swords on high run headlong to the war. Messapus, eager to confound the peace, spurred his hot courser through the fighting priests. At King Alestes by his purple known, at Tuscan prince, and by his regal crown, and with a shock encountering bore him down. Backwards he fell, and as his fate designed, the ruins of an altar were behind. There, pitching on his shoulders and his head, amid the scattering fires he lay supinely spread. The beamy spear descending from above, his cuirass pierced, and through his body drove. Then with a scornful smile the victor cries, The gods have found a fitter sacrifice, greedy of the spoils. The Italians strip the dead of his rich armor and uncrown his head. Priest Corianus armed his better hand from his own altar with a blazing brand, and as Abusus with a thundering pace advanced to battle, dashed it on his face. His bristly beard shines out with sudden fires. The crackling crop a noisome scent expires. Following the blow, he seized his curling crown with his left hand, his other cast him down, the prostrate body with his knees he pressed, and plunged his holy poniard in his breast. While Podilirus with his sword pursued the shepherd Alsus through the flying crowd, swiftly he turns and aims a deadly blow full on the front of his unwary foe. The broad axe enters with a crashing sound and cleaves the chin with one continued wound. Warm blood and mingled brains besmear his arms around. An iron sleep his stupid eyes oppressed, And sealed their heavy lids in endless rest. But good Aeneas rushed amidst the bands. Bare was his head, and naked were his hands, In sign of truce. Then thus he cried aloud, What sudden rage, what new desire of blood Inflames your altered minds? O Trojans, cease from impious arms, Nor violate the peace. By human sanctions and by laws divine, the terms are all agreed, the war is mine. Dismiss your fears, and let the fight ensue. This hand alone shall right the gods and you. Our injured altars and their broken vow, to this avenging sword, the faithless Turnus owe. Thus while he spoke, unmindful of defense, a winged arrow struck the pious prince. But whether from some human hand it came, or hostile god, is left unknown by fame. No human hand or hostile god was found to boast the triumph of so base a wound. 
When Turnus saw the Trojan quit the plain, his chiefs dismayed, his troops a fainting train, the unhoped event his heightened soul inspires, at once his arms and coursers he requires, then with a leap his lofty chariot gains, and with a ready hand assumes the reins. He drives impetuous, and wherever he goes he leaves behind a lane of slaughtered foes. These his lance reaches, over those he rolls his rapid car and crushes out their souls. In vain the vanquished fly, the victor sends the dead men's weapons at their living friends. Thus on the banks of Hebrus' freezing flood, the god of battles, in his angry mood, clashing his sword against his brazen shield, let loose the reins and scours along the field. Before the wind his fiery coursers fly, groans the sad earth, resounds the rattling sky, wrath terror, treason, tumult, and despair, dire faces and deformed, surround the car, friends of the god and followers of the war, with fury not unlike, nor less disdain, exulting Turnus flies along the plain, his smoking horses at their utmost speed he lashes on, and urges over the dead, their fetlocks run with blood, and when they bound, the gore and gathering dust are dashed around. Thamyris and Pholus, masters of the war, he killed at hand, but Stethonus afar. From far the sons of Imbracus he slew, Glaucus and ladies of the Lycian crew, both taught to fight on foot, in battle joined, or mount the courser that outstrips the wind. Meantime, Eumedes, vaunting in the field, new fired the Trojans, and their foes repelled. The son of Dolan bore his grandsire's name, but emulated more his father's name. His guileful father sent a knightly spy, the Grecian camp, in order to descry hard enterprise, and well he might require Achilles' car and horses for his hire. But met upon the scout, the Aetolian prince, in death bestowed a juster recompense, Fierce Turnus viewed the Trojan from afar, and launched his javelin from his lofty car, then, lightly leaping down, pursued the blow, and pressing with his foot his prostrate foe, wrenched from his feeble hold the shining sword, and plunged it in the bosom of its lord. Possess, said he, the fruit of all thy pains, and measure at thy length our Latian plains. Thus are my foes rewarded by my hand, thus may they build their town, and thus enjoy the land. Then Darius Butes Sybaris he slew, Whom o'er his neck his floundering courser threw. As when loud Boreas with his blustering train Stoops from above, incumbent on the main, Wherever he flies, he drives the rack before, And rolls the billows on the Aegean shore. So where resistless Turnus takes his course, The scattered squadrons bend before his force. His crest of horses' hair is blown behind by adverse air and rustles in the wind. This haughty Phegeus saw with high disdain, and as the chariot rolled along the plain, light from the ground he leapt and seized the rein. Thus hung in air, he still retained his hold, the coursers frighted and their course controlled. The lance of Turnus reached him as he hung and pierced his plated arms, but passed along and only raised the skin. He turned and held against his threatening foe, his ample shield, then called for aid. But while he cried in vain, the chariot bore him backward on the plain. He lies reversed, the victor king descends, and strikes so justly where his helmet ends, he lops his head. The Latian fields are drunk with streams that issue from the bleeding trunk. While he triumphs, and while the Trojans yield, the wounded prince is forced to leave the field. Strong Menethysus and a Achates often tried, and young Ascanius, weeping by his side, conduct him to his tent. Scarce can he rear his limbs from the earth, supported on his spear. Resolved in mind, regardless of the smart, he tugs with both his hands and breaks the dart. The steel remains. No readier way he found to draw the weapon than to enlarge the wound. Eager of fight, impatient of delay, he begs, and his unwilling friends obey. Iapis was at hand to prove his art, whose blooming youth so fired Apollo's heart, 
that for his love he proffered to bestow his tuneful harp and his unerring bow. The pious youth, more studious how to save his aged sire, now sinking to the grave, preferred the powers of plants and silent praise of healing art before Phoebean bays. Propped on his lance, the pensive hero stood, and heard and saw unmoved the mourning crowd. The famed physician tucked his robes around with ready hands and hastens to the wound. With gentle touches he performs his part, this way and that, soliciting the dart, and exercises all his heavenly art, all softening simples, known of sovereign use, he presses out and pours their noble juice their first infused to lenify the pain he tugs with pincers but he tugs in vain then to the patron of his art he prayed the patron of his art refused his aid meantime the war approaches to the tents the alarm grows hotter and the noise augments the driving dust proclaims the danger near and first their friends and then their foes appear their friends retreat their foes pursue the rear the camp is filled with terror and affright the hissing shafts within the trench alight an undistinguished noise ascend the sky the shouts those who kill and the groans of those who die but now the goddess mother moved with grief and pierced with pity hastens her relief a branch of healing dittany she brought which in the cretan fields with care she sought Rough is the stern which woolly leaves surround, the leaves with flowers, the flowers with purple crowned, well known to wounded goats, a sure relief, to draw the pointed steel and ease the grief. This Venus brings, in clouds involved, and brews the extracted liquor with ambrosian dews, and odorous panacea. Unseen she stands, tempering the mixture with her heavenly hands, and pours it in a bowl, already crowned with juice of medicinal herbs prepared to bathe the wound the leech unknowing of superior art which aids the cure with this foments the part and in a moment cease the raging smart stanched is the blood and in the bottom stands the steel but scarcely touched with tender hands moves up and follows of its own accord and health and vigor are, are at once restored Iapis first perceived the closing wound, and first the footsteps of a god he found. Arms, arms, he cries, the sword and shield prepare, and send the willing chief renewed to war. This is no mortal work, no cure of mine, nor art's effect, but done by hands divine. Some god our general to the battle sends, some god preserved his life for greater ends. The hero arms in haste. His hands enfold his thighs with quiches of refulgent gold. Inflamed to the fight and rushing to the field, that hand sustaining the celestial shield, this grips the lance and with such vigor shakes that to the rest the beamy weapon quakes. Then with a close embrace he strained his son and kissing through his helmet thus began, My son, from my example learn the war in camps to suffer and in fields to dare but happier chance than mine attends thy care this day my hand thy tender age shall shield and crowns with honour the, of the conquered field thou when thy riper years send thee forth to toils of war be mindful of my worth assert thy birthright and in arms be known for hector's nephew and aeneas's son he said and striding issued on the plain Antaeus and Menesthus and a numerous train attend his steps, the rest their weapons take, and crowding to the field their camps forsake. A cloud of blinding dust is raised around, labors beneath their feet the trembling ground. Now Turnus, posted on a hill from far, beheld the progress of the moving war. With him the Latins viewed the covered plains, and the chill blood ran backwards in their veins. Juturna saw the advancing troops appear, and heard the hostile sound, and fled for fear. Aeneas leads and draws a sweeping train, closed in their ranks and pouring on the plain, as when a whirlwind rushing to the shore from the mid-ocean drives the waves before. 
The painful hind with heavy heart foresees the flatted fields and slaughter of the trees. With like impetuous rage the prince appears before his doubled front, nor less destruction bears. And now both armies shock in open field. Osiris is by strong Thimbraeus killed. Archidas, Ufens, Epulon are slain, all famed in arms and of the Latian train, by Gaius, Menesthus, and Achates hand. The fatal augur falls, by whose command the truce was broken, and whose lance imbrued with Trojan blood the unhappy fight renewed. Loud shouts and clamors rend the liquid sky, and o'er the field frighted Latins fly. The prince disdains the dastards to pursue, nor moves to meet in arms the fighting few. Turnus alone, amid the dusky plain, he seeks, and to the combat calls in vain. Juturna heard, and seized with mortal fear, forced from the beam her brother's charioteer, assumes his shape, his armor, and his mien, and like Mystiscus in his seat is seen. End of Book Twelve, Part One Recording by David Lipa, San Francisco, California Book Twelve, Part Two of the Aeneid this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lipa. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book 12. The Fortunes of War. Part 2. As the black swallows near the palace plies, O'er empty courts and under arches flies, Now hawks aloft, now skims along the flood to furnish her loquacious nest with food. So drives the rapid goddess over the plains. The smoking horses run with loosened reins. She steers a various course among the foes. Now here, now there, her conquering brother shows. Now with a straight, now with a wheeling flight, she turns and bends but shuns the single fight. Aeneas, fired with fury, breaks the crowd and seeks his foe and calls by name aloud he runs within a narrower ring and tries to stop the chariot but the chariot flies if he but gain a glimpse juturna fears and far away the danian hero bears what should he do nor arts nor arms avail and various cares in vain his mind assail the great Messapus thundering through the field, In his left hand two pointed javelins held, Encountering on the prince one dart he drew, And with unerring aim and utmost vigor threw. Aeneas saw it come, and stooping low, Beneath his buckler shunned the threatening blow. The weapon hissed above his head, And tore the wavering plume which on his helm he wore. Forced by this hostile act, and fired with spite, That flying Turnus still declined the fight. The prince, whose piety had long repelled, his inborn ardor now invades the field, invokes the powers of violated peace, their rights and injured altars to redress, then to his rage abandoning the rein, with blood and slaughtered bodies fills the plain. What God can tell, what numbers can display the various labors of that fatal day? What chiefs and champions fell on either side in combat slain, or by what deaths they died, whom Turnus, whom the Trojan hero killed, who shared the fame and fortune of the field. Jove, couldst thou view, and not avert thy sight, two jarring nations joined in cruel fight, whom leagues of lasting love so shortly shall unite. Aeneas first Rutulian Sucro found, whose valor made the Trojans quit the ground. Betwixt his ribs the javelin drove, so just it reached his heart, nor needs a second thrust. Now Turnus at two blows two brethren slew. First from his horse fierce Amicus he threw, then leaping on the ground on foot assailed Diorus, and in equal fight prevailed. Their lifeless trunks he leaves upon the place. Their heads, distilling gore, his chariot grace. Three cold on earth the Trojan hero threw, Whom without respite at one charge he threw. Cathegus, Tanias, Tagus fell oppressed, 
and sad Onythes added to the rest of Theban blood, whom Peridia bore. Turnus, two brothers from the Lycian shore, and from Apollo's fane to battle sent, overthrew, nor Phoebus could their fate prevent. Peaceful Menothes, after these he killed, who long had shunned the dangers of the field. On Lerna's lake a silent life he led, and with his nets and angle earned his bread, nor pompous cares nor palaces he knew, but wisely from the infectious world withdrew. Poor was his house, his father's painful hand discharged his rent and ploughed another's land. As flames along the lofty woods are thrown, on different sides in both by winds are blown, the laurels crackle in the sputtering fire, the frightened sylvans from their shades retire, or as two neighboring torrents fall from the sky, rapid they run, the foamy waters fry. They rolled to the sea with unresisted force, and down the rocks precipitate their course. Not with less rage the rival heroes take their different ways, nor less destruction make. With spears afar, with swords at hand they strike, and zeal of slaughter fires their souls alike. Like them their dauntless men maintain the field, and hearts are pierced unknowing how to yield. They blow for blow return, and wound for wound, and heaps of bodies raise the level ground. Moranus, boasting of his blood that springs from a long royal race of Latian kings, is by the Trojan from his chariot thrown, crushed with the weight of an unwieldy stone. Betwixt the wheels he fell, the wheels that bore his living load his dying body tore. His starting steeds to shun the glittering sword, paw down his trampled limbs, forgetful of their lord. Fierce Hylas threatened high and face to face, affronted Turnus in the middle space. The prince encountered him in full career, and at his temples aimed a deadly spear. So fatally the flying weapon sped, that through his helmet pierced his head. Nor Sisius could escape from Turnus' hand, in vain the strongest of the Arcadian band nor to Capentus could his gods afford availing against the Aeneian sword, which to his naked heart pursued the course, nor could his plated shield sustain the force. Aeolus fell, whom not the Grecian powers, nor great subverter of the Trojan towers were doomed to kill, while heaven prolonged his date. But who can pass the bounds prefixed by fate? In high Lernesis and in Troy he held two palaces, and was from each expelled of all the mighty man that last remains a little spot of foreign earth contains and now both hosts their broken troops unite in equal ranks and mix in mortal fight ceristhus and undaunted menethus join the trojan tuscan and arcadian line sea-born messapus with atanius heads the latin squadrons and to battle leads they strike, they push, they throng the scanty space, Resolved on death, impatient of disgrace, And where one falls, another fills his place. The Cyprian goddess now inspires her son To leave the unfinished fight and storm the town, For while he rolls his eyes around the plain In quest of Turnus, whom he seeks in vain, He views the unguarded city from afar, In careless quiet and secure of war occasion offers and excites his mind to dare beyond the task he first designed resolved he calls his chiefs they leave the fight attended thus he takes a neighboring height the crowding troops about their general stand all under arms and wait his high command then thus the lofty prince hear and obey ye trojan bands without the least delay jove is with us and what I have decreed requires our utmost vigor and our speed. Your instant arms against the town prepare, the source of mischief and the seat of war. This day the Latian towers that mate the sky shall level with the plain in ashes lie. The people shall be slaves, unless in their time they kneel for pardon and repent their crime. Twice have our foes been vanquished on the plain. Then shall I wait till Turnus will be slain? Your force against the perjured city bend, There it began, and there the war shall end. The peace profaned our rightful arms requires, Cleanse the polluted place with purging fires. He finished, 
and one soul inspiring all formed in a wedge the foot approached the wall without the town an unprovided train of gaping gazing citizens are slain some firebrands other scaling ladders bear and those they toss aloft and these they rear the flames now launch the feathered arrows fly and clouds of missive arms obscure the sky advancing to the front the hero stands and stretching out to heaven his pious hands attests the gods asserts his innocence upbraids with breach of faith the Ausonian prince declares the royal honor doubly stained and twice the rites of holy peace profaned dissenting clamors in the town arise each will be heard and all at once advise one part for peace one for war contends some would exclude their foes and some admit their friends the helpless king is hurried in the throng and whatever the tide prevails is borne along thus when the swain within a hollow rock invades the bees with suffocating smoke they run around or labor on their wings disused to flight and shoot their sleepy stings to shun the bitter fumes in vain they try black vapors issuing from the vent involve the sky but fate and envious fortune now prepare to plunge the latins in the last despair the queen who saw the foes invade the town and brands on top of burning houses thrown cast round her eyes distracted with her fear no troops of turnus in the field appear once more she stares abroad but still in vain and then concludes the royal youth is slain mad with her anguish impotent to bear the mighty grief she loathes the vital air she calls herself the cause of all this ill and owns the dire effects of her ungoverned will she raves against the gods she beats her breast she tears with both her hands her purple vest then round a beam a running noose she tied and fastened by the neck obscenely died soon as the fatal news by fame was blown and to her dames and to her daughter known the sad lavinia rends her yellow hair and rosy cheeks the rest her sorrows share with shrieks the palace rings and madness of despair the spreading rumor fills the public place confusion fear distraction and disgrace and silent shame are seen in every face latinus tears his garments as he goes both for his public and his private woes with filth his venerable beard besmears and sordid dust deforms his silver hairs and much he blames the softness of his mind obnoxious to the charms of womankind and soon seduced to change what he so well designed to break the solemn league so long desired nor finish what his fates and those of troy required now turnus rolls aloof o'er empty plains and here and there some struggling foes he gleans his flying coursers please him less and less ashamed of easy fight and cheap success thus half contented anxious in his mind the distant cries come driving in the wind shouts from the walls but shouts and murmurs drowned a jarring mixture and a boding sound alas said he what mean these dismal cries what doleful clamors from the town arise confused he stops and backward pulls the reins she who the driver's office now sustains replies neglect my lord these new alarms here fight and urge the fortune of your arms there want not others to defend the wall if by your rival's hand the italians fall so shall your fatal sword his friends oppress and honor equal equal in success to this the prince o oh sister for i knew the peace infringed proceeded first from you i knew you when you mingled first in fight and now in vain you would deceive my sight why goddess this unprofitable care who sent you down from heaven involved in air your share of mortal sorrows to sustain and see your brother bleeding on the plain for to what power can turnus have recourse or how resist his fate's prevailing force these eyes beheld moranus bite the ground mighty the man and mighty was the wound i heard my dearest friend with dying breath 
my name invoking to revenge his death. Brave Euphans fell, with honor on the place, to shun the shameful sight of my disgrace. On earth's supine, a manly corpse he lies, his vest and armor are the victor's prize. Then shall I see Laurentum in a flame, which only wanted to complete my shame. How will the Latins hoot their champion's flight? How Drances will insult and point them to the sight? Is death so hard to bear, ye gods below? Since those above so small compassion show, Receive a soul unsullied yet with shame, Which not belies my great forefather's name, He said, and while he spoke with flying speed Came sages urging on his foamy steed, Fixed on his wounded face a shaft he bore, And seeking Turnus sent his voice before, Turnus, on you, on you alone, depends our last relief, Compassionate your friends, like lightning, fierce Aeneas rolling on, with arms and vests, with flames invades the town. The brands are tossed on high, the winds conspire to drive along the deluge of the fire. All eyes are fixed on you. Your foes rejoice, even the king staggers and suspends his choice. Doubts to deliver or defend the town, whom to reject or whom to call his son. The queen on whom your utmost hopes were placed, herself suborning death, has breathed her last. Tis true, Messapus, fearless of his fate, with fierce Atenus aid, defends the gate. On every side, surrounded by the foe, the more they kill, the greater numbers grow. An iron harvest mounts, and still remains to mow. You, far aloof from your forsaken bands, your rolling chariot drive over empty. Stupid, he sate. His eyes on death declined, and various cares revolving in his mind, rage boiling from the bottom of his heart, and sorrow mixed with shame his soul oppressed, and conscious worth lay laboring in his thought, and love by jealousy to madness wrought, by slow degrees his reason drove away, the mists of passion, and resumed her sway, then rising on his car, he turned his look and saw the town involved in fire and smoke, a wooden tower with flames already blazed, which his own hands on beams and rafters raised, and bridges laid above to join the space, and wheels below to roll from place to place. Sister, the fates have vanquished, let us go, the way which heaven and my hard fortune show. The fight is fixed nor shall the branded name of a base coward blot your brother's fame. Death is my choice, but suffer me to try my force, and vent my rage before I die, he said, and leaping down without delay, through crowds of scattered foes he freed his way, striding he passed, impetuous as the wind, and left the grieving goddess far behind. As when a fragment from a mountain torn by raging tempests, or by torrents born, or sapped by time, or loosed from the roots, prone through the void, the rocky ruin shoots, rolling from crag to crag, from steep to steep, down sink at once the shepherds and their sheep, involved alike they rush to nether ground, stunned with the shock they fall, and stunned from earth rebound. So Turnus, hasting headlong into town, shouldering and shoving bore the squadrons down still pressing onwards to the wall he drew where shafts and spears and darts promiscuous flew and sanguine streams the slippery ground embrew first stretching out his arm in sign of peace he cries aloud to make the combat cease Rutulians hold and latin troops retire the fight is mine and me the gods require Tis just that I should vindicate alone the broken truce, or for the breach atone. This day shall free from wars the Ausonian state, or finish my misfortunes in my fate. Both armies from their bloody work desist, and bearing backwards form a spacious list. The Trojan hero who received from fame the welcome sound, and heard the champion's name, soon leaves the taken works and mounted walls, Greedy of war, where the greater glory calls, He springs to fight, exulting in his force, His jointed armor rattles in the course, 
like Eryx, or like Athos, great he shows, or Father Epinine, when, white with snows, his head divine obscure in clouds he hides, and shakes the sounding forest on his sides. The nations overawed secrete the fight, immovable their bodies fix their sight. Even death stands still, nor from above they throw their darts, nor drive their battering rams below. In silent order either army stands, and drop their swords unknowing from their hands. The Ausonian king beholds with wondering sight two mighty champions matched in single fight, born under climes remote and brought by fate with swords to try their titles to the state. Now in closed field each other from afar they view, and rushing on begin the war. They launch their spears, then hand to hand they meet. The trembling soil resounds beneath their feet. Their bucklers clash, their blows descend from high and flakes of fire from their hard helmets fly. Courage conspires with chance, and both engage with equal fortunes yet in mutual rage. As when two bulls for their fair female fight in Silas' shades or on Tabernus's height, with horns adverse they meet, the keeper flies, mute stands the herd, their heifers roll their eyes, and wait the event which victor they shall bear. And who shall be the lord to rule the lusty year? With rage of love the jealous rivals burn, And push for push, and wound for wound return. Their dewlap scored, their sides are laved in blood. Loud cries and roaring sounds rebellow through the wood. Such was the combat in the listed ground, So clashed their swords, and so their shields resound. Jove sets the beam. In either scale he lays the champion's fate, and each exactly weighs. On this side life and lucky chance ascends, loaded with death that other scale descends. Raised on the stretch, young Turnus aims a blow, full on the helm of his unguarded foe. Shrill shouts and clamors ring on either side, as hopes and fears their panting hearts divide. But all in pieces flies the traitor sword, and in the middle stroke deserts his lord. Now is but death or flight disarmed he flies, when in his hand an unknown hilt he spies. Fame, says that Turnus, when his steeds he joined hurrying to war, disordered in his mind, snatched the first weapon which his haste could find. Twas not the fated sword his father bore, but that his charioteer Mesticus wore. This, while the Trojans fled, the toughness held, but vain against the great Vulcanian shield. The mortal-tempered steel deceived his hand. The shivered fragments shone amid the sand. Surprised with fear, he fled along the field, and now forthright, and now in orbits wheeled. For here the Trojan troops the lists surround, and there the pass is closed with pools and marshy ground. Aeneas hastens, though with heavier pace, his wounds so newly knit, retards the chase, and oft his trembling knees their aid refuse, yet pressing foot by foot his foe pursues. Thus, when a fearful stag is closed around, with crimson toils or in a river found, high on the bank the deep mouth hound appears, still opening, following still, wherever he steers, the persecuted creature to and fro turns here and there to scape his umbrian foe. Steep is the ascent, and if he gains the land, the purple death is pitched along the strand. His eager foe, determined to the chase, stretched at his length, gains ground at every pace. Now to his balmy head he makes his way, and now he holds, or thinks he holds, his prey. Just at the pitch the stag springs out with fear. He bites the wind, and fills his sounding jaws with air. The rocks, the lakes, the meadows ring with cries. The mortal tumult mounts and thunders in the skies. Thus flies the Danian prince, and flying blames. His tardy troops, calling by their names, demands his trusty sword. The Trojan threats the realm with ruin and their ancient seats to lay in ashes if they dare supply with arms or aid his vanquished enemy. Thus menacing, he still pursues the course with vigor, 
though diminished of his force ten times already the listed place one chief had fled and the other given chase no trivial prize is played for on the life or death of turnus now depends the strife within the space an olive tree had stood a sacred shade a venerable wood for vows to faunus paid the latin's guardian god here hung the vests and tablets were engraved of sinking mariners from shipwreck saved with heedless hands the trojans felled the tree to make the ground enclosed for combat free deep in the root whether by fate or chance or erring haste the trojan drove his lance then stooped and tugged with force immense to free the encumbered spear from the tenacious tree that whom his fainting limbs pursued in vain his flying weapon might from far attain confused with fear bereft of human aid then turnus to the gods and first to faunus prayed o faunus pity and thou mother earth where i thy foster son received my birth hold fast the steel if my religious hand your plant has honored which your foes profaned propitious hear my prayers he said nor with successless vows invoked their aid the incumbent hero wrenched and pulled and strained but still the stubborn earth the steel detained juturna took her time and while in vain he strove assumed meticus form again and in that imitated shape restored the despairing prince his danian sword the queen of love who with disdain and grief saw the bold nymph afford this prompt relief to assert her offspring with a greater deed from the tough root of the lingering weapon freed once more erect the rival chiefs advance one trusts the sword the other the pointed lance and both resolved alike to try their fatal chance meantime imperial jove to juno speak who from a shining cloud be beheld the shock what new arrest o queen of heaven is sent to stop the fates now laboring in the event what farther hopes are left thee to pursue divine aeneas and thou knows it too foredoomed to these celestial seats are due what more attempts for turnus can be made that this thou lingerest in this lonely shade is it becoming of the due respect and awful honor of a god elect a wound unworthy of our state to feel patient of human hands and earthly steel or seems it just the sister should restore a second sword when one was lost before and arm a conquered wretch against his conqueror for what without thy knowledge and avow nay more thy dictate durst juturna do at last in deference to my love forbear to lodge within thy soul this anxious care reclined upon my breast thy grief unload who should relieve the goddess but the god now all things to their utmost issue tend pushed by the fates to their appointed while leave was given thee and a lawful hour for vengeance wrath and unresisted power tossed on the seas thou could thy foes distress and driven ashore with hostile arms oppress deform the royal house and from the side of the just bridegroom tear the plighted bride now cease at my command the thunderer said and with dejected eyes this answer juno made because your dread decree too well i knew from turnus and from earth unwilling i withdrew else should you not behold me here alone involved in empty clouds my friends bemoan but girt with vengeful flames in open sight engaged against my foes in mortal fight tis true juturna mingled in the strife by my command to save her brother's life at least to try but by the stygian lake the most religious oath the gods can take with this restriction not to bend the bow or toss the spear or trembling dart to throw and now resigned to your superior might and tired with fruitless toils i loathe the fight this let me beg and this no fates withstand both for myself and for your father's land that when the nuptial bed shall bind the peace which i since you ordain consent to bless the laws of either nation be the same but let the latins still retain their name speak the same language which they spoke before wear the same habits which their grandsires wore 
call them not Trojans, perish the renown and name of Troy, with that detested town. Latium be Latium still, let Alba reign, and Rome's immortal majesty remain. Then thus the founder of mankind replies, unruffled was his front, serene his eyes. Can Saturn's issue and heaven's other heir such endless anger in her bosom bear? Be mistress, and your full desires obtain, but quench the choler you foment in vain. From ancient blood the Ausonian people sprung, shall keep their name, their habit, and their tongue. The Trojans to their customs shall be tied. I will myself their common rights provide. The natives shall command, the foreigners subside. All shall be Latium, Troy without a name, and her lost sons forget from whence they came. From blood so mixed a pious race shall flow, equal to gods excelling all below. No nation more respect to you shall pay, or greater offerings on your altars lay. Juno consents, well pleased that her desires had found success, and from the cloud retires. The peace thus made, the thunderer next prepares to force the watery goddess from the wars. Deep in the dismal regions void of light, three daughters at a birth were born to night. These their brown mother, brooding on her care, endued with windy wings to flit in air, with serpents girt alike and crowned with hissing hair. In heaven the dire called, and still at hand, before the throne of angry Jove they stand his ministers of wrath, and ready still the minds of mortal men with fears to fill. Whenever the moody sire, to wreak his hate on realms or towns deserving of their fate, hurls down diseases, death, and deadly care, and terrifies the guilty world with war. One sister plague, if these from heaven he sent, to fright Juturna with a dire portent, the pest comes whirling down, by far more slow springs the swift arrow from the Parthen bow, or side on you, when traversing the skies, and drenched in poisonous juice, the sure destruction flies, with such a sudden and unseen a flight, shot through the clouds the daughter of the night, soon as the field enclosed she had in view, and from afar her destined quarry knew, contracted, to the boding bird she turns, which haunts the ruined piles and hallowed urns, and beats about the tombs with nightly wings, where songs obscene on sepulchres she sings. Thus lessened in her form, with frightful cries, the fury round unhappy Turnus flies, flaps on his shield, and flutters o'er his eyes. A lazy chillness crept along his blood, choked was his voice, his hair with horror stood. Juturna from afar beheld her fly, and knew the ill omen by her screaming cry and strider of her wings. Amazed with fear, her beauteous breast she beat and rent her flowing hair. Ah me, she cries, in this unequal strife, what can thy sister more to save thy life? Weak as I am, can I, alas, contend in arms? With that inexorable fiend, now, now I quit the field. Forbear to fright my tender soul, ye baleful birds of night. The lashing of your wings I know too well, the sounding flight and funeral screams of hell. These are the gifts you bring from haughty Jove, the worthy recompense of my ravished love. Did he for this exempt my life from fate? O oh, hard conditions of immortal state! Though born to death, not privileged to die, but forced to bear imposed eternity. Take back your envious bribes, and let me go, companion to my brother's ghost below. The joys are vanished, nothing now remains of life immortal, but immortal pains. What earth will open her devouring womb, to rest a weary goddess in the tomb? She drew a length of sighs. Nor more, she said, but in her azure mantle wrapped her head, then plunged into her stream with a deep despair, and her last sobs came bubbling up in air. Now stern Aeneas his weighty spear against his foe, and thus abrades his fear. What farther subterfuge can Turnus find? What empty hopes are harbored in his mind? 
Tis not thy swiftness can secure thy flight, Nor with their feet, but hands the valiant fight. Vary thy shape in thousand forms, And dare what skill and courage can attempt in war. Wish for the wings of winds to mount the sky, Or hid within the hollow earth to lie. The champion shook his head, and made this short reply. No threats of thine, my manly mind, can move. Tis hostile heaven I dread, and partial Jove. He said no more, but with a sigh repressed The mighty sorrow in his swelling breast. Then as he rolled his troubled eyes around, An antique stone he saw the common bound Of neighboring fields, and barrier of the ground, So vast that twelve strong men of modern days The enormous weight from earth could hardly raise. He heaved it at a lift, and poised on high, Ran staggering on his enemy, but so disordered that he scarcely knew his way or what unwieldy weight he threw. His knocking knees are bent beneath the load, and shivering cold congeals his vital blood. The stone drops from his arms, and falling short for want of vigor mocks his vain effort. And as when a heavy sleep has closed the sight, the sickly fancy labors in the night, we seem to run, and destitute of force, Our sinking limbs forsake us in the course. In vain we heave for breath, in vain we cry, The nerves embrace, their usual strength deny, And on the tongue the faltering accents die. So Turnus fared, whatever means he tried, All force of arms and points of art employed, The fury flew athwart, and made the endeavor void. A thousand various thoughts his soul confound. He started about, nor aid nor issue found. His own men stop the pass, and his own walls surround. Once more he pauses and looks out again, and seeks the goddess charioteer in vain. Trembling he views the thundering chief advance, and brandishing aloft the deadly lance. Amazed he cowers beneath the conquering foe, forgets to ward and waits the coming blow. Astonished while he stands and fixed with fear, Aimed at his shield, he sees the impending spear. The hero measured first, with narrow view, The destined mark, and rising as he threw, With its full swing the fatal weapon flew. Not with less rage the rattling thunder falls, Or stones from battering engines break the walls. Swift as a whirlwind, from an arm so strong The lance drove on, and bore the death along. Not could his sevenfold shield the prince avail, nor aught beneath his arms the coat of mail. It pierced through all, and with a grisly wound transfixed his thigh, and doubled him to ground. With groans the Latins rend the vaulted sky, woods, hills, and valleys, to the voice reply. Now low on earth the lofty chief is laid, and with eyes cast upward, and with arms displayed, and recreant thus to the proud victor prayed. I know my death deserved, nor hope to live. Use what the gods and thy good fortune give. Yet think, O oh think, if mercy may be shown, thou hadst a father once, and hast a son. Pity my sire, now sinking to the grave, and for Anchises' sake, old Donus, save. Or if thy vowed revenge pursue my death, Give to my friends my body void of breath. The Latian chiefs have seen me beg my life. Thine is the conquest, thine the royal wife, Against the yielded man. Tis mean, ignoble strife. In deep suspense the Trojan seemed to stand, And, just prepared to strike, repressed his hand. He rolled his eyes, and every moment felt His manly soul with more compassion melt. When casting down a casual glance he spied The golden belt that glittered on his side, Fatal spoils which haughty Turnus tore From dying Pallas, and in triumph wore. Then roused anew to wrath, he loudly cries, Flames while he spoke came flashing from his eyes, Traitor, dost thou, dost thou to grace pretend, Clad as thou art in trophies of my friend? To his sad soul a grateful offering go, "'Tis Pallas, Pallas gives this deadly blow. "'He raised his arm aloft, and at the word, "'deep in his bosom drove the shining sword. 
the streaming blood disdained his arms around and the disdainful soul came rushing through the wound end of book 12 end of the aeneid by virgil translated by john dryden recording by david lipa san francisco california